from the book jacket. A new era of exciting adventures and shocking revelations continues to unfold as the legendary Star Wars saga sweeps forward into astonishing new territory. Civil war looms as the fledgling Galactic Alliance confronts a growing number of rebellious worlds, and the approaching war is tearing the Skywalker and Solo families apart. Han and Leia return to Han's homeworld, Corellia the heart of the Resistance. Their children, Jason and Jaina, are soldiers in the Galactic Alliance's campaign to crush the insurgents. Jason, now a complete master of the Force, has his own plans to bring order to the galaxy. Guided by his Sith mentor, Lumia, and with Luke's young son, Ben, at his side, Jason embarks on the same path that his grandfather Darth Vader once did. And while Han and Leia watch their only son become a stranger, a secret assassin entangles the couple with a dreaded name from Han's past, Boba Fett. In the new galactic order, friends and enemies are no longer what they seem. Prologue Atzeri system ten standard years after the Yuzhan Vong War. Slave one in pursuit of prisoner Habuk. Boba Fett's private record. Whatever he's paying you, Fett, I'll double it, says the voice on the comlink. They say that a lot. They just don't understand the nature of a contract. This time, it's an Atzeri glitterstim dealer called Habuk, who's overstepped the mark with the Traitor's Coalition to the tune of 400,000 credits. The Coalition feels it's worth paying me 500,000 credits to teach him and everyone else a lesson about honoring debt. I agree with the Traitor's Coalition wholeheartedly. A contract's a contract, I tell him. Slave One is close enough on his trail for me to get a visual on him. I swear he's flying an old Z-95 headhunter. No hyperdrive, or he'd have jumped for it by now. And no wonder he's surprised. An old, old fire spray like Slave One shouldn't be able to catch him on sublight drive alone. But I've fitted a few more extras recently. The only completely original part of Slave One now is the seat I'm in. My laser cannon's armed, says Habuk, breathless. Good for you. Why they always want a conversation, I'll never know. Look, shoot or shut up. I know you'll have to come about to target me with that cannon. And in that second or two, I'll take out your drives anyway. The galaxy's a dangerous place. The headhunter executes a neat turn to port with its aft maneuvering jets, and the slave's laser locks on to the headhunter's drive signature, matching its turns and loops with no need for guidance from me. His engine flares in a ball of white light. The fighter begins an uncontrolled roll, and I have to gun it to get the tractor beam locked and haul a book in. The grapple arms make a satisfying chunk-unk against the headhunter's airframe as I secure the fighter against the casing above Slave's torpedo launcher. The sound of that reverberating through your hull, I'm told, is just like a cell door closing behind you. The point at which prisoners lose all hope. Funny. That would only make me fight harder. A book is making the noises of panic and pleading that I hardly notice these days. Some prisoners are defiant, but most give in to fear. He makes me offers all the way back to Atzeri, promising anything to survive. I can pay you millions. The contract is to deliver him alive. It's very specific. And my stock holdings in Kuat Drive Yards. I think it's the silent routine that gets to them in the end. Fat? I have a beautiful daughter. He shouldn't have said that. Now I'm angry, and I don't often get angry. Never use your kids, scumbag. Never. My father put me first. Any father should. Not that I ever felt pity or anything for her book, but I'm satisfied now that he deserves everything that the Traitor's Coalition is going to do to him. 
If I were the sympathetic kind, I'd kill him. I'm not. And the contract says, alive. Want to negotiate a landing fee? Says Otzeri Air Traffic Control. Want to negotiate an ion cannon? Oh, apologies, Master Fatser. They always see my point. Landing on Otzeri is a little tricky when you're hauling a crippled fighter on your upper works. I set Slave One down on the landing strip, lowering gently on the thrusters, feeling the aft section vibrating under the load, and I have an audience. The Coalition wants to show they can afford to hire the best to hunt down anyone who crosses them. I oblige. A bit of theater, a little public relations. Like Mandalorian armor, it makes the point without a shot needing to be fired. I walk along Slave One's casing to clamber up onto the headhunter's fuselage and crack open its canopy seal with the laser housed in my wrist gauntlet. So I hit a book harder than I need to and haul him out of the cockpit to rappel down ten meters to the ground on the lanyard with him. It hurts deep in my stomach. I don't let anyone see that. Then I deposit the prisoner on the landing strip in front of the men he owes 400,000 credits. It makes the point. I like making points. Presentation is half the battle. Want to keep the starfighter, too? asks my customer. Not my taste. The spaceport utility loader comes to remove it from Slave One. I hold out my palm. I want the rest of my fee. He hands me the outstanding 250,000 creds on a verified chip. Why do you still do this, Fat? Because people still ask me. It's a good question. I ponder it while I sit back in the cockpit and catch up with the financial headlines on the Holonet news as Slave One heads for Camino on autopilot. My doctor is meeting me there. He doesn't like the long journey, but I don't pay him to be happy. Now I find I'm thinking of a daughter. Aelin, who I haven't seen in fifty years, wondering if she's still alive. You see, I'm ill. I think I'm dying. If I am, then there are things I've got to do. One of them is to find out what happened to Aelin. Another is to decide who's going to be Mandalore when I'm gone. And the third, of course, is to cheat death. I've had a lot of practice at that. Chapter One How long are we going to have to bounce from one crisis to the next? We're facing our third galactic war in under forty years. A real civil war. It's just skirmishing now, but if Omus doesn't crack down much harder on dissent, this will spiral out of control. We need a period of stability, and I fear we're going to have to knock heads together much harder to get it. Admiral Cha Neothel, in private conversation with Moon Calamari Senate delegates. Chief of State's Reception Suite, Senate Building, Coruscant. Sixteen days after the raid on Centerpoint Station. The worst thing about being thirteen years old was that one moment you were expected to be an adult, and the next everyone treated you like a child again. Ben Skywalker, thirteen and confused about what was expected of him, sat trying to be patient in the reception area of Chief Cal Omis's offices in the Senate building, taking his lead from his cousin Jason Solo. It was the kind of office designed to make you feel like you didn't matter. A whole apartment could have slipped into the space between the outer doors and the wall of Omis's personal office. Ben almost expected to see tangled balls of Misura vine rolling across the spotless pale blue carpet, driven by a distant wind. He couldn't see the point of all that empty space. But the Senate building had been occupied and changed out of all recognition by the Yuzhan Vong, Jason said. Architects, designers, and an army of construction droids had taken years to wipe away all traces of the alien invasion and restore the building to the way it had been. Ben tried to listen in the force for the echoes of the aliens, 
and their weird living technology, and thought he heard unrecognizable sounds. He shuddered and tried to occupy himself with the holozines stacked on the low, greelwood table. The zines were all very dull and slightly outdated current affairs weeklies and political analyses, but one of them displayed an image of Jason. Ben picked it up and activated it, smiling at the next image of a rotating center-point station, which didn't look quite so good in real life since he had helped sabotage it. It's good to feel part of something important. The Holler Report featured clips of Corellian news reports of the raid on Centerpoint, but it didn't mention Ben, and he wasn't sure if that upset him or not. Some recognition would have been nice, but the Corellian sources that were quoted were pretty rude about Jason, calling him a traitor and a terrorist. The reporter's voice seemed to fill the room, even though the volume was set to minimum and the carpet and tapestries on the walls muffled the sound. The report wasn't very kind about Uncle Han, either. A middle-aged man Ben didn't recognize was telling the reporter what he thought. So he calls himself a Corellian. But forget that blood stripe on his uniform pants. It might as well be a big yellow streak down his back, because Han Solo is just a Galactic Alliance puppet. He's betrayed Corellia by sitting on his backside doing whatever his Alliance buddies tell him to. And his son's just the same. Jason seemed embarrassed. Maybe he was more upset for his dad. Ben would have been. You should use an earpiece to listen to those privately, said Jason. But you're famous, Ben offered him the holozine. Want to see? Jason raised one eyebrow and seemed more worried about this meeting with Chief Omas. Fine. That I could do without Thrak and Sal Solo using me to humiliate my father in front of Corellia. You realize he gave all this information to the media, don't you? Yeah, of course I do. But if we're not ashamed of it, why does it matter? We did the right thing for the Galactic Alliance. Centerpoint Station was a threat to everyone. Jason turned his head very slowly with that half-smile that Ben had learned meant he was impressed. But a lot of worlds are taking Corellia's side now. So do you think those stories do any harm or not? Ben could always spot a test now. He knew he had to say what he believed. There was no point trying to be too clever. He wanted to learn from Jason so badly that it burned him up. Some worlds will always go against the Alliance anyway. So we might as well let the people on our side know we're taking action. Makes them feel safer. Jason nodded approvingly, and Ben felt a little forced touch somewhere in his mind, as if Jason were patting him on the head. That's very perceptive. I think you're right. Everyone will know you're doing your best to stop a war anyway. Ben put the holozine back on the table and glanced at the rest of the titles. There seem to be more pictures of you than anyone. Jason's smile faded for a moment, and he glanced toward the doors of Olmus's office looking as if he was willing the head of the Galactic Alliance to finish his meeting and come out. Ben began to pick up what had caught Jason's attention. There was a definite sense of conflict, of people arguing, and it was almost as clear as hearing it if you knew how to listen in the force. Ben did now. Jason was a good teacher. Ben concentrated on Jason's face. He looked a lot older lately. Sometimes he looked almost as old as Dad. What's happening? Heavyweight politics, said Jason, barely audible. He put his fingers almost to his lips, a very discreet gesture. It wasn't obvious to anyone else. Anyone else, in this case, being only the aide at the desk outside Omis's grand double doors. But Ben took the hint. Be quiet. He was suddenly worried about letting Jason down. Chief Omas wasn't a stranger. The man knew his father, and Ben had been brought to meet him at a state celebration. Pretty much all Ben remembered of that affair was feeling very small in a sea of tall people, having conversations he didn't understand. But Ben wanted to be seen as Jason's apprentice, not as Luke Skywalker's son, 
the heir to the dynasty, as one of the guests had called him. It was hard being the son of two Jedi Masters, whom everyone referred to as legends. Ben had lost count of the times he had felt invisible. Chief Omas won't keep you, Jedi Solo, said the aide, tilting her head slightly toward the closed doors of Omas's office itself. He's with Admiral Neotho at the moment. I'm invisible again, thought Ben. He composed himself and sat down with his hands folded in his lap, a mirror of Jason's own posture. He tried to count the number of different species of animal depicted on the huge tapestry that covered part of the wall opposite. What he had first thought was just a mass of random color was actually thousands of overlapping images of every animal he could imagine from across the galaxy, across the whole Galactic Alliance. Eventually the doors parted, and Neothel strode out, radiating annoyance. Chief Omas appeared in the doorway behind her and forced a smile. Ah, Jason, he said. I'm sorry to keep you. Won't you come in? And Ben, I'm glad you could make it too. Neothel glanced at Jason as if she didn't recognize him. He acknowledged her with a slight bow of his head. Admiral, he said, smiling, a pleasure to see you. Neothel turned a little more to the side, the equivalent of a very frank stare for a moan calamari, a species with side-set eyes, and scrutinized both of them. You did a very fine job at Centerpoint Station, sir, and you, young man. My name's Ben, but he had learned a little diplomacy now. Thank you, ma'am. Omas beckoned Jason forward, and Ben followed meekly. Omas did not make the tired comment that Ben had grown since he'd last seen him, nor did he look past him when he was talking to Jason. The chief met his eyes. It was both unsettling and exciting to be treated as an adult. Ben concentrated hard on what was being said. Omas sat behind his desk rather than in the chair opposite them, as if he were taking cover. So what brings you here, Jason? I have a proposal. Go ahead. Crippling Centerpoint Station only bought us time with Corellia. We might have a few months at most before it's operational again. And then we're back where we began, but with a much more aggrieved Corellia that's gathering more support. Is this an extrapolation from what you see in the Force, Jason? No, it's just obvious to the point of inevitability. Ben felt Omas teeter on the edge of reacting. It was as if the two men were having an argument without any sign of it in their words or their voices. Go on, said Omas. Now is the only time we'll have for preemptive action, before any real opposition to the Galactic Alliance has a chance to organize. Corellia, Commodore, and Chasen need complete dissuasion. Very public dissuasion to make a point to other governments about the need for unity and a complete neutralization of their capacity to fight a war, the destruction of their shipyards. Ben was glad Jason had said destruction. It was the first clue he'd had of what dissuasion actually meant. This, said Omas slowly, is not unlike another conversation I've just had. The way he said conversation made it clear what he'd been arguing about with Neothel. So she wanted to take action, exactly as Jason did. We slapped Corellia and made a martyr to a cause, said Jason. An armed martyr to an armed cause. But Corellia has seen what we're made of, and that'll make them think twice. And we've now seen what they're made of, said Jason. And I have thought twice. If you give me command of a battle group, I can destroy the main shipyards and put an end to this now. If Corellia can be brought to heel, it sends the message that no single planet is bigger than the Alliance. You're asking me to declare war, Jason, and that's something I'd never get Senate backing to do. And I know where the Jedi Council stands on this. War is coming anyway. If you draw a weapon on a Corellian, you'd better be prepared to use it. We drew it when we took out Centerpoint. Omus was doing a good job of disguising his fear— but Ben could feel it. 
It didn't feel as if he was afraid of Jason. It was more a vague and formless dread, as if events were drowning him. Talking of Corellians, would this attack not drive a huge wedge between you and your father? It might well, said Jason, but I'm a Jedi, and it's precisely that kind of personal motivation we're trained to disregard. I'll take it under advisement. I'll take that as a no. Jason seemed perfectly calm. I can tell you, with the certainty of the Force, that failing to stamp out dissent completely now will result in the deaths of billions in the coming years. We stand on a tipping point where we can choose chaos or order. Omus meshed his fingers, hands on the desk, and stared at them. I agree we have a volatile situation here. Yes, this is a tipping point. But I think that escalating military action will be what tips us over into war, not what limits it. I remember the Empire, Jason. I lived through it, and I dread seeing us become that kind of government. Jason gave Omus a little nod and stood up to leave. Thank you for listening to my concerns. They took the long walk back to the Senate lobby, down a broad corridor lined with blue and honey-gold marble inlay, and traveled down to the ground floor in a turbo lift with walls so highly polished they were almost an amber mirror. Is politics always like that? said Ben. Why don't you both say what you mean? Jason laughed. Then it wouldn't be politics, would it? And why does everyone keep saying, Oh, I remember the Empire? Uncle Han says it was bad, and so does Chief Omas. If they're both afraid of the same thing, why are they on opposite sides? Jason seemed to find it very funny. Ben was embarrassed. I was only asking, Jason. I'm not laughing at you. It's just very refreshing to hear someone cut through the nonsense and ask real questions. So what are you going to do next? Jason checked his comm link. Dad's still not responding. I need to clear the air with him. He's angry about Centerpoint. I meant about Chief Omas. Well, be patient. The solution will become clear. To both of us. You and Omas. No, you and me. Ben was delighted that Jason seemed to take his opinion seriously. He was more determined than ever to conduct himself like a man and not a boy. He knew now that he would never play again. They crossed through the forest of pillars of the Senate lobby and emerged into the hazy sunshine that bathed the plaza. Strung out in a ragged line, a group of around two hundred people had gathered to protest in front of the Senate building. Dozens of Coruscant Security Force officers had formed a loose line in front of the building, but it looked peaceful. The occasional shout of, Corelli is not your colony, made it clear who the protesters were. Coruscant was home to beings from almost every planet in the galaxy, and even when war seemed to be coming, they stayed here. Ben found that odd. Wars were about front lines and distant planets, not about people who looked a lot like him and who almost lived next door. Something tells me we'd better not stop and sign autographs, said Ben. Jason stopped to look back at the protest. How many Corellians do you think live in Galactic City? One of the protesters in the crowd had projected a huge holla image onto the face of the Senate building. It read, Corellia has a right to self-defense. Five million? Five billion? Do you think they're dangerous? I'm simply thinking what a complicated war this will be for Coruscant because so many Corellians live here. But we're not at war, yet. Not as far as governments are concerned, said Jason. But feel what's around you. Ben's force senses were a fraction of Jason's, trained in not much more than physical skills and the beginnings of true meditation. He closed his eyes. He felt the vague tingling at the back of his throat, the hint of something dangerous but far away. The slight breeze across the plaza swept scents of foliage with it. The protest continued, now a little noisier but still peaceful. I can feel a threat, but it's a long way away, Ben opened his eyes, worried that he had answered the wrong question. 
Like a really bad storm coming? Nothing more. Exactly, said Jason. Billions of unsettled, unhappy people ready to fight. People who want things to be settled. People who need peace. And that's our job, right? Yes, said Jason. That's our job. And I'll be working with you. Ben wanted to make sure. He was learning his first lesson in what Jason called expedience. A few weeks ago, he had been a commando, a hero, a real soldier who had helped sabotage Centerpoint Station and enraged the Corellian government. Now he had to be quiet and speak when he was spoken to. He needed to know if Jason would only treat him as an adult when it suited him, like his father did. On some planets, you were a man at thirteen, and that was that. No going back and no worrying about what your parents would say. Mandalorian boys became warriors after trials at thirteen, supervised by their fathers. Jedi were trained from childhood, too, but trials took an awful lot longer than that. Ben knew he wouldn't be a Jedi Knight until he was well into his twenties. It seemed like a lifetime away. Suddenly he envied Mandalorian boys he would never meet. Yes, said Jason at last. Of course you will. It's not always going to be easy, but you can handle it. I know you can. Some of the things we'll talk about have to be kept between us. But that's the way with military matters. Are you ready for that? As if he would discuss anything with his father. He wasn't even comfortable discussing some things with his mother these days. Like Admiral Neothel. Jason smiled. Ben had guessed right again. Yes, like the Admiral, who I think is going to be an ally of ours. I understand, Jason. I know this is serious. Good. That's what I needed to hear. Ben basked in Jason's approval, but knew that wasn't the right thing to feel when they were talking about war. He was now very clear about the huge gulf between practicing with his lightsaber, which was a game, and then having to fight for real. People had already died. More would die in the future. Once the excitement of battle had worn off, he had thought about that a lot. Right then, he wanted to know what had really happened to Brescia, the strange woman he hadn't much liked on first sight, and the Jedi called... Nelani, whom they had traveled with. Jason would say only that they had been killed. No details, no explanation. But Ben recalled none of it, even though he was certain that he had been somewhere with them. Did Jason tell Dad and not me? It was eating at him. He hated not remembering things that felt important, and this did feel serious and worth remembering. Something's bothering you said Jason as they walked away, leaving the Coruscanti protest behind them. Yes. Brescia and Nelani. But Ben decided that part of growing up was knowing when to do as you were told, not like a child who didn't know any better, but as a soldier, who understood that sometimes there were things you didn't need to know. Nothing important, he said, nothing at all. Minister Koane's office. Cloning facility, Tipica City, Camino. Ten standard years after the Yuzhan Vong War. You're dying, said the physician. Boba Fett could see the man's reflection in the wall-wide sheet of transparisteel as he stared out over the choppy seas. Light beige coat, white blonde hair, ashen face. He must have wondered why Fett had summoned him all this way to carry out more tests. Because I think I need the Kaminoans' special medical expertise, not just yours, and I'm right. Tipica City was a sad ruin of the minimalist elegance that it had been in his father's day, but its few crippled towers were still more of a haven for Fett than Coruscant would ever be. He concentrated hard on the dark surface of the sea, and waited a few moments to see if the Awas were gathering in pods again, then took in the doctor's words and digested them. 
They tasted familiar, inevitable, and yet were a ball of ice in his stomach. He resisted all movement in his facial muscles and presented a mask to the doctor that was as impenetrable as his Mandalorian helmet. Dr. Bellwine was one of only a handful who had ever seen him without it. Doctors could handle disfigurement a great deal better than most. Of course I'm dying, said Fat. I'm paying you to tell me what I can do about it. Bellwine paused, and Fett watched him glance at Koane, the Kaminoan scientist now in charge of a cloning facility that was a shadow of its former self. Perhaps Bellwine feared telling a professional killer that he had a terminal illness. Or perhaps it was the pause of a good doctor trying to tell his patient the bad news as kindly as he could. Fat turned from the huge window, thumbs hooked over his belt, and raised his scarred brows in a silent question. Bellwine took the clue. Nothing. You give up easy, doctor. How long? You have a standard year or two, if you take it easy. Less if you don't. Don't guess. I deal in facts. Bellwine's eyelids fluttered in a spasm of nervous blinking. There are always uncertainties in prognosis, sir. But the degeneration of your tissues is accelerating, even in your transplanted leg. You have recurring tumors, and the medication isn't controlling your liver function any longer. It might have something to do with the unusual nature of your background. That I'm a clone, you mean? Yes. I'll take that as a don't know. Bellwine, Coruscant trained, very expensive, very exclusive, had the look of a man on the brink of making a run for the door. It's understandable that you'd want a second opinion. I've got one, said Fat. Mine. And my opinion is that I'll die when I'm good and ready. I'm sorry to give you bad news. I've had worse. If I had access to the original Camino and Laboratory records, then perhaps... I need to talk to Koane about that. Show the doctor out. The Camino and politician, all politely unfeeling gray grace indicated the doors, and the doctor slipped between them before they had fully opened. He was very anxious to leave. The doors hissed shut behind him. "'So where's the data?' said Fett. "'And Town we?' "'Town we has left.' "'Well, that was a surprise.' Fett knew Town we as well as anyone could, any human anyway and she'd seemed solidly loyal to her own kind. She'd looked after him as a boy when his father was away. He'd even liked her. When? Three weeks ago. Any reason for the timing? Perhaps the galaxy's current political instability. So she bolted in the end. Just like Ko Sai? I admit that some of my colleagues have shown a willingness to accept employment elsewhere. Kaminoans weren't exactly keen on travel. Fett couldn't imagine anywhere they'd find tolerable beyond their own closed world. And they took your data with them. Koane seemed hesitant. Yes, we have never located Kosai's original research. So what's town we taken? Apart from her human developmental expertise, a great deal of minor data. The Kaminoans had lost their reputation as the top cloning technologists of the galaxy more than fifty years earlier, when their scientists defected. But nobody had ever equaled their quality since. Anyone who could assemble that knowledge again would make a fortune, enough to boost a whole planet's economy, not just a bank account. If he hadn't been dying, Fett would have been sorely tempted to grab the opportunity. "'Are you not concerned that Bellwine might talk?' asked Koane. "'He won't talk any more than my armorer or accountant would. Fett was looking for Awas again, letting the distraction order his thoughts, instinctively prioritizing the actions he now had to take. "'They get paid for silence.' 
So what if he tells the galaxy that I'm dying? I've been a dead man before. It creates instability. For who? Mandalorians. You don't care about us. Kohane, like all Kaminoans, didn't care about anything except Kamino, whatever impression the polite façade created. Fett's ambivalent view of Kaminoans veered more toward dislike the older he became. They were for hire, just as he had been. He'd taken a fee for some dubious causes himself in his time, but there was still something less than admirable about a species that grew others to do their fighting for them. We have always had a special regard for you, Boba. He didn't like Koane using his first name. Have you still got any of my dad's tissue samples? Still planning to make some use of him? No, you couldn't keep the material intact that long, could you? No point hunting town we. Even the leg she cloned for me is degenerating. Spare parts won't help. We have a use for that technology. I don't. Town we may yet be useful to you. She is most skilled. Maybe you should have hired me to hunt Kosai a few decades ago, rather than go after town we now. We have reason to believe someone found Kosai. But we had sufficient expertise left to continue cloning without her, even if we had lost the original research on control of aging. If anyone found it, they never tried to sell it. Who would sit on merchandise worth that much? Nobody I know. It was probably Kosai's research that Fett needed now. But that was a trail that had gone very cold more than fifty years ago. Even he would have a tough job tracking it down. But someone had it. Kosai had defected somewhere. There was always an audit trail to follow, as his accountant called it. And Town Wee might be a lead to it. Maybe she had taken the same route out. Maybe she had the same paymasters. Top-class cloners were rare. We both have reasons to recover as much data and as many personnel as we can, said Kohane. If the minister had been human, Fett suspected he would have been smirking. Will you help? Making the most of me while I'm still alive? Mutual benefit. Benefit costs. Fett turned away from the window and picked up his helmet. I don't do help. He wondered if Koane ever thought of his father, Django, and knew that if he did that it was purely in terms of his utility to the Kaminoan economy. He shouldn't have been offended that another professional viewed life so dispassionately. He did, after all. But this was his father, and that wasn't a subject he reduced to credits or convenience. Using clones of his own father to defend Kamino against the clone army of the Empire had always stuck in his throat. It was the ultimate exploitation— his father would have shrugged it off as an inevitable part of the deal, he knew, but he suspected it would have angered him deep down. One of Dad's friends used to call them Awa Bait. I remember that. We can pay. Okay, dead or alive? Alive, of course. A million to bring town we back alive with the data. Two million to recover it. And an extra million for the data. Three million. Excessive. I do believe your father was paid only five million for what amounted to creating and training an army. That's inflation for you. Take it or leave it. The thought left a staccato trail in his mind like skipping a stone across water, joining up previously disjointed ideas. When the Kaminoans had last given any thought to Django Fett, there had been hundreds of thousands, no, millions of men like him, and now there were none. Fat lowered his helmet over his head again and settled into the reassurance and identity of its confines, as so many of them would have done, inhaling the deflected warmth and scent of his own breath in the brief moment before the seal closed and the environmental controls kicked in. 
had the men been deployed for the good of Mandalorians, the galaxy might have been a very different place today. But that wasn't his problem. A year left. Time enough if I concentrate everything on it. He had no idea why he had started thinking so much about the long-distant war lately. Perhaps it was because he had known what news Bellwine would break to him. I'm really going to die this time. You need this technology as much as we do, said Koane. One million. I'll find it. And it's still three million if you want me to hand it back to you when I've taken the data that I need. The most satisfying part of negotiation was knowing your walkaway point. He'd reached it now. A professional's worth his fee, Koane. Take it or leave it. I'll find someone able to pay a lot more than you can, just to cover my expenses, of course. But what use is your wealth to you now? In a human, it would have been cruel mockery of a dying man. But Kaminoans didn't have enough emotion in them for mockery. I've always got a use for it. Koane was right. He didn't need any more credits or any more power and influence, either. Politics really didn't interest him. He'd served too many politicians, often in their machinations against each other, and he didn't even relish being the Mandalore leader of the scattered Mandalorian community. So why do I care at all? He was the head of a rag bag of scattered Mandoade. There were farmers and metal workers and families scraping a living back on Mandalore. And there were any number of mercenaries, bounty hunters, and small communities in diaspora across the rest of the galaxy. It was hard to call them a nation. He wasn't even a head of state, not in the way Corellians or Coruscanti understood it. In the wake of the yu Vong War, he had just a hundred commandos to call on. But they were still doing what Mandalorians had done for generations— eking out a grim existence in the Mandalore sector, defending Mandalorian enclaves, or taking on the wars of others. He had no idea how many more people who thought of themselves as Mandalorians were spread across the galaxy. A hundred Mondo warriors was still a force to be reckoned with, though. And every Mandalorian was still a warrior at heart, man and woman, boy and girl. They all still trained from childhood to fight. I'm going to be dead within two years. I'm seventy-one. I should have another thirty in me, at least. Fat? No. Three million. I'm not finished yet. Two million credits. To find town we and bring her back. That is my best offer. I am my father's son. Death is a risk, not a certainty. Not if you use your fear for focus. I'm rebuilding your economy, Fett said. Koane might have been offended. It was hard to tell with Kaminoans. Don't insult me with small change. You talk as if you have no emotional attachment to town we at all. This is business, even if I'm dying. Take the bounty, and we will give you all our intelligence on him. And if you had enough of that, you wouldn't need me. Three million. Remember that even you cannot succeed alone. They always say that, said Fat. This was where he walked away for good. When I find town, we I'll auction the data to cover my expenses. Start saving. Fat expected Koane to run after him onto the landing platform like stubborn customers always did when they saw sense. But when he glanced back behind him, the platform was empty. Maybe that's all he could afford. Too bad. This is either my last hunt, or it's the start of a new fortune. He liked the odds. Yes, he felt he had a fighting chance. A year was a long time for a bounty hunter. He slid into Slave One's cockpit and lowered the canopy. He'd spent a fortune restoring her for the third time, and adding modifications his father Django would never have dreamed of. 
sitting in her pilot seat, looking out on an endless storm-locked ocean. He was a nine-year-old child again, delighted to be allowed to fly a mission with his father. This had once been his home. He'd been at his happiest here. He'd never been that happy since. They said your past flashed before you when you were dying. But then people said a lot of things, and he never took any notice of them unless it paid him to do so. Fett started up the drive and lifted Slave One into a standard escape trajectory. He needed to get on Town Wee's trail. But Colonet was right. What use would his wealth be to him now? Other men left empires. Other men had families whose futures their wealth would protect. He checked his highly illegal and very reliable comm scanner and set it to watch for unusual share trading in bioengineering companies. Town Wee had something to sell, and she would sell it, and the ripples would spread far enough for him to detect them sooner or later. You've only got sooner. There won't be a later for you, not unless you find the data. Even his father had wanted more than credits from the Kaminoans. He'd wanted a son. I had a wife and a daughter once. I should have taken better care of them. He'd have nothing to show for his life except a professional reputation, and the Mandalorian needed more than that. Being the Mandalore, half-hearted or otherwise, didn't give you a clan. It was time to look up old contacts. Fett leaned back in the seat, removed his helmet, and stared at his reflection in the viewscreen, as Slave One followed the course he had laid in for Terrace. He hadn't realized how much he'd missed Camino. Chapter Two Is it me? Is it me? Am I deluding myself, Jaina? Am I making the same mistake as Grandfather? I have days, most days, when I'm as certain of this as I've ever been certain of anything. And then I have sleepless nights when I wonder if the path of the Sith is a lasting solution for peace in the galaxy, or if that's my ego speaking for me. It terrifies me. But if I were motivated by ambition, then I wouldn't suffer this doubt, would I? Jaina, I can't tell you all this, not yet. You wouldn't see it. But when you do... Remember that you're my sister, my heart, and that part of me will always love you, no matter what. Good night, Jaina. Delete, delete, delete. Jason Solo's Private Journal. Entry deleted. Air Traffic Control Freight Lane, Coronet Airspace, Corellia. Han Solo would never get used to having to sneak into Corellian space like a criminal. It was one thing outrunning real enemies, but to crawl back to his home world in the Millennium Falcon under cover of a bogus transponder signal really rankled. He didn't like the Galactic Alliance any better than the next Corellian. Being howled down as a traitor and an Alliance stooge actually hurt. Now he understood what it felt like to be a double agent, always doomed to be seen as the bad guy, never free to boast what a bang-up heroic secret job you were doing for the home team. He wasn't going to use Leia's diplomatic status as a cover for his return, either. This was his home. He had a right to walk in any time he liked. No, he wasn't sneaking in. He was making a covert entry. It was all about discretion. Who was he kidding? Discretion. He fumed silently and banked the falcon a little more sharply than he planned. You need to learn to meditate, said Leia. I don't like the sound of the cooling systems. She adjusted them manually without being asked. Time for some maintenance, then. Han's rough handling of the ship left Leia making silent but pointed safety adjustments that were as eloquent as a retort. Before she blows a coolant line, or you burst a major blood vessel. That obvious, huh? And Jason's left three messages. 
Han jerked the falcon hard to starboard, a little too hard. The stabilizing drive groaned in complaint. I'm not rational enough to talk to him right now. Really? Never stopped you before. Okay, maybe I'll relax by asking Zack what his intentions are towards Jaina. That would help matters a lot. I liked Kip better. Whatever happened there? Han asked. And what about Jag? I shot him down. You know perfectly well I did. Oh, yeah, I do recall. And I intimidate her boyfriends, do I? You'd already shot down Jag long before I ever took a laser cannon to him, honey. I've got a list of intimidated ex-boyfriends somewhere. There's just Zack, left to put through the grinder, and then you've got the whole set. Han wanted to let Leia prod him into a better mood with some well-aimed sarcasm, but for once it wasn't working. Things had always been so clear before. He always knew who the enemies were, and they were good plain ones worth shooting. The Empire, the Yuzhan Vong, and any number of aliens whose purpose and intent was obvious, to threaten him and all those he held dear. Now he was in conflict with those very people he'd fought to protect, his oldest friend and his own son, and regarded as a Galactic Alliance crony by his own people. It wasn't so easy to be a hero now, even if he knew he was right. He'd never known what it felt like to be the bad guy before. Hey, I'm not the one who's wrong here. It's the Alliance. Sorry, sweetheart. He hated himself when he took it out on her. I just get mad when he won't see history repeating itself here. You know, big empire making decisions for the galaxy, whether it wants it to or not. Now, is that about Luke or Jason? Okay, both. How could Luke not see it? Didn't he see the warning signals? Didn't he see how much like the old empire the Alliance was becoming? You got a short memory, kid. I'll keep talking to Luke, said Leia, but you talk to Jason, okay? I'm worried about him. Will do. Promise? Would I argue with you, Princess? Yes, you always do. So, promise me this will never come between us. Leia laid her hand on his as he grasped the steering yoke and squeezed harder than he thought she ever could. It almost hurt. We've come through a lot worse than this. That's true. It's just a few more gray hairs, she grinned again. And I like you better with gray hair, actually. That was all he needed. She always put the galaxy back together for him. She was solid and certain, and she was usually right. He sometimes wondered what his life would be like today if he hadn't met her. If he hadn't met Luke. A space mom. And an old tired one at that. Leia had given him a sense of purpose beyond himself and the energy that went with it. She'd also given him three kids who were his heart and soul, and he had no intention of seeing his only surviving son sucked further into the Alliance's drive for galactic control. Han took the Falcon on a high approach path over Coronet, looking down the green patchwork of parks, public gardens, and farmland beyond that made it so very different from the Coruscant landscape. He set the ship down on the Civic Landing Strip, merging among a variety of vessels of all sizes and states of repair, and shut down the drives. Okay, time to be ordinary, he said. They split up to walk the distance to the apartment they'd secretly rented a few days earlier. Just two middle-aged people who weren't together and who were merely faces in the city crowd. No hidden passages or disguises were needed. It was all about looking casual. Ordinary clothes, ordinary apartment, ordinary people just going about their business. And not the solos in the middle of a war at all. They walked along the tree-lined street, idly glancing at the shops like everyone else. Han stayed twenty meters behind Leia. She could sense where he was, but he needed to keep his eyes on her. 
even though she was well able to look after herself if she was spotted by the wrong people. But who are the wrong people? Apart from my own cousin, the biggest risk is political embarrassment to my in-laws. There's no real danger here. He kept Leia in sight, sometimes losing her chestnut braid in the sea of people. It had come to Han as a surprise that the Solo family could be anonymous in public, but nobody seemed to recognize public figures unless they were Holovid stars. Chief Olmus could probably walk around here without anyone thinking he was more than just a vaguely familiar face they couldn't quite put a name to. Maybe he was the guy who read the evening Hala News Bulletin. Han slipped into the lobby of the apartment building a little behind Leia and found her waiting at the turbo lift. It was seedy compared with the apartment back on Coruscant. Seedy was just fine right now. Now what's the first thing you're going to do when we get in? she said. Call Jason. Good. You catch on fast. Don't shout at him, okay? The lift doors opened onto the 56th floor and a dull, beige-carpeted hall with a few stained patches. Leia took three strides toward their apartment door and paused, left hand held out to her side to stop Han in his tracks. The fact that her other hand slid into her tunic and emerged holding her lightsaber prompted him into drawing his blaster. Here's something, he whispered, confused. They approached the apartment door with slow, careful steps. Felt something, said Leia. Threat? No, but something isn't right. They stood to either side of the door and looked at each other, sharing a thought. Who knows we're here? Leia ran her palm down the door frame, not quite touching it, and shook her head. Nobody inside. Stand clear. But somebody's been here. Booby trap. I can't sense any immediate danger, just a feeling that someone was very nervous when they came here. Han touched the entry pad, blaster ready. Maybe they knew what a warm welcome we give uninvited visitors. The doors slid open, and they paused at the entrance, seeing only the apartment as they had left it days before, and hearing nothing except the faint sounds of the environment controls. Leia looked down and bent to pick up something from the carpet. That's nice, she said, examining it, and then handed it to Han. Nothing like a happy family reunion. It was a small sheet of flimsy. Someone must have slipped it through the gap under the doors, and that took some doing. A strange way to leave a message, but it was one that could never be traced electronically. Just a few words scrawled on a surface that was rippled, as if someone had struggled to force it through the gap. Han stared at it. Sal Solo has put out a contract on you in reprisal for your son's actions at Centerpoint. Call me Gadgin. Leia raised an eyebrow. Has your cousin threatened to kill you before? Formally, I mean. Random acts of violence don't count. She always made light of things. Han knew that the cooler she became, the more worried she was. He joined in the mutual reassurance. His cousin was to be loathed and avoided, but he refused to fear him. Thraken hasn't got what it takes, Princess. He's all talk. But Han's stomach still churned. It wasn't the prospect of assassination that worried him. He reckoned he could handle that. It was realizing that they were being watched by someone, and not knowing how and where. And I don't know any Gedgen. So how does anyone know we're here? Leia took the flimsy from his fingers and smoothed it out between her palms, as if she was trying to sense echoes of whoever had written it. Different names. New ID. No droids. No Nogri. Are you sure you don't remember the name? Should I? Maybe not. I knew a man called Nov Gedgen, who was very active against the Human League. He loathed Sal Solo. She referred to Thraken as she would a total stranger. 
It was touchingly diplomatic. But he'd be long dead now. He had kids? I don't know. But it's time I found out. Gedgen didn't bother to include his contact details. So he thinks one of us will know where to find him. Or her. Okay, or her. I'll see what I can find out while you call Jason. Life used to be so clear-cut. Han missed clarity. He opened his comm link, entered a code to conceal the origin of the signal, for all the good it had done, and waited for Jason to answer. Another contract down on me. I thought I was done with Thracken, but he just keeps popping back up. Sometimes he almost missed Boba Fett. Fett, at least, had no family axes to grind. It was just business. Thracken would send Fett. Han just knew it. Coruscant. The Skywalker's apartment. The shrouded man wouldn't leave Luke alone now. The image of the man, cloaked, hooded, anonymous, intent on evil, intruded on his dreams more frequently, not in the way of normal nightmares, but as a clear vision in the Force, and that was worse than any nightmare. It had the potential to be real if it wasn't already. He couldn't see the man's face. In his dream, he was chasing him, trying to grab that hood from his face, but he always woke up at the point where he felt his fingers close on the fabric. It felt like lightweight bantha wool. His fingers clutched again. Both the robe and the man dissolved, and Luke woke, heart pounding, fighting a feeling of overwhelming despair and anger at himself for not seeing what was close enough to touch. He decided he wasn't going to get back to sleep and got up as quietly as he could to avoid waking Mara. With the light that spilled from Galactic City's 24-hour activity and his own force sense, he didn't need to switch on the lights to pour himself a glass of water. There were messages on the comm board, the routine fretting of C-3PO, informing him that Mistress Leia and Master Han were well, and that the Nogri were becoming most agitated at the separation. And was it really necessary for the droids to remain at the Solo's Coruscant apartment when they might be needed elsewhere? Luke managed to smile, something he was finding increasingly hard to do lately. He had long suspected that droids had something in them far beyond their programming. C-3PO was as anxious and protective as any human relation would be of his family members, and it always gave him pause when anyone said, Just a droid? Yes, my friend, he said aloud, because the last thing they need is a big gold-plated droid advertising their presence, wherever that might be. Nobody ever said Corellium. But it was very hard to misplace your sister and your best friend in the Force. Luke wished them some kind of peace. He knew how hard it was to find peace when the front line ran through the heart of his own family, even if his misgivings over Jason's influence on Ben were a little way short of a full-scale feud. Luke drank while he watched the constant movement of lights from the window. His discomfort over Jason was definite in some ways, the lengths his nephew seemed prepared to go, the ways he used the Force, but vague in another way, a far deeper and more troubling one. He feared for Jason. Maybe the hooded man was someone who would threaten Jason or attempt to corrupt him. Whatever the man represented, he was a danger. Not danger in the immediate sense, like someone wielding a weapon, but something far more general and dull-pervading. Luke didn't deal in words like evil, but that was the only word that felt as if it fit. Maybe it's a vision of war. Well, I don't need a force dream to warn me of that. Nobody does. He felt Mara walk up behind him and give him a soothing touch from the doorway, just a brief warm reassurance at the back of his mind. You could have made us both a cup of calf. 
she said. If we're going to give up sleeping, might as well do it right. You'd think I'd take times like this in my stride by now. Mara tidied her hair with one hand as she fumbled with the calf dispenser. Politics? I don't think that ever gets easier. Not when your own family is tied up in it. It's Ben I'm most worried about. He gave a good account of himself at center point, but he's thirteen. Okay, I let him go, but he's still a child. Our child. How old were you when you dived headlong into the rebellion? Not that much older. I was eighteen. Whoa, veteran, huh? She winked. He saw the grim, cold girl she'd been when he met her, and thought she looked lovelier now that life had been kinder to her for a few years. Sweetheart, Jason is taking care of him. He couldn't have a better teacher. Yeah. Okay, I know we aren't going to agree on that. You know how I feel. Jason makes me uneasy. I never felt that way before. I can't ignore it. Her smile faded. I feel something a little different. I can't shake it. Mara looked about to snap back, but she nodded to herself a few times, as if rehearsing a more measured response. I feel some worrying things in the Force, too, but I've got a theory. I'm all ears. She paused again, looking down at the carpet. I think he's in love, and it's tearing him up. Jason? In love? Come on. Trust me. I felt something like it before with someone I was pursuing, and I read it all wrong then, too. A messy, painful love affair can make people feel pretty dark. All that anger and desperate love. But he's a Jedi. He can control all that. We're Jedi. We married. So how much do we control all that? He wanted to believe her. Mara was as smart as they came. She would never have survived as the Emperor's hand if she hadn't had a finely tuned sense of danger and the ability to put her own distracting emotions aside. She had to be able to see what was truly there, not what she wanted to see. Her tone softened. Shall I tell you what I see? I see Ben becoming someone who's comfortable with his force powers and not resenting us for making him a Jedi. We couldn't put him straight, but Jason could, and we should be grateful to him for that. Jason plays fast and loose with his own powers. He projected himself into the future, and don't tell me that didn't worry you. I don't want Ben learning that kind of thing. And do we really know what skills Jason learned when he was away? He's changed, Mara. I feel it. She pressed a cup into his hand and stroked his hair, but all he could feel now was a distance that shouldn't have been there, as if she was becoming wary of him or wary of upsetting him. Jason's grown up, too. He's taken a different path as a Jedi, that's all. We don't have all the answers. It's more than that. I'm having dreams, and they're about a threat to us. You really believe Ben's at risk? I feel Jason is at risk. I don't want Ben sucked into this with him. The future isn't fixed. Oh, but it is when Jason tampers with it. Whoa, let's not fight about this. I want us to find another mentor for Ben. Luke. Did you happen to notice there's no line forming for the job? However strong her defense of Jason, Luke didn't feel genuine certainty in Mara. He put the calf aside and pulled her to him, looking into her eyes. A few lines feathered from their corners, and there was a scattering of white in the mass of red hair framing her face. But she was still perfect as far as he was concerned, still his rock, still his heart. And she was still wrong. Mara, I can't ignore this. Fine. He felt her shoulders tense. Go ahead and alienate Ben just when he's starting to settle down. So what if Jason's explored some strange philosophies and communed with bugs? We've both been to the dark side, and we came through it. So you can feel the dark side. No. I feel that Jason's developing powers way beyond mine and that he's good for Ben, and that he would never harm him. She stepped back from Luke, and he sensed she was shutting him out now, perhaps to stop the conversation from degenerating into an argument that would have no winners. That makes him a good influence. Without Jason, we'd have a teenage son with strong force powers who won't listen to us, 
Now that's really dangerous. She had a point. It seemed a good moment to concede. I can't argue with that. But? I never said but. I heard but, and I felt but. But I'd be neglecting my duty if I didn't put some effort into finding out who or what this is in my dreams. Mara pursed her lips for a moment, looking to one side of him, and then managed to smile. She knew when she couldn't shift him from an idea, and he meant it. The dreams were too strong and insistent to ignore, even if it meant causing friction with Mara. She would come around in time. If he ignored his instincts, the consequences might be far worse than a few silent breakfasts and black looks. Then the smile became broader, as if she knew that. I'm going to get some sleep, and so should you. I'll finish my calf. Later. Luke took a long time draining the cup. He sat staring out the window, focusing on the bright green light of a distant, illuminated sign, to be sure that he was meditating and not dreaming. He tried to reach for the hooded man to make him show his face. The green light wavered and filled his field of vision. There were shapes within it, a feeling of familiar things in different guises, and somehow unrecognizable. But the figure in the hood remained elusive. And it was getting light now. Coruscant's towers and spires were silhouetted against a pink and amber sunrise. Of all the dreaded things that came to Luke in those dreams and visions— the one that plagued him most was the feeling of familiarity. He had felt something like this before. He just couldn't pin it down. Jason Solo's Private Apartment, Coruscant I wish you were here. Jason could reach out and touch Tenel Ka in the Force, and at that moment he would have given nearly anything to see her and his daughter Alana again. He closed his eyes and saw Tenel Ka, the same smile as when he had first left her, cradling the baby, and let his presence expand and merge gently with hers. He felt the warmth spread up from his stomach into his chest. She had felt him and returned the touch. Baby? Alana was four now. She was a little girl, walking and talking. Every time he sneaked a visit to see her, she'd grown a lot. Did she ask about her daddy? No. She was hapen royalty, and even at that age, she would have been schooled to remain silent about her parentage. How tall was she now? Was she aware of her force powers yet? He had endless questions, the kind that a father who saw his daughter daily never had to ask. I'm not there for her. I'm not seeing her grow up. I don't even have a hollow of her. It was much easier to reach out when he levitated like this, legs crossed, hands in his lap. Without the sensory distraction of a seat beneath him or the fabric of the chair against his hands, he could focus totally on the ebb and flow of the force around and within him. He let the warmth fade before it became a lasting beacon for him. He wasn't sure yet. But Tenel Ka would understand that he had to be discreet even in the Force these days. He drew his touch back to the here and now. It felt like a final goodbye. Jason wasn't sure just how much Lumia could detect, and his secret family had to be protected. But the person he most wanted to have at his side, then, was his grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, a man he had never known but who had stood where Jason stood now, on the threshold of becoming Sith. Once crossed, there was no return. It wasn't one of his explorations of Ang Tai flow walking or some other arcane force skill that he could dabble in and withdraw from when it suited him. It was everything he had been raised to reject. And yet what Lumia had shown him was so true, so inevitable and so necessary that he had no choice but to believe it. But can I believe Lumia? Her skills were prodigious. 
He'd been taken aback by the Force illusion in her asteroid habitat. Lumia might well have been a true Sith follower fighting to prove to Jason that history was a one-sided story written by the Jedi. Or she might have been a clever, manipulative, and infinitely patient woman with her own agenda, seeing Jason as a useful stepping stone along the way. But the part about the Sith way being a force for order and peace if used selflessly. It's true. I feel it. I know it. And I wish I didn't. But is it me? Jason still scoured his heart and soul for the slightest sign that his motivation was ambition. He could only feel fear and dread. He didn't want this burden. That's why it's been given to you. He lowered himself until he was sitting normally, and took deep breaths until he felt ready to re-enter the everyday world. But given the choice right then between a chance to be with Tenel Ka and a moment to speak to Anakin Skywalker, yes, he would have opted for the latter. Just a few minutes to ask this one question. Did you feel the doubt and reluctance that I feel before you crossed that line? You had a secret love, too, didn't you? Jason's state of reluctant acceptance was punctured all too often now by wondering if he was falling into the same trap as his grandfather. He needed to know if it was different, because the outcome two generations ago had been disastrous for the galaxy. He just needed to be absolutely sure. Many other beings in the galaxy's history had believed they were the chosen one of their particular culture, born to create order, and all of them had clearly been wrong. Jason never forgot that. But while he was wondering, events weren't waiting for him, and the war was coming closer. He needed to talk to Admiral Neothel. She was a hardliner, ample proof that he couldn't judge every member of a species by its general reputation. For a peace-loving people, the Moon Calamari had produced an awful lot of tough naval officers. But you couldn't maintain peace without the capacity for war. Everywhere he looked, Jason saw the certain truth of Lumia's words. The Sith way was neither evil nor dangerous in the hands of the sincere. He just wasn't sure about her sincerity. And he had to be sure of his own. Ben was still asleep in the suite next door. The boy had done a lot of growing up in the last few weeks, and Jason saw the man he would become, strong but measured and able to control his passions. But today's work was for Jason alone. He summoned an air taxi and headed for the Senate building. The taxi dropped him in the plaza, where a few people were already entering and leaving the huge domed structure. Senate delegates kept odd hours. There was always activity in the building, always a debate or a select committee or some business in progress twenty-four hours a day. The Moan Calamari started their day early, and Jason wanted to simply run into Neothel without arranging a meeting, and so attracting attention. And he could do that. He knew where Neothel was. When he had seen her the day before, he had formed a lasting force impression of her as someone who wanted to talk to him very badly. She wanted Omus's job, although she was going to have to go through the office of Supreme Commander first. Admiral Pelion, new in the post but a veteran in the world of military politics, was not about to cede his office yet. Of course she wanted to talk to Jason. Word of his willingness to solve problems decisively had obviously reached her. So he could feel her now. And when he walked into the building and made his way along the marble public corridors and then along the carpeted ones accessible only to those with accredited identicards, he was tracking her. Am I scheming? Jason was ambushed by the thought, No, I have to know who I can rely on if I ever need them. He didn't need to influence her to get her to walk his way. He simply found the offices where she and the other Moan Calamari had gathered, and found somewhere to sit where she would pass him sooner or later. He settled on a padded bench in the lobby and watched the doors. 
A naval officer tied to a desk. No wonder she's frustrated. Jason wondered how she would handle high office if she got her wish and took Olmos's job. Politics were the ultimate frustration. He thought of Lumia while he waited, and Ben had asked if he was going to tell Luke about Brisha and Nalani. Hello, Uncle. Lumia's back. Thought you'd like to know, for old time's sake. No, it wasn't news he felt he could break to him. Jason felt the ripple of disagreement and counter-argument around Neothel and her resistance as she stood firm. Sometimes he could almost see it, like a faint ghost image of color and shape and movement as the emotions ebbed and flowed. Neothel was all certainty. That was something he sought, too. He heard doors part and the muffled sound of voices. Admiral Neotho appeared in the lobby in a white uniform, very formal, and had no choice but to spot him. He was facing the doors. She had to acknowledge him. Jason stood. No use of the force. Let's see where this leads. Jedi Solo, she said, giving him that sideways stare. He felt her caution. Are you here on business? Just passing. I'd like to hear your account of the raid on Centerpoint. It would be very helpful. Jason bowed his head politely. Would you like to continue the discussion outside this building? Neothel began walking toward the exit without answering. That didn't take any persuasion at all. They didn't speak until they were outside and crossing the plaza. Neothel was not one for small talk, and Jason liked her forthright manner. How far back have we really set Centerpoint Station? she asked. They headed for the public landing area and got into one of the waiting air taxis. Cayenne Club driver? That was a very exclusive officer's club that Jason had never visited. Useful. He closed the partition that separated the passenger cabin from the cockpit to ensure privacy. Six months, he said. No more. Then said Neothel. That's how long we have until a full war breaks out. She left the stark analysis hanging on the air, as if she was waiting for Jason to fill the silence. I don't feel the galaxy can take another war so soon after the yu Zhan vong invasion, he said. It'll be the fourth major war in a century, yes. Poor odds. I'd like to be able to look forward to a century without war, and I'd like to be forced to look for another job. Jedi Solo. Jason thought for a moment that she was being brutally open about her political ambitions. But the way she rolled her head slightly and looked at the battle honor ribbons on her uniform made him realize she meant an end to any need for war. Perhaps the two were the same thing. My own family is divided over this. Most Jedi never have families, Neothel sent. We've had an interesting relationship with what we call attachment. Was she checking out his loyalties? My duty as a Jedi is to consider trillions of other lives. If we continue to botch actions like the Corellian engagement, then we could be in for a long war. I've thought about how successful an attack on their shipyards might be, Jason said. I doubt the political will could be bent to more than support for a blockade. It ties up a lot of resources. So do assaults on multiple fronts. It was one of those conversations that was test and counter-test, but Jason didn't blame the awful for being wary of a Jedi's political will, given Luke's indecisive approach. The taxi headed south from the Senate through a city of people beginning the day, and others returning after a night at work. They were in the heart of the restaurant district that served the summit, its sky lanes lined with smart places to eat, and elegant hotels, and private clubs where politicians and senior military officers could find rooms and discreet service. I prefer my club to having a home here, said Neothel, as if Jason looked curious. He was just feeling distracted by something that began nagging at the back of his mind. 
Now perhaps we can give further thought to this blockade. So. Jason jerked his head around, suddenly seized by such a powerful sense of immediate danger that his instinct was to fling himself on the offal and wrap the taxi tight in a force shield. The vessel bucked hard as if it had been hit by a tidal wave. There was a second of silence before a deafening whomp shook it like a box, and they were caught in an instant blizzard of what seemed to be glittering snow. It hammered the hull as Jason fought to hold the taxi steady, oblivious of the pilot's efforts. Shattered transparisteel. It seemed to go on for minutes— the pilot was shouting. Jason straightened up, staring into the rapidly blinking eye of a shaken Neothel, and knew that they had caught the tail end of a huge explosion. Ah, oh, just look at that, said the pilot. He seemed to be holding the taxi stationary now without Jason's unseen assistance. Neothel swallowed hard. Well, this changes everything. Jason could feel what had happened, but it was still a shocking sight. Ahead of them, the sky lane seemed to be a gaping hole of nothing, as if a whole mass of speeders had fallen out of the sky, which they clearly had. And for a hundred meters, the buildings on either side were like jagged open mouths. Each transparent steel frontage had been blown out. The force was torn with anger and fear and shock. The unnatural silence was broken by emergency klaxons and echoing shouts, Jason realized the taxi's screens had collapsed into the cabin, although still in one piece. And Jason felt anger, real physical anger. This was mindless, indiscriminate violence, and the galaxy might destroy itself in a billion more acts like this if order didn't prevail. He abandoned his Jedi self-control for a moment and dared to savor his own outrage and his pity for the inevitable victims. Comrallians, said the pilot. His voice was shaky. He'd reached an instant conclusion that didn't even allow for the possibility of an accidental explosion. So would many other Coruscanti. Like Neothel, his first thought was that a bomb had been detonated, and that the skirmishing had escalated into something that would harden everyone's stance. Terrorism had returned to Coruscant. Through the gaping rear window, Jason saw air speeders backed up behind them. He hardly dared think about what was happening hundreds of meters below, where debris and vessels caught in the blast had fallen. But, he thought, and let anger fire him up and give him purpose again. Maybe not, Jason said, and maybe in the end it really doesn't matter who. The driver looked at Jason as if he were insane. Driver, take us back to the Senate building any way you can, said Neothel. She composed herself fast. It probably took a lot to rattle an admiral who had seen action. She was already tapping codes into her comm link and calling aides to get information from the security forces. Jedi Solo, I need to talk to our senator. The pilot managed to obey in that odd, quiet way that shocked people did and spun the taxi around to lift into a higher sky lane. Jason assisted with a few well-timed force pushes to gently part log-jammed speeders. Yes, Corallians. I really wanted to be wrong about the war. This is going to get ugly very fast, he said. Going to take some strong, reassuring action, then, said Neothel. What about the damage to my taxi? said the pilot. Neither of them answered. Jason's mind raced ahead. This was perfect timing for Lumia's purposes. Unnaturally so. The fact that he couldn't feel her hand in this meant nothing. She seemed to be capable of deceiving him. But that almost didn't matter. Events had been unleashed that would have a life of their own. He was needed more than ever. He could avert total anarchy. And that was a dangerous thought— but he thought it anyway. Somebody had to, and somehow he needed to test Lumia. Chapter 3 Alit Orisha Taldin Family is more than bloodline. Mandalorian proverb. The Skywalker's Apartment. Coruscant. 0800 hours. 
Mara almost dropped her cup and steadied one hand on the table. What's wrong? Luke caught her shoulder and leaned over her. She began mopping spilled calf with her napkin, distracted. Honey, are you okay? Jason, she said. Luke sought Ben in the force immediately. He was there, with no hint of concern or danger. Jason, though, was not. There was nothing of him to detect. He just blinked out, said Mara. She opened her comm link. I know he can do that when he wants to, but this felt weird. She paused, eyes fixed in defocus at the far side of the room as she listened. Ben? Ben, are you okay? Yes? Where's Jason? No, nothing important. Don't worry, I'll call you later. Luke didn't hear Ben's response, but he was clearly at Jason's apartment as he was supposed to be, and unharmed. Mara stood up and pushed her hair back behind her ears, still looking distracted. She was far more attuned to Jason than Luke was, and he wondered if she kept tabs on her nephew as a precaution. That reassured him. Her old assassin habits hadn't died. They were still very much a part of her, adapted, pragmatic, and useful. Hello, Nat, she mumbled and switched on the screen, looking for a news channel. I get the proverbial bad feeling about this. I just need to know what's going on. She was right. Luke had begun to sense a welling anxiety and disturbance, a sense of something growing like a bank of storm clouds. While Mara made fresh calf, he wiped up the rest of the spill, watching her carefully. They were finishing breakfast when the HNE News Flash announced that there'd been an explosion in the hotel district south of the Senate. There was, said the hollow anchor, speculation that it was a bomb. Mara opened her comm link instantly, face set in blank concentration, and waited. Jason's not answering, she said. It was easy to add two and two and reach a completely wrong total. Luke put his arm around her and squeezed. There'll be a simple explanation. It's a big planet, and the chances of his being caught up in that are remote. I tend to plan for worst scenarios, she said, and returned the hug. And right now I've got no idea whether we should be looking for him or not. Like all people used to being in control and taking action, Mara had that instinct to do something in a crisis even if there was nothing obvious for her to do. Luke shared it. We can't stay out of it, even if we don't know what it is. The force didn't take a day off. If that really was a terrorist bomb, said Luke, then we'd better head over to the Senate, because Omas is going to want to discuss the implications. Mara's blink rate had slowed right down, and she had gone quiet. He thought of it as her sniper mode. Assessing, planning, coolly rational. He was always impressed that she could salvage the beneficial parts of her past life as an imperial assassin and discard the darker aspects. But he was still glad they were on the same side. She grabbed a jacket, not one of her usual fashionable ones, but something gray and functional, as if preparing for combat. I hope nobody jumps to conclusions too fast. It's one of those things that could tip people here into doing something rash. Luke wasn't sure if she meant politicians or citizens. Perhaps it didn't matter. One would trigger the other either way. He gestured toward the landing platform. I'll drive. You monitor the news. H.N.E. kept using the word explosion and managed to make it sound like bomb every time. Luke tried to slip the airspeeder through the increasingly congested sky lanes as traffic backed up from the scene of the explosion. It didn't take much to gridlock a crowded city that depended on tightly controlled transport. He glanced at Mara. What if it's not a bomb? People jump to conclusions. If they want to believe it's a bomb, facts won't get in the way. I can't imagine Corellia resorting to planting bombs in civilian areas. Corellia, Mara said. See, we all do it. 
I thought of Coralia, too. We've got a thousand species on Coruscant, and most of them have their dingbat element. It could be anybody. Perception usually overrides facts. You said it, sweetheart. The speeder had slowed to a crawl in the traffic, as sky lanes above and below them backed up, too. Luke considered force-pushing his way between vessels, but there was simply no longer the maneuvering room to do that safely. He found the next public landing area and set the speeder down to continue the journey on foot. In theory, a pedestrian could cross the whole planet via walkways and streets. In reality, it was slow going. But it was useful to be close enough to people to get a sense of what they were feeling. And the overwhelming taste in the force was mostly anger. It wasn't the political anger that emanated from Senate delegates. It was the personal, focused, fearful anger of people whose lives had been directly affected by a conflict on another planet. Coruscanti had been used to feeling safe for millennia. They were just getting used to being safe again, after the Yuzhan Vong had been defeated, and now that fragile security had been shattered. It felt like a volcanic fissure opening the dark side. The air seemed charged. The object of that anger, whom people hated, whom they blamed, would affect the course of the conflict with Coralia. As Luke and Mara walked toward the Senate, the public news display screens were surrounded by people staring up at the unfolding news, grim-faced. The display showed which parts of Galactic City had now been sealed off, and harassed fire service officers explaining that they still hadn't reached the seat of the blast or assessed the total number of casualties. Luke paused behind them. Mara carried on and disappeared into the crowd. Nobody recognized them. That might have been a blessing. "'Has anyone claimed responsibility yet?' he asked. A young man in a delivery pilot's yellow coverall half turned to him. "'No, but they don't need to, do they?' "'They?' The man's gaze darted back to the screen. "'Corellium. Retaliation for Centerpoint, isn't it? Obvious.' Luke bit back a response and simply carried on walking. He caught up with Mara, who was waiting in a doorway and talking to someone on her comm link. She looked up and shook her head at him. One hundred and five dead so far, and rising. Three hundred injured. I just called Omis' office. They've declared an emergency. Must have been a big device, judging by the damage. You don't need much to do a lot of damage in a crowded city made of towers. Transparasteel blown out like a million blades, speeders falling thousands of meters, Shock waves concentrated on buildings by the canyons. Luke could guess at the details. The force around him felt in turmoil, but most of it seemed to be coming from the people nearby. He took Mara's arm and pressed on through the crowds. It took them half an hour to reach the Senate, and Omis had already left the chamber to visit the emergency response command center deep below ground level. Luke and Mara walked into a huge room that appeared to be one large holo display, packed with uniformed officers. The sign above the doors simply said, Strategic Center. This was where joint galactic city authorities managed the longer-term effects of an incident, planning for what was needed in the days that followed, while the minute-to-minute -minute work went on at the tactical and operational command centers down the chain. When Luke concentrated on what he had walked into, he realized that every branch of the city's emergency services had personnel there. He recognized Coruscant Security Force, Fire and Rescue, Air Traffic Control, Med Center Managers, and the City Authority. Olmus stood talking to a young CSF captain in front of a data display. When Luke walked up behind them, he saw they were looking at a changing list of casualties. The entire wall was a mass of status boards, from lists of sky lanes that had been rerouted to which med centers were receiving the injured. Omis turned to Luke and Mara and shook his head. We can rule out an accidental explosion, he said. CSF picked up traces of commercial-grade detonite. Mara maintained her detachment. 
her gaze tilted up and down the casualty list. Mostly unnamed, just descriptions, and Luke wondered if she was looking for Jason among them. Where was it placed? Luke asked. In one of the hotels, said the CSF officer. The ID tab on his tunic said Chevu. The elite. There's no obvious motive for the location, but it looks as if it detonated in a guest room. Might have been an own goal. Own goal? Blew up while the terrorist was handling it. So we have a room to go on. Then we ought to have an identity for the guest. We're checking that out. We can't afford to guess at this. Captain Chevu looked down his nose at Luke, polite but clearly irritated by the suggestion. I don't guess about anything, sir. We're working with hard information that's coming in from tactical and operational. And where there are gaps, they stay as gaps until we have data. And what will our response be if this turns out to be Corellians? Omas seemed to take exceptional interest in a status board showing the list of premises affected by the explosion with red points of light, indicating whether they had been checked and secured yet. If this isn't shown beyond doubt to be the responsibility of the Corellian government, then our response must be to treat it as any other crime. I think Master Skywalker means the less formal response, said a voice behind Luke. He hadn't even felt Jason enter the room. The fact that Jason could startle him was disturbing. Mara turned, too, and even though Jason was standing there in front of them, Luke couldn't feel him. And, judging by her expression and her little flare of anxiety in the Force, Mara couldn't either. Then, like scent suddenly wafting up from a blossom, Jason's presence was there, all around them, magnified. So he wants to show me how powerful he is. Luke regretted the hostility in his thoughts, but it did nothing to reassure him. Sorry, Uncle, said Jason. The tension was, of course, invisible to a room full of non-Jedi. I got caught up in the blast. I came to see what I could do. I'm glad you're okay. Luke picked up on his original question. Yes, Captain. I mean the informal response. Retaliation. Escalation. Victimization, Chevu suggested quietly, still watching the status boards. That'll make life in the city very awkward. Latest tally from immigration control says we have nearly twenty million Corellians living here. Most of whom are harmless, said Luke. And not easy to identify except by ID docs, said Jason. They look just like us. They are just like us. Omus put his hand on Jason's shoulder and steered the conversation into calmer waters, with the ease of a professional statesman. Shall we continue this discussion elsewhere? We're getting in Captain Chevu's way. He has an incident to manage. He gestured to one of the dozen small rooms off the main chamber, each marked with a board above the doors. Fire and rescue cell, CSF cell, med service cell. Omus ushered Mara, Luke, and Jason toward a room marked Information Cell. I'd like to discuss how we handle this with our public affairs people. Perception at times like this is everything. It's the difference between 100 dead in a speeder bus crash and 100 dead in a terrorist attack. One is a tragedy and the other is the beginning of a war. Luke glanced at Mara, who met his eyes but showed no outward sign of her anxiety. Most of the troubles they had faced in their lives had been big, truly big. Invasions, alien armies, dark Jedi, each of them well beyond the scope of tidy incident management by Coruscant's civil servants. This was a small event in global terms, but like a snake bite, small, painful, and with the potential to poison a whole planet. Jason walked ahead of them, his presence in the Force betraying nothing but calm determination. Upper City Terrace Boba Fett didn't care if anyone recognized Slave One as his ship. There wasn't much they could do about it. Stealth was fine in its place, 
but he didn't have to hide. And the restored shell of once glorious terrace was so far off the beaten track these days that there really was a chance that nobody here knew who he was. It was a useful base for the time being. The galaxy seemed to have forgotten it existed, which was no bad thing, seeing as it had been raised to the ground four millennia ago in the Jedi Civil Wars. Thet savored the irony. He'd come to think of most galactic wars as Jedi feuds because they almost always came down to Jedi versus Sith. The Yuzhan Vong had almost been a refreshing interlude. Things never change, do they? He also found it interesting that the total restoration of a ravaged planet resulted in pretty much the same social order as before, the world once again reflecting the huge gulf between its classes in literal architectural levels. People never learn either. He set the defense shield on Slave One and walked along the promenade, drawing cautious glances from some of the smartly-dressed residents out for their evening stroll. The upper city was again an echo of Coruscant, soaring towers inhabited by the solidly rich. The lower city was a cesspit, and the subterranean levels, well, he vaguely recalled pursuing a bounty down there years ago, and it had been very ugly, even for a man who had seen the ugliest of the galaxy's faces. Anyone who wants me to go down there again can pay triple. The thought caught him off guard. It was the sort of vague future plan that was beyond a dying man. Goran Bevin was waiting for him at the plush Horizon Hotel. He sat at the bar with a large mug of Teresian ale and a bowl of something that might have been deep-fried crustaceans of some kind. He had almost deferred to the bar's dress coat. His helmet was placed on the bar beside him. But in his deep blue battle-scarred Mandalorian armor, he still didn't fit in among the beautifully dressed patrons. Fat walked up behind him. You always sit with your back to the doors. Bevin turned. Apparently not startled to hear the voice of his Mandalore, ruler of the clans, commander of supercommandos, Fat had never quite come to terms with his peacetime role. When I've assessed the risk, yes, he looked at Fett's helmet with slow deliberation. Can I get you an ale and a drinking straw? You're a riot. What are those? Bevin popped one of the fried things in his mouth and crunched with exaggerated relish. Coin crabs. Reminds me of those happy days we spent frying you, Jean Vong. Sentimentalist. Bevin gestured around at polished wood and expensive upholstery. This is pretty comfortable. I always think of Terrace as a dead world. Maybe that's why I feel a kinship with it. Why? People often think I'm dead, too. The quip didn't seem quite as amusing now. There was no point telling anyone else about his condition. Not yet. And maybe never. So what have you got for me? Fat sat down on the stool next to Bevin, adjusting his holster carefully. The bartender, a middle-aged human male, whose high-collared uniform looked as expensive as his customer's evening dress, had a question forming on nervous lips. Fat knew it was probably a reminder that Sir should remove his helmet. He turned his head so that it was clear he was staring at the man through his visor and waited for him to change his mind. He did. Fat turned back to Bevin. Got on with it. Thraken Sal Solo approached me with a contract on the whole Solo family. You know, I'd really like an ale now. Relax. Never done that. Not like ordinary people. Direct. Via an intermediary. But he forgets how good my comlink surveillance skills are. And my contacts, of course. Wonder why he didn't ask me to go after Solo, said Fed. He considered the coin crabs and thought better of it. Everyone else did. Maybe he thinks you'd be bored with it. 
and too expensive. Right on both counts. Han Solo was irrelevant now, truly irrelevant. Fett had never had a feud with him anyway. Just a string of contracts, and contracts were never personal. So? So I hear he's had a few takers. Not you. I don't do families. I only hunt criminals. I don't want to be one. I'm still waiting. Okay. Word is that Aylin's back and interested in the contract, too. Fett was glad of the privacy of his helmet. He rarely registered surprise, because there was almost nothing left in the galaxy that could surprise him. But this felt suddenly raw, even after decades. His only child was alive. He'd heard nothing of her since the Yuzhan Vong invasion, when billions had lost their lives. How old would she be now? Fifty-four? Fifty-five? Somehow I knew she wasn't dead. It beats her taking a contract on me. His stomach chilled. No, you don't mean that at all. You mean that she's your daughter, however much she hates you. However much she blames you for her mother's death, and you're dying, and you want to see her one last time. She's all you'll leave behind to prove that you ever existed. Who else knows? Bevine, late fifties, gray-haired, but with a grin that made him look like a mischievous kid, seemed to be staring into his eyes, concerned. Fat's helmet never appeared to be a barrier for Mandalorians. Somehow they looked straight into the core of him. I thought nobody did, because she's calling herself Aelin Habur. Fat waited. Bevine took a pull of his ale and said nothing. So what makes you think she's Aelin Val? My source tells me she's about fifty, has a Kifar facial tattoo, and flies a KDY assault ship that I think you'd recognize. But I don't think that means much to anyone else these days. His daughter had hated him enough to kill him, and take his ship and armor. At least that's what she'd thought had happened. Had she ever found out she'd killed a clone instead? Fat had managed to shrug off the news at the time. It was more than twenty years ago, but it felt different now. He wanted to know where she had been, what she had done. But it was stupid and irrelevant, and far too late. He put the impulse aside. I hope she's careful, then, he said. Bevine was waiting for more reaction. Eyebrows raised, but he wasn't going to get it. Is that all? Yes. I'm more interested in Kaminoans. What do you know about Kosai? Apart from the rumors. I'll take rumors right now. They said she was killed during the Battle of Kamino, But the general view was that she defected to the Separatists. Then there's a big black hole, and the next rumor is that someone sent her back to Kamino. I'd have known if... A piece at a time. What? Body parts. Well, some of them. Only kidnappers did that kind of thing. They did it for credits, and that didn't fit a wartime defection at all. So that was how Koane knew someone had located Kosai. Fingers. That was the usual removable body part of choice if a kidnapper wanted to focus someone's mind. Kaminoans don't have external ears. Not exactly. Parts she really needed, or so I hear. Fat tried to imagine what the scientist could have done to end up dead and dissected. Maybe she'd tried to withhold her data. But why send the parts back to Camino unless whoever held her wanted to pressure her government or teach them a lesson? And the data had never been sold. It would have been in use by now if it had. And as far as he could tell, the Kaminoans had never been asked to surrender anything, credits or data, in exchange. That sounded like revenge, and that didn't help him find what he was looking for. Why are you interested in a disappearance that long ago? Bevine asked. 
If anyone wants you to find the rest of her, it's a bit late. This was where things became uncertain for Fett. He had trusted only his father, who had put every scrap of his energy into making his son totally self-reliant. Boba Fett hunted alone. But from time to time, he was reminded that he was also the Mandalore. He had a responsibility to a hundred warriors, and, this was the aspect that gave him the problem, a nation that wasn't only geographic, but a nomadic culture, too, except that it had a homeworld and a sector, and... No, it wasn't clear at all. He wasn't sure what being Mandalore meant anymore. And he wondered if he thought of himself as Mandalorian first and bounty hunter second. He didn't. Verdorisha Beskargam. Bevin took a pull at his ale. A warrior is more than one's armor. Thet rounded on him. What? Aelin. Wearing your armor. Flying your ship. No substitute for a fighting spirit. Bevin never appeared to fear him and never called him sir. A traditional Mandalorian never would, of course. You still don't speak Mandoan, do you? Basic and Tutties, that's what I do business in. Maybe we need a little less business and a little more Mandalore, Bobica. Bobica. Some of his father's associates had called him that as a kid. His father never had. But he ignored the over-familiar form of his name. I'm busy right now. Nothing else you want done? No. I'd better be going. Just call if you have orders for me. Bevin drained the last of his ale and scooped the uneaten coin crabs into a napkin to fold them up and pocket them. You're my mandalore, after all. It might have been sarcasm. You sound very tribal these days. Spirit of the times seems to be catching on. Fett hadn't visited Mandalore or the surrounding sector for a couple of years. There was no reason why it should feel like home in the same way Camino did. We don't even know how many Mandalorians there are in the galaxy. You don't need an ID or a birth certificate to be one of us. Bevin replaced his helmet and walked out without a backward glance. Without a drink in front of him, Fat had no reason to sit there any longer either. He slid off the stool, to the visible relief of the bar staff, and wandered back to Slave One, taking in the sights along the way. There was a share-dealing shop on the walkway. Upper City was full of them open all hours to catch trading on the thousands of trading floors throughout the galaxy that made up the Interstellar Stock Exchange. Share-dealing had become an entertainment for the wealthy on this forgotten world. Fat paused and walked into the vividly lit lobby to stand in the constantly shifting interactive holo-display of the various markets. Coruscant's CSX, its domestic stock index, had taken a sudden dip since he'd last checked the markets on his inbound journey. The little red line was still edging down against the top million ISE index. Something must have spooked the traders. It didn't take much. A bantha could belch and wipe billions off stock prices if the market was nervous enough. Fat stretched out a gloved finger and touched the index that read Biotech a cascade of sub-indices tumbled out in a table, and he ignored Select Company to choose Volume Share Movement. That brought up the ranked list of companies where most shares had been traded over any given period. He chose one standard month. Three companies topped the list. Santec, Arcanian Micro, and Darumed. Arcanian Micro share prices hadn't shifted more than ten percent, though, and they were always among the top-priced shares. It was Arumed that caught his eye. The green icon beside the name told him it was small and relatively new, but someone had bought a twenty-five percent block of its dirt-cheap shares in the last week. Let's see what looked so appealing to them, then. 
Fat checked the database that fed through to his helmet's internal display, but found nothing remarkable at all about the company's activities. Arumed had been trading for a year and specialized in genetically tailored pharmaceuticals, and no dramatic new product seemed to be on the horizon to warrant speculative share buying. Unless this is insider training. Unless someone knew the company had taken on a Caminoan scientist recently, the shares wouldn't have been very appealing at all. Fett noted the assistant watching him with discreet concern. He probably didn't get too many customers with jet packs and flamethrowers in the store. The database located Arumed's headquarters on Runadan. It seemed unusual for a small biotech company to be based in the corporate sector, under the nose of the aggressively acquisitive Chiwab Laboratories. So Fat recorded the details and went back to the hollow display to browse general pharmaceutical companies. Only two more showed unusual share-dealing activity in the period since Town We had gone on the run. And one of those was Rothana-based Concare, which seemed to focus on drugs for older citizens. Like me. Kaminoans really didn't like being far from home. Rothana was within stone-throwing distance of Camino in galactic terms. He made a special note to check that one out after Arumed. Care to invest, sir, said the assistant. Fat always did his share deals through his accountant, Puth, a nimbanel who could launder and erase an audit trail almost as well as Fat himself. There was no point in having an accountant who was smarter than you were, after all. But even a bounty hunter could be prone to impulse buys. He took out a credit chip. I'll take fifty thousand shares in Steripak. They make battlefield dressings, said the assistant. His fixed stare told Fat he rarely sold a hundred thousand credits worth of shares in one deal, and his hand folded around the chip as if he thought it would escape. Expecting a war? Always. And I'm never disappointed. Fat made his way to the sparsely furnished apartment he'd bought a year before that would not, for once in his life, become an asset that made a quick profit. Terrace wasn't a fast-moving property market, but it was worth paying for the relative privacy. So, someone sent Kosai home a piece at a time. His helmet sensors told him a human was walking behind him, maintaining a constant distance. Kaminoans could easily have done a little forensics work on that, and figured out where the packages came from. It was a young woman, eighteen maybe, with dark curly hair cut close to her head. He could see the image in the hut of his helmet, relayed from the rangefinder's rear view. And while she had a blaster holstered on one hip, who didn't go around darned these days, she looked neither local nor hostile. She was wearing gray body armor, basic chest and back plates like a Mandalorian, but without colors or markings. But she's following me. I know it. So, if the Kaminoans knew who had grabbed Kosai, they had a very good reason for not going after them, and her research had never resurfaced. Fett was troubled when he couldn't spot motives. Everyone had a motive. Tomorrow... He'd set off for Runadan and give Puth a call. He needed to get his fortune in order in case he lost his race against time. What am I going to do with it? He always thought he'd know one day, until that one day was overtaken by bad news. Behind him, the girl quickened her pace and caught up with him, close enough now to reach out, take two quick steps, and touch him. He turned before she could do it, and stood blocking her path, irritated. She didn't seem startled. She stared into his visor much as Bevin had, which was unusual in itself. "'You're Boba Fett, 
she said. You passed your eyesight test. I need to talk to you. Whatever it is, you can't afford me. But can you afford me? Fat thought for a moment that he'd really read her completely wrong. But she held out her clenched fist, palm up, and parted her fingers to reveal a flat disk of opalescent stone, gold shot with red, blue, and violet. A leather strip was threaded through a hole drilled on one edge. It was a heart of fire gemstone. He knew, because he had given one like it, to Sintas Vel when they were married. It was from her home, from Kifu. He'd been just sixteen, Sintas, not much older. No. He had given this very stone to her. This was the same gem. He could see the carved edge, like rope. Four lines of a Mandalorian marriage vow that we didn't understand. A stone that she sent had some part of my spirit and hers held in it forever. Forever? Amounted to three years. They'd split up before Aelin was two. Sintas had gone bounty hunting when Aelin was sixteen and never returned. That's why my own daughter was ready to kill me. Where did you get this? he asked as calmly as he could. It was clear that the girl knew he would recognize it. There was no point bluffing. He didn't need to. From the man who killed your wife, she said. Your daughter owes me a bounty, and I know exactly where she is. Cards Tap Calf Blue Sky Boulevard, Coronet It was how you behaved that made the difference, Han decided. He sat in the tap calf facing the window and watched for Leia through the Rain Street Transparisteel. He'd thought he'd be recognized at last, but once he'd got used to not striding purposefully and drawing attention to himself, and started to move like a regular person, matching everyone else's pace, shoulders relaxed, nobody seemed to notice him. He became just another coronet citizen having a calf and whiling away the time on the boulevard. There was a hollow screen on the wall behind him, and Newsnet was running. Normally it washed over him as part of the background noise, but even over the hiss of steam from the calf machine at the bar, he heard very clearly the words Bomb and Corellian. So did everyone else in the tap calf. Silence fell. The staff even shut down the hissing calf pressure filter, and everyone turned in their seats or on their stools to watch the bulletin. The scenes from Coruscant were terrible. One hovercam shot tracked down from a shattered hotel frontage where the remnants of a sign, just the letters E-L-I, hung from a dangling section of permacrete, clinging to the tower by a thin strand of durasteel reinforcing wire. The cam dropped level after level to the bottom of the urban canyon, showing less damage as it descended, but then settling on a shocking image of what had fallen finally to the ground level. Speeders, masonry, and bodies. Han, a man used to war, looked away and shut his eyes. The stunned silence gave way to debate among strangers brought together by common outrage. We didn't do that, said a woman. We fight clean. If we wanted to bomb Coruscant, we'd use the fleet. They're blaming us. Why, don't they know us by now? No, terrorism wasn't Corellia's way of doing things. There was military sabotage, but Corellians tended to be pretty clear-cut about who was a legitimate target and who wasn't. Han wondered if the blast was a slick bit of black ops by Coruscant and the Alliance in general— to polarize positions by bombing their own people. I'm going crazy. This is Luke I'm talking about. The Jedi Council wouldn't let the Senate get away with it. But there were all kinds of murky agencies that the Senate probably bankrolled and didn't keep too close an eye on for pragmatic, plausibly deniable reasons. Luke wouldn't even know. 
He was just the same decent idealistic kid at heart that he'd always been. They're going to use this so-called bomb outrage to up the ante, to take a crack at us. Han put his head in his hands and sat there for a moment, wondering what he could possibly do now to help Corellia when he wasn't even welcome here. Eyes shut, he reached for the cup, and it wasn't quite where he thought he'd left it. Someone put a hand on his arm. Han! It was a man, and Han's instinct was to jerk his arm back and draw a blaster. But he stopped dead, hand a split second from his holster. The man was about twenty-five, dark skin, black hair, cut almost military short, a stranger. Do you know me? Han was ready to drop him where he stood. Because I don't know you, pal. But your wife knew my father. Ah, Gedgen. No, play it cool. You have no idea who this guy is at all. Prove it. Han saw a familiar movement outside the window, and Leia, the hood of her tunic, pulled up against light rain. How did you find us? Gedgen, if that was who he was, dropped his voice almost to a whisper. When you rented the apartment, you paid in untrackable credits. That's a lot of hard currency. Unusual enough to draw attention right now. From who? From our own security forces. So Corsac knows we're here and Thracken doesn't? Han nearly spat out the name. Luckily, it was a common enough first name not to draw the same attention that snarling Sal Solo would have done. Right. Try again. You're assuming that everyone in Corsac would want to tell Thracken. Han shook his head slowly. Why do I get the feeling that I don't want to know then? Well, there's Corellia, and there's Thracken, and they're not the same thing in many people's eyes. People who'd like to do something about it. Call me cynical, but I think you're talking about a change of administration without an election. I'm trying to remember the word for that. Gedgen, he could be nobody else, sat down next to him. As Leia came into the tap calf, she stared at Han, and then at Gedgen, and her lips parted as if she had realized something that quite pleased her. You're the image of your father, she said. Dear Gedgen, said the young man very quietly. He held out his hand for shaking, and their voices were lost in the chatter that had swamped the tap calf again. At your service, ma'am. Hi, honey, said Han. This nice young man is about to ask me to take part in a coup. He smiled theatrically at Gedgen. Did I get the right word? I asked him to meet us here, Leia said quietly, but he's early. Apologies. It's a habit. Just in case messages are ever intercepted. Shall we move on? Gedgen indicated the door. You can choose the location, just to reassure you in case you think I'm setting you up. Good idea, said Leia. I know just the place. She beckoned to Han. He rolled his eyes, but gulped down the remains of his calf, and followed her out into the rain, staying to one side of Gedgen so he could keep an eye on him. Leia led them to a women's fashion store. There goes my tough guy image, said Han, hesitating at the ornately gilded doors. Turbolift, said Leia, gesturing both men inside with an expression of narrow-eyed mock impatience. Under the circumstances, she seemed in a good mood. There's a calf bar on the top floor, nice and public, with several exits if anything happens that we're not expecting. Gedgen took the suspicion aimed at him pretty well. A sensible precaution, he said. Han knew he'd never enjoy calf again in quite the same way, because the taste was starting to become inextricably linked in his subconscious with bad news. They huddled around a table, surrounded by chattering shoppers and noisy children, and tried to look unremarkable. The ubiquitous hollow screen murmured away on one wall. Corellians were addicted to news. There was no getting away from that bomb blast. Okay, where were we? said Han. Ah, I remember.
removing the elected government. Go ahead and amaze me, kid. He offered Gedgen a small jug. Cream, sugar. Han, Leia fixed him with a stare. Sorry, honey. He leaned back and folded his arms. Go on, Gedgen. The young man was still totally unperturbed. You're at risk, and so is Corellia. From the same source. Power-crazed galactic government? Power-crazed individuals? That's half the galaxy on a good day. Sir, your cousin isn't doing anybody any favors. I didn't choose my family. Well, he's going to kill yours, because he's put out a contract on you, your wife, and your children. And if he carries on the way he's going, he's also going to get a lot of Corellians killed in a war we can't win. Han still didn't know what use they were to Gedgen, but he took an instant dislike to phrases like can't win. So you want us to do something? See, I have this hunch that you do. If Thraken is removed, would you consider taking his place? Oh, boy. No. Even Leia looked taken aback. Absolutely not, she said. Yeah, I already said that, honey. Gedgen managed a nervous smile. I didn't mean to embarrass you, sir. I'll do anything for Corellia, said Han. And I agree that Thraken's conducting his own war for his own ends, like he always does. But there's a real threat out there from the Alliance, and it is going to take a united Corellia to stand up to it. Just give me a blaster, not an office. You're not going back to Coruscant, then? Why should I? We're not running from Thraken. Han slipped his hand under the table and caught Leia's hand. She gave it a squeeze that threatened to numb his fingers. And we're not going to live in hiding on Coruscant, either. Might as well be here. I understand. Fine. The good news is that Thraken seems to think you're on Coruscant. Well, that's another good reason for staying put, isn't it? When we find out who's taken the contract, we'll warn you. Gedgen stood up and shook their hands. He had a mature, solid air about him, an elder statesman in a young man's body. If you'd like to help relocate, you know where to find me. If we could track you, so might others. I think I already know who'll find me. Han watched Gedgen leave. When he was sure the man had disappeared into the turbo lift, he turned to Leia. Well, you didn't say much for a hotshot diplomat. It's not appropriate for a Jedi to discuss political coups. Yeah, I can understand how that might be a sensitive area. How did you trace him? I looked up Gedgen in the comlink directories. Han laughed out loud. A large woman in a bright orange suit that really didn't do her any favors turned to look at him for a second. Funny, we always think this is cloak and dagger stuff. Gedgen doesn't need to hide. He's an elected representative of a legal political party, the Democratic Alliance. They have a lot of seats in the Corellian Assembly now. With the Corellian Liberal Front, they actually form the largest block of votes. But Thraken's still hanging on. If that dirtbag comes anywhere near you or the kids, I'll kill him, I swear. You think he's got a chance, taking on three Jedi? He won't. Contract, remember? You think it's going to be fat, don't you? Yeah. No, not fat. Why would he... He saved us from the Vong. Because business is business, maybe. Han could feel something rising in his chest, and it wasn't the effect of way too much calf. It was something animal and irrational, something that was making his pulse pound in his temples. It was anger and fear, not for himself, though, but for Leia, Jaina, and Jason. Thraken's done some dirty things, but he never went this far before. Not hiring hitmen. That changes everything. He had a thought, and it was one that almost made him recoil. I'm going to kill this scumbag this time. Nobody touches my family. Leia reacted as if he'd said it aloud. No, you're not going to contact Fett, and you're not going to hire him to hit your cousin. That never entered my mind, said Han, and it really hadn't. 
She could see that, and she could feel it, too. He knew. Unfortunately, he knew he'd have a hard job concealing the fact that he still felt murderously protective. Besides, I haven't had to deal with guys like that in a long time. Maybe you place a want ad in Bounty Hunter Weekly these days. Or call their agents. Yes, so remember we can take care of ourselves, said Leia. I'll just warn Jason and Jaina. Jason. Han kept missing him every time he called or returned a message. He really wanted to talk to him now, and not to remonstrate with him. He just wanted to hear Jason's voice. Whatever insanity had put them on opposite sides of a divide, Jason was his little boy, and always would be, no matter how old or powerful or distant he might be. Nobody touches my wife and kids. Han Solo wasn't one of the galaxy's natural assassins. He would fight to defend himself, but he'd never gone after anyone with the intention of killing them. There was always a first time. This would be his. Lost in his thoughts, Han stirred the remains of his calf with a spoon, wondering how they got the foam to last that long, and then was jerked out of his trance by the one thing guaranteed to get anyone's attention— his own name. The words Han Solo cut through the hubbub of voices and children's squealings as if the tap calf had fallen into total and complete silence for a moment. In a statement issued by the Office of the State, President Sal Solo has declared Han Solo and his family to be enemies of Corellia, following the attacks on Centerpoint and Relidir, and he's ordered their arrest said the H.N.E. hollow anchor. Han tried not to swing around in his seat or curse at the screen. He raised his head very slowly, caught Leia's eye, and focused on the screen as if bored. No, he wasn't bored at all. He was furious and a little scared. He wondered how good an actor he was, but nobody seemed to be looking at him. It was probably because the image on the screen was of a younger Han, a man still with brown hair and relatively few lines. The picture of Leia was way out of date, too. I think we'd better be going, said Leia. Some urgent laundry. Right behind you, said Han. He didn't like running, and there was nowhere safer to run. Coruscant wasn't going to welcome him with open arms, either. Either way, they were fugitives. They split up as soon as they left the store and met up again back at the apartment. Have I changed that much? said Leia. What? The picture of me that they're running. I hope so, said Han. Maybe he should have assured her she looked as good as ever to him. But he thought that practical reassurance about her safety was more important than flattery right then. And I'm going to grow a beard, just in case. How about you? Leia gave him a withering stare. I didn't shave today. You didn't notice? I meant change your hair or something. The Aura Sing look? Yes, it's so mean. I'm glad you've kept your sense of humor. You know what they say, said Leia, and took scissors from the kitchen. If you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. Chapter 4 Vandals have desecrated the Corellian Sanctuary on Coruscant. The domed building, a resting place for Corellian dead, was daubed with paint during the night, and marble plaques were smashed. Inside, diamonds set in the dome, formed from the compressed carbon of cremated Corellians, were hacked out of the ceiling. Police are treating the attack as retaliation for yesterday's bombing of the Elite Hotel on Skylane 4467, which left 634 dead and hundreds more injured. Nobody has yet claimed responsibility for the explosion, confirmed as caused by commercial-grade detonite. HNE Morning News Upper City Terrace "'My name's Myrta Gav,' said the girl. Fat stared at the heart of fire necklace in the palm of his glove, and wanted to clutch it in his bare hand, but he didn't know why. 
For the first time in many, many years, he felt grief. None of that turmoil showed. He made sure of that and studied her. Strongly built, heavy boots, practical armor, no jewelry, a battered, shapeless bag over one shoulder, and no concessions to feminine fashion whatsoever. Passers-by gave them a wide berth on the promenade. So are you a bounty hunter, or do you just like armor? Myrta, if that was her real name, nodded twice, just little movements as if she was measuring what she was going to say, rather than blurting out a smart answer. She seemed utterly unafraid of him. And that was rare. Yeah, I'm a bounty hunter, she said. Object recovery more often than prisoners, but I've survived so far. Aren't you going to ask me who killed Sintas Vell? No. Why? Because we parted a long time ago. Myrta shrugged and held out her hand for the necklace. I know. You left your wife when your daughter was nearly two. Sintas left on a bounty hunt before Aelin's sixteenth birthday and never came back. That's not common knowledge. Okay, that's proof you know Aelin Vell. And I need to return that necklace. It's all she has left of her mother. Fat hesitated and handed back the heart of fire. He wanted it very badly, but he didn't rob kids like her of their meager bounties. So it's all Aelin has left. Like all I had of my dad was his armor and his ship. How is she? What? Why am I doing this? How's my daughter? She's okay, I suppose. Angry, but she's surviving. I think you know she tried to kill me. She did mention it. Does she know I'm alive? Of course she does. Aelin had chased him across the galaxy, or so she thought, and killed a clone she thought was him. If she knew he was alive now and hadn't tried again, then maybe she had changed her mind. No, that was stupid. You left Simtas and your baby and you never looked back. Is that how Dad treated you? No, he was always there for you. So what kind of man abandons his own kid? Every day of his life, Fat had thought of his father and missed him so much that he would have traded absolutely anything, sometimes even his life, for a few more minutes with him, for a chance to touch him and tell him he loved him. Right now it was unbearable. It was as raw as it had been on the day he saw him killed at Geonosis. Perhaps more so, because the shock had worn off long ago and had been replaced by cold analysis and sometimes dull, gnawing hatred. Do you think I want to see her again? I wouldn't even recognize her. She was a baby when I last saw her. Why are you still talking to me, then? The girl was sharp. Not cocky, not insolent, just sharp. I wouldn't recognize my own kid. I see my own dad every day in the mirror and never my own kid. What a thought to die with. Why do you care if I find her? Because you might pay me. Right answer. I'm just trying to get by in a tough galaxy. How much? She paused. It was the first time he'd seen her confidence waver. She doesn't know how much to ask. Five thousand. It was the cost of a repeating blaster. Done. Payable when I see Aelin Vell in proof of who she is. He didn't need her as a guide at all. All he had to do was find Han Solo, and he'd find Aelin hunting him. But that necklace had seized his interest. You got transport? Well... Just so you don't skip out on the deal, you come with me. I can keep a good eye on you and slave one, girl. I'm heading Aelin's way anyway, so you're just ballast. Take it or leave it. Okay. Let's go. Myrta never said a word. She just followed him. She didn't ask to go back and collect her things or pose any questions. She was either very cool or very naive, and maybe her whole life was in that scruffy shoulder bag. But she had his wife's necklace, and sooner or later he knew he'd ask how she came by it. 
and how Sintas died. He'd wait a little. He didn't want to look as if he cared. She could carry on believing that he needed her to locate Aelin. But you wouldn't recognize your own daughter. Just her ship. Your old ship. And here he was, a man who trusted no one, chancing himself on the word of a girl he didn't know, when he should have been concentrating on finding town we and co-sized data. But he could do that as well. And if the girl turned out to be trouble, he could always shoot her. Security and Intelligence Council meeting room, Senate building. I think you could do this, Mara, said Chief Omas. The enemies we face won't always be conventional armies, or even in a separate theater of war. So we feel we need a separate arm of the Defense Force concentrating on domestic security. Domestic security. Sounds like a lock on the front doors and an intruder alarm. Jason watched, still concerned by the speed at which events were unraveling. Mara didn't move a muscle. She sat with her legs tightly crossed and arms folded. And Jason felt her dismay from across the room without even wanting to. He tried not to look at Luke, who was standing by the window, staring out at the Coruscant skyline. There was something terrible about conflict with family that was even worse than with others. It felt much more savage and dangerous. You weren't supposed to have rifts with your loved ones, which was another good reason why Jedi weren't supposed to have loved ones. But that's not Sith. Avoiding detachment is not the Sith way. Are you really wrong about all this? Jason shook himself mentally. The moments of indecision would pass, and he wouldn't have doubts if he'd been driven by ambition. Reluctance was becoming his touchstone, his proof that he was doing this for the right reasons. Why me? said Mara. You've been an intelligence agent, said Omas. The head of the Security and Intelligence Council, Senator Gifli Gassel, sat to one side of Omas in silence, scrutinizing Mara, and then looking slowly toward Jason and Luke, as if he had never seen a Jedi before. Mara's reluctance wasn't even disguised. I'll do my duty for the Alliance, she said, but I'm not sure I'm psychologically equipped to head up, well, a secret police force. There's no other word for it. Spying is one thing, and maybe even assassination. But this is new to me. We spent so much time dealing with the Yuzhan Vong that we lost our focus on threats closer to home, said Gassil. But I'm old enough to remember that when terrorist activity starts, you need to move fast before it spreads and networks get established. If they aren't already, the world brain tells me they're on the move, gathering, meeting. Let me think about it, said Mara. But that was just words. Everything else about her was adding, and then say no. Luke turned slowly hands deep in his pockets, and stared out the window. And for a moment, Jason wondered if he was going to volunteer instead. No, that kind of warfare simply wasn't Uncle Luke. He was head-on, lightsaber in hand, face to face with the enemy. The kind of enemy who came at you in open combat. He was too decent and honest to think like a terrorist. He had rules. It was what made him strong. "'We'll be going then, Chief,' said Luke. He bowed his head slightly. "'Let's see how the next few days pan out, and then revisit this.' He nodded politely to Jason, and left with Mara. She gave Jason a glance over her shoulder, and smiled anxiously. Omus waited for them to leave, and then looked at Jason. "'I can understand everyone's reluctance,' he said. It's not heroic work spying on your neighbors. Gasil gave a little snort of amusement. It's heroic until you're the person whose ID is being changed, and then it's an affront to your rights. People are going to have to get used to that again. It won't be the first time, Omas said. 
Jason thought now was as good a time as any to ask again. Have you had further thoughts on the matter I suggested the other day, sir? Omus's mind was clearly elsewhere. Hitting the shipyards? Yes. I'll discuss it with Admiral Pelion. If he thinks it has merit, I'll table it with the Defense Council. Thank you. Jason should have gone back to his apartment and used his time to teach Ben more of the subtle techniques of the Force. But he admitted to himself that he was as impatient as his young pupil. He had set Ben a study task to occupy him in his absence, to visit the sites of the bombing and the attack on the Corellian Sanctuary, and to sense what he could of the people and events surrounding them. It was a tough assignment. It would frustrate him and keep him busy for at least a day. And Jason needed a day to himself to resolve his doubts over Lumia. She was still in her asteroid habitat near Bimiel. He felt her there. When he concentrated, he could sense her emotions, which were an odd blend of relief and sincerity. But if she can create the kind of force illusions we experienced in her home, then she could fake anything. She could have been anywhere, even on Coruscant. She might be able to project totally false emotions, too because he could do much the same himself and fool even other Jedi Masters into believing them. I'm not proud of that, but it's a necessary skill. Jason walked toward the restored Jedi Temple. It was there as it had been for millennia, albeit in a new, modern guise, and the destruction by the Yuzhan Vong seemed no more than a brief absence the guttering of a candle in a breeze. When the breeze dropped, the flame would reappear, as steady and unmoving as it had been before, and so had the temple. Jason walked along the wide promenade to the entrance. The stepped base, cut from almost flesh-tinted stone, lifted the temple complex a little above the buildings surrounding it. This wasn't a world of constructed canyons like the rest of Galactic City. This quadrant was low-rise, and from the Transparasteel Pyramid was a view that few in Coruscant ever saw. Not the close gaze of another towering building opposite, and a dense forest of others as far as the eye could see, but a wide vista. It was one of permacrete, stone, and transparent steel rather than grassy plains, but it was a rare open view of the horizon nonetheless. The temple's architecture and interior design were aggressively modern, but key parts of the layout, like the council chamber, had been retained. The marble floor was a replica of the original. It struck Jason as obsessive rather than reverent, as if the Jedi Order had never wanted change and challenge to interrupt its sense of permanence. Jason paused, hands meshed, and saw something he had never seen before. He saw ambition. He saw a love of power and status. He saw a statement of government, of inexorable permanence. We're back. We're not going to be swept aside again, the stone almost spoke to him. This didn't feel like spirituality. He didn't like it. No wonder Luke had insisted that the new grand trappings in the council chamber be removed. Jason shivered at the touch of mundane ambition. And to think he'd been afraid that he was being lured to the Sith way by a lust for power. He lowered his arms to his side and tried again to feel something that would explain the sense of a tightly grasped power that pervaded the building. It almost tingled in his fingers. It moved in his chest like a symbiont that had invaded his body. It might be the ambition and pride of architects, craftspeople, builders. Don't judge so fast. But construction droids had done most of the work. He couldn't shake off the clear impression of the exercise of power and the love of it that felt as if it had built up like sediment in an ancient river over centuries. He hadn't felt it before. 
Marble and pleak wood created an understated, cool interior, interrupted occasionally by faithfully copied busts of great Jedi masters, displayed in niches in exactly the same places as they had been before the Yuzhan Vong, and before the temple had burned in the purges following Palpatine's seizure of power. Jason paused again as he walked through the lobby. There had been objections to the cost of the reconstruction of the temple, when so many urgent post-war restoration projects seemed more pressing. Some citizens couldn't see the point. The government insisted. The Jedi Council said it wanted to restore normality. Uncle Luke, this was never the way you saw the order, was it? How did they talk you into this? Jason knew exactly where he was now, and it scared him. He had a finely tuned sense of where he was in space. Had he rolled back time fifty-nine years to this exact distance from the planet's core, this exact distance from the planet's north pole, this very point in three dimensions, he would have been walking with his grandfather, Anakin Skywalker. But I can walk back in time. Jason could time drift. He was almost too afraid to, but he did almost without thinking. As he projected himself into the past and merged with its reality, he saw a young blonde Jedi with his lightsaber drawn, flanked by troops in white armor. Jason was looking at him from behind. He could see the muscles in his jaw twitching as his head turned, seeking something. He could feel his dread and determination. Nobody spoke. They were searching, all of them looking to one side, then the other, aiming rifles and lowering them a little. Something terrible was happening. Anakin! Anakin Skywalker held his lightsaber two-handed, and for a moment Jason was one with his grandfather's emotions. He was overwhelmed by a dread and reluctance, the same dread and reluctance he had felt himself when Lumi had told him his destiny. Jason felt, too, a crushing sense of something terrible and deadly about to happen. He hung back. He'd been spotted while time-drifting before, and had been forced to withdraw. But he had to stay with this. He hardly dared think ahead. I might be able to ask him. I might be able to ask Grandfather about his own fall to the Sith. This would be his answer about his own path. He touched Anakin's emotions again, comparing them with his own. And then he felt something that was not within him at all. It was desperate, terrified loss. For a second he couldn't identify it. Then it settled and became clear in the form of a tight sensation in his throat, and the pressure of tears behind his eyes that stung and burned. It was very like the brief misery he had felt when he left Tanoka and his daughter. Anakin was facing separation from Padme and was terrified by it. But it wasn't a moment's emotion for his grandfather. It was the whole of him. Anakin had been driven to the dark side by agonized love. The revelation stunned Jason, because it was so narrow and so selfish. Relief flooded him. This is different. That isn't what I feel or what's driving me. And right then he wanted to talk to his grandfather more than anything he could imagine. It was a burst of love for a man he had never known. A man who had helped to bring balance to the Force. You're insane. You're going too far. Don't even think about influencing the past. But he had absolutely no idea what the past really was. Right up to the point where he saw the younglings approach Anakin, scared but clutching their lightsabers, telling him there were too many soldiers for them to drive off. Anakin stared down at them. Then he drew his own saber, and Jason tasted absolute grief and shame and duty. He was hunting Jedi. He was killing them somehow, 
for Padme's sake. His reasoning was vivid and focused. Jason knew that Anakin had done this, but seeing it, feeling it, living it, was agonizingly new and shocking, because the emotion was so desperately animal in its intensity. No, I'm not feeling this. It's one of Lumia's vile tricks. I'm not seeing this. Then one of the armored troopers appeared, raising his rifle, and Jason jerked himself out of time and back to the present, heart pounding. Grandfather? Are you all right, Master? said a very young apprentice. The girl had a bright, optimistic face like polished ebonite. She held a data pad in one hand. Can I get you some water? I'm fine, thank you, he lied. Just a little giddy, that's all. The girl bowed her head politely and walked off, eyes fixed on her data pad. Jason wanted to vomit, but he controlled his shock and revulsion. He now knew things he could never erase from his mind. It was Anakin's moment of madness, his surrender to slaughter, even though he knew it was insane. That wasn't the man he had grown to understand through his mother and uncle. Would he go that far for his own wife? Would he know where personal need outweighed his duty? He centered himself with every scrap of effort he could muster, and waited for the turbo lift, eyes averted when anyone passed. He felt they could see the horror in his soul. But, of course, he was now adept at concealing even that from other Jedi. I'm not grandfather. The lift seemed to take forever to arrive. I was meant to see how low he fell. He hit the control with the heel of his hand, fighting tears. Come on, what's keeping you? Two apprentices stared at him, but hurried past. That's my proof. That's my pain. I have to embrace it to understand that I am not making my grandfather's mistake all over again. Jason knew what it was to love, and he was older and far more experienced than Anakin Skywalker had been then. He could handle what was happening to him now. He would never do another's bidding, and he could become a Sith without fear of being sucked down into something evil. He still didn't relish the duty, but it was a duty, not a delusion. He wasn't repeating his grandfather's mistakes. He was absolutely certain of that now. Relief, unbearable sorrow, and disbelief fought in him. He might have asked his grandfather for his reasons, but that was for his personal comfort, and not for the purpose of peace. So it would have to wait. That was something for later. Once he had become a full Sith Lord and brought peace and stability to the galaxy at last. By then he might be ready to deal with the truth of his grandfather's shame. Finally the turbo lift doors opened. Jason ascended to the recreated Room of a Thousand Fountains to sit among the plants and pools to meditate. He knew what he had to do now. He knew he had to test Lumia to be sure she could help him achieve full Sith knowledge as she promised, or if she was following her own agenda and planning to exploit him. It should have been a terrifying thought, but a delicious sensation of complete stillness settled around him. He had found a precious piece of absolute truth, both about the universe and about himself. Crossing his legs in a meditation position, he let his consciousness reach out across the force, not as an open hand, but as a commanding fist. Lumia! Come here, Lumia! Come to Coruscant, and dance her to me! Corellian Sanctuary, Coruscant It was one of the saddest places that Ben had ever visited. He felt the loneliness the moment he got within fifty meters of the Corellian Sanctuary. Outside, three men, one of them very old, were scrubbing away at bright red paint that had splashed and run down the polished gold and black marble inlay of the little domed memorial. They looked up at him as he approached, frowning and suspicious. Ben wasn't sure what to say. What do you want, kid? 
said the youngest man. I wanted to look inside, sir. Be polite, be humble. Jason had taught him that if you treated people kindly, they normally returned the favor. Is that okay? You a Jedi? The brown and beige robes were a giveaway. Yes. Why do you want to see inside? My uncle's Corellian. And it wasn't even a lie. He was genuinely as curious about Corellians as he was determined to complete the task that Jason had given him. May I go inside? The men looked at him, then at each other. I'll take him, said the old man. Ben hesitated on the threshold. The doors of the arched entrance looked as if they'd been forced open. He followed the man into darkness, and when his eyes adjusted, he was in a black-walled chamber that swallowed up the light. Then he looked up. The domed ceiling was studded with sparkling chunks of rough diamond set in constellations. They compressed the carbon left from cremations, said the old man, turned it into diamonds. That's the night sky as you'd see it from Corellia. Why? Corellians who couldn't get home during the New Republic. The old man kicked through rubble on the floor of the chamber. Some chunks bore black paint, signs of how the vandals had hacked at the plaster. Next best thing to resting in home soil. Did you find all the stones they took out? asked Ben. No. Who'd want to steal diamonds made from bodies? The old man frowned at him. Some people don't care about that kind of thing. The man was hurt and angry. Ben could understand that. He bent down and helped him pick up the rubble, checking each chunk for fragments of diamond, because that was, after all, a person. While they cleared the chamber, one of the younger men wandered in and stood watching. He was about eighteen, with short blonde hair scrunched into spikes. "'We can't stand by and let them get away with us,' he said. "'Who's them?' said Ben. "'Corasanti. "'You know who did this?' Ben sensed an echo of half-hearted malice from the chamber. No real plans or hatred or intention to outrage. He finally understood what Jason meant by mindless violence. Some people really did seem to do it without thinking very much. Then you ought to tell CSF. Yeah, likely they'd really take that seriously. I don't think. Not when they're looking for Corellians who planted a bomb. Ben went to sweep up the remaining dust, but the old man took the broom from him and did it himself. Ben sensed some resentment. He bowed his head, even though the man had turned his back on him, and walked outside into daylight that seemed painfully bright. The blond man went with him, and they sat down on the honey-colored marble steps that led up to the sanctuary. "'I'm Barrett Sai," said the blond man, and held out his hand. Ben shook it gravely. I'm Ben. So you've got Corellian relatives? Yeah. Whose side are you on? I'm a Jedi. We don't take sides. You reckon? Barrett laughed, but not as if he thought it was remotely funny. Everyone's going to be taking sides soon. What with this government trying to force its rules on everybody? I hate them. My granddad says it's like the Empire all over again. You live here, though. I was born here. So was my dad. My folks own an engineering workshop in Q-65. Never even been to Corellia yet. But you could live on Corellia if you hated here so much. Would that stop them treating us the way they do? Ben was finding it hard to understand the them and the us of the conversation. He'd traveled the galaxy with his parents. He'd seen less of Coruscant than he had of a dozen other worlds. But Barrett wasn't just visibly angry. There was also a real sense of pent-up danger about him. Ben hadn't realized just what an emotional thing the sanctuary was for Corellians living here. Ben probed cautiously. They said on the news that the bomb went off in the room of a Corellian man over here on business. They would say that, wouldn't they? 
Barrett had his elbows braced on his knees, right hand clutching his left wrist, looking around at pedestrians walking along the nearby promenade. I bet they did it themselves. Who's they? The government. CSF. Galactic Security. They do that kind of spy stuff. If they plant a bomb and blame it on us, then it gives them an excuse to attack Corellia. Ben thought of what he had done only a few weeks earlier. He'd sabotaged Centerpoint Station, Corellia's military pride and joy. And here he was, sitting with a Corellian who thought the Galactic Alliance played dirty tricks, and who treated him like a fellow Corellian. Ben felt a little thrill, the kind that came from having a secret identity, and then he felt pretty bad about it all. But he'd d done what he had to do, hadn't he? What do other Corellians here think? Barrett shrugged. There's a lot of us. And enough don't want to be dictated to by the Galactic Alliance. Ben took that to mean that there would be a war after all, just as Jason had warned, and just as Ben had felt when he sensed the anxiety in the Force. So you'll be going back to Corellia to join the armed forces, then? Barrett lowered his voice. Why do that? when we can fight better here. Ben thought about that for a moment. Adults often said things to him that they really shouldn't, seeming to think that he was too young to understand. Sometimes he was, though he always remembered what was said to him. But he wasn't too young to understand Barrett. It's just talk. We all say stupid things when we're angry. Even so... He would remember it. Chapter 5 My fees, 500,000 credits each for Han Solo and his son. If you want the Solo women folk and the Skywalkers too, that'll be extra. I remember the Solo kids, but I don't think they'll recognize me again. Aelin Habur, a.k.a. Aelin Val, Bounty Hunter, to an intermediary for Thracken Sal Solo. Municipal Port, Lower Coronet, Corellium. Han Solo had a smuggler's fine-tuned sense for avoiding trouble, but he was a little out of practice after years of respectability, and there was definitely a different skill needed to evade detection in a city in peacetime. He made his way to the Millennium Falcon under cover of darkness to check on the hyperdrive. It still needed work. The distance from the rented apartment to the municipal landing strip was two kilometers. The Falcon nestled among a motley array of vessels, making what should have been an easily recognizable ship just one dented, scraped crate among scores of freighters, modified fighters, speeders, taxis, landing craft, and any number of heavily modified, shabby, and unidentifiable craft. Corellians were eclectic in their choice of transport, so one more vintage ship in a dubious state of repair wasn't going to draw much attention. In fact, the Falcon wasn't even the only ship of her class parked on the apron. There were, as far as Han could see, at least three others. He ambled around the starboard side, pressed the security pad in his pocket, and lowered the ramp to board her. Once in the cockpit, he switched her to tick over, and the array of status lights and readouts flickered into life. This was home. It had been for as long as he could remember. This was where he had spent some of the most important moments of his life, where he had spent time with friends like Chewbacca, where he had found out who he really was. Permacrete and mortar meant nothing to him. The Falcon was more than home. She was family, too, and all the people he had ever loved had passed through her sooner or later. He patted the console bulkhead lovingly. Hi, baby, he said. How are you doing? Let's make you all better. The hyperdrive was still off balance. The coils and injectors needed a little more care spent on them to make sure that they released exactly the right amount of energy into the drive at the proper rate. 
Some of the repairs were simple mechanical stuff, like finding the correct gauge of durasteel for the bolts on the housing, and the shafts that created the fields. However advanced the propulsion system, it still came down to a point where huge forces created by energy had to be transferred to the good old-fashioned durasteel and alloy parts that held the drive and the hull together. Small vibrations became magnified. Eventually, they smashed whole ships. Han checked the automated system that sent sound waves through the hull to check for stress microfractures in the casing and airframe. There it was, stressing around the drive housing. He needed to replace brackets and bolts before he could risk taking the Falcon to full speed. He grabbed some tools and eased himself into the drive access space headfirst to see for himself. There was a certain comfort in getting his hands dirty and seeing problems as chunks of metal that could be fixed. Okay, how do I fix Thracken? In theory, it was easy. Find out where he was at a given time and how to get him, take a shot, and run. But it wasn't that simple in reality. That was why men like Fett made their fortunes doing it. And if I fix Thracken, will there be another of his minions to take his place? Are we always going to be running? No, it was just Thracken. It was personal like it always had been. And nobody else could hate you quite as thoroughly and efficiently as your own kin. Han tested the torque on the housing bolts with a hydro spanner and noted the illuminated display on the handle. There was a little play in the bolts, not enough for flesh and blood to detect, but discernible by sensitive equipment. If he needed to make a run for it in the Falcon right now, it would be a much slower one if he didn't want the airframe to shake itself apart. Ah, oh, baby, I've neglected you. He set the spanner to extract the bolts one by one, let them fall into his hand, and patted them out with a makeshift pin of soft alloy before screwing them back in. That would cut down on the movement until he could find the right spares. I promise I won't let you get into this state ever again. Touching, said a voice above him. And he jerked into a ball instinctively, knees tight to his chest, as the flare of blaster fire hit the deck a hand span away from where he'd been lying. He rolled under the housing and reached for his holdout blaster. Another bolt sizzled on the bulkhead to one side of him. He smelled singed paint and dozone. He was right under the housing now, too far under for whoever it was to get a clear shot at him unless they got down flat on the deck and fired at floor level. Well, it wasn't fat, that was for sure. He'd have been dead by now if it had been. Han rolled over onto his belly with one elbow braced on the deck of the compartment to propel himself on the smooth surface and his blaster in his other hand. It was hard to see at this angle, but he spotted movement and knew he was looking at boots. Come on out, Solo, said the voice. It was a man, probably young. He didn't identify himself. So he wasn't Corsac. Chancer. Not for a bit of glory, a reward. Thought nobody would spot your shemp, did you? Han held his breath, keeping an eye on the play of light that told him someone was creeping back and forth in front of the drive housing. He was trapped under a hunk of metal with only one way out. That was toward his attacker. Fine. He could do that, too. It only made him mad, mad that he hadn't set the intruder alert again, and even madder that someone was on his ship. It was the ultimate insult. Lying flat under the housing, he had a 150-degree arc in front of him. He flicked the blaster to the continuous fire setting with his thumb and braced his forearm on the deck. There was blood on the back of his hand. He must have scraped himself on something sharp. He hadn't felt a thing. What if this guy had a gang backing him up? Come and get me, kid. Boots moved again. Yes, stuck. Han swung a stream of fire left to right just to make sure he hit something. There was a loud shriek of surprised pain. And your dancing days are over. 
Someone thudded onto the deck with a grunt of pain, and blaster fire hit something, because Han saw the flash and smelled the burn. But he hadn't killed anyone, and that meant he was still pinned down under the drive housing. He was working out just how fast he could get out from under the housing, and realizing it wouldn't be a fast exit at all, when he heard a startled, uh, and a distinctive and very welcome sound. Vzzzm! A lightsaber cut an arc through the air once, twice, three times. Then there was silence. He waited breathless. You can come on out now, old man. The voice was Leia's. Han detected a slight edge to it. I've cleared up the mess for you. Thanks. Ever seen a Bothan well spider? Leia peered through the gap on all fours. They fight like you. They fire strands of caustic silk out of their burrows at predators. I couldn't help but be reminded. That and the gangly legs. Han eased himself out of the drive housing space, realizing for the first time how many bruises and scrapes he'd have in the morning. It was one thing, thinking you were as fit and fast as you ever were, but healing wasn't quite so quick at sixty as it was at twenty. You think you're funny, Princess, but you're not. You're welcome. I thought I'd keep an eye on you. Because you sense danger? That. And I know how you shut the whole world out when you're thinking about this ship. Yeah. Love's blind. Han dragged himself out, catching his scalp on something and cursing. When he straightened up, Leia was standing over what Han could only describe as a dead guy. He was in civilian clothes and looked about thirty. He wouldn't be seeing thirty-one, that was for sure. Leia held the lightsaber hilt in one hand, visibly jumpy. She tossed her head, as if the novelty of having shoulder-length hair instead of a braid, almost to her waist, was taking some getting used to. Suits you, said Han. Feels weird, like my whole head's lighter. They say really long hair is aging for mature women, anyway. You looking for trouble, nerf herder? Like we don't have enough? I think we'd better disappear right now. What about the body? Dump it out the airlock when we're clear. When did a nice girl like you learn to do things like that? You taught me. Nice to know I have my uses. Han secured the drive housing cover plate, and they headed for the cockpit. It was like old times again, but old times he really didn't want to keep reliving. Where to? said Leia. Coruscant, Han said, for spare parts. And nobody on our tail there, not trying to kill us anyway. Luke can read me the ride act instead. At least the droids and the Nogri will be happy to have us back. Han fired up the Falcon's drive and hoped for the best. I was planning on coming back once I've fixed the drive. That's smart, said Leia. She fell into the role of co-pilot automatically now. It was almost like having Chewy, Almost. But that was a space not even Leia could fill. Is this some macho thing? There's a time when a man's got to stop running and all that guff. I'm going to be ready for Thracken when the time comes. Leia said nothing. The Falcon lifted clear, and Han laid in a course for Coruscant, ready to risk a jump to maximum velocity if Corallian traffic control had the same idea as the would-be assassin now cooling rapidly in the engineering space below. But the vessel slipped through the shipping lanes and out to the jump point with no more than a routine automated transponder exchange. I shouldn't have asked how that guy found us, said Han. Leia didn't even raise an eyebrow. I'll remember to leave you a moment for questions next time I stop someone trying to kill you. Han took the Falcon as close to maximum speed as he dared. They spent the three hours it took to cover the 20,000 light years to Coruscant, watching readouts and indicators, hoping the drive would hold together. By the time they reached Coruscant space, the Falcon had developed an uncharacteristic vibration that made her frame feel as if it were rolling on a sea every few seconds with an unnatural regularity. 
Leia leaned forward in her seat and checked drive temperatures and profiles with visible anxiety. You sure she's going to land in one piece? Han shrugged, knowing that wouldn't fool her one bit. No, but trust me. He picked up the Galactic City Beacon at 750,000 kilometers and laid in a course to land at one of the public docking bays a long way from the center of the city. And unwelcome attention. What would they do if they knew who he was? Nothing. This was civilized space where he might be asked some awkward questions about his Corellian sympathies if anyone knew he had flown that mission with Wedge. But they didn't and so he could drop in openly as Solo, Captain H, any time he liked. If they did know he'd fought against the Galactic Alliance, they might just invite him in for a few questions, and a tangled game with lawyers would follow. This was Coruscant, a planet run by law and conventions. People didn't disappear here, except in the criminal underworld. But Han was cautious enough to stay with the anonymized transponder that identified the Falcon this time as a Tatooine freighter. There was a time when a visual check or a thermal signature would have betrayed her as a fighting ship, but she was old, and any number of eccentric traders flew modified fleet surplus warships these days. They had nice big cargo holds and handy defensive armament which was just what was needed in some of the wilder parts of the galactic business community. The console computer chatted silently with Galactic City ATC, swapping messages that blurred into streaks of illuminated text and symbols. The screen settled on a comforting message designed for human eyes. Clear to dock at birth BW9842. Time window... 12.45 to 15.45. Okay, prep for docking, said Han. You never say that. I never thought the drive might land without the rest of the ship before. Leia watched the console with a slight frown, white and green lights from the instruments reflecting on her face. Han found he was studying her for signs of dismay, as if her confidence alone would make for a safe landing. The Falcon was vibrating noticeably now. Nothing spectacular, but a regular, barely perceptible movement, like a missing heartbeat every five seconds or so, with a slight murmur of moving parts that a pilot would hear only if he knew the ship as well as he knew his own body. And Han knew the Falcon that well. So did Leia. She glanced at him and winked. It'll be fine. Dropping to sublight. Sublight, said Leia, confirming the helm order. The Falcon murmured again. Han found his knuckles straining white under the skin of his right hand as he clutched the yoke. The more tightly he held it, the more the vibration felt magnified into something to worry about. Engaging maneuvering drive. The drive kicked in with its own distinctive hums and resonance. Come on, baby. Just a regular landing. You've done a million of them. Stay in one piece. Distance, 500,000 kilometers. Adjusting angle of approach. Make 24 degrees. Correcting to 24. Holding steady. The navigation display showed a neat grid of lines and numbers with the icon that represented the Falcon aligned on the course that represented a safe approach to the Galactic City landing strip. A rhythmic shiver intruded into the familiar layers of sound and vibration that Han knew without even thinking about it as normal. Don't say it, Leia said sharply. Don't say what? That you've got a bad feeling. Never crossed my mind, Han lied. Crossed mine. Leia didn't even look up from the control console. Because I've got one, too. Plaza of the Core Coruscant. Lumia was coming. She had answered Jason's summons. She was heading for Coruscant without argument or fear. And he could feel her.
He found he could track her, and her emotions almost as if he could see her. Ben sat beside him, unusually quiet, hands in his lap. He had taken to wearing a very small braid in his red hair, hardly long enough to plait, and tied awkwardly with a scrap of brown thread, but Jason could see it. The boy had his shoulders hunched up a little as if he was trying to hide it. Bad hair day? Jason commented. He found more to like and admire about Ben every day. The boy had growth spurts emotionally as well as physically, and the last few weeks seemed to have literally made a man of him. But Jason wanted him to keep his sense of humor. He'd need it in the years to come. I, er, thought I ought to grow it. Ben's blush almost matched his hair. Does it look stupid? Not at all, but you're not technically an apprentice, so you don't have to wear it if you don't want to. I want to. Fine. Good. Who are we waiting for? I hate fooling him, but it has to be done. A woman is going to do some research for us. Military threat analysis. He took one more risky step, but Lumia's old name was a common one, unlikely to draw any attention and it ruled out slips of the tongue. Her name's Shira. You might see her around from time to time. But we could get analysis from the Security and Intelligence Council. I like to have an independent view as well. You can never have too much information. Jason gave Ben a playful nudge. It helped him bury the shock that kept resurfacing after seeing his grandfather commit an atrocity. Talking of which, you haven't given me your threat analysis. Ben's eyes widened. He wanted to please. Of what, Jason? I'm waiting to hear your impressions of the locations you visited. I didn't get much from the bomb site. Not that the CSF would let me get too close, but the Corellian Sanctuary was, well, scary. Why? I talked to some Corellians cleaning up the place. They really seem to hate Coruscant. I don't get it. Coruscant has had rifts with Corellia before, but they hate us, and they live here. It's a cosmopolitan planet. Lots of worlds we might end up fighting have communities here. But, Jason, if they're talking about fighting us here, are they? Well, a guy a little older than me. Probably just... bravado. Ben's sudden lurch into sober manhood, unsteady as it was, touched Jason. It's always interesting to note what sparks wars. It's often something relatively small, but for some reason it just tips the situation into chaos. That's the real enemy, isn't it? said Ben. Chaos. Jason almost shivered. It was another perceptive, wise, beyond-age comment of the kind Ben was increasingly prone to. It might also have been the clarity of someone too young to have his thinking muddied and corrupted by convention. It was also almost a Sith sentiment. Ben would make a good apprentice, and for all the right reasons. His sense of duty was starting to become tangible. I reckon so, Jason said. The galaxy works best when things are certain. Jason kept an eye on the movement of citizens crossing the plaza. He knew Lumia wouldn't be so crass as to turn up in her exotic, triangular headdress and trailing a light whip. He could feel her coming, and it was almost a game to spot her by eyesight alone. He hadn't warned her that he'd have Ben with him. He wanted to see how she reacted to Ben, and also how Ben reacted to her. Ben still couldn't recall what had happened out at Bimeo, although he'd stopped asking now. About a hundred meters away, Jason caught sight of a middle-aged woman in a neat red business suit, plain tunic and pants, that was so dark it verged on black. She had a matching scarf wrapped around her head that covered her entire face. Her eyes were obscured by a gauzy inset of some translucent silk. It was a practical fashion common on arid, dusty worlds, and it seemed to be catching on in the capital, too. He knew it was Lumia. 
He magnified his presence in the forest to get her attention, and she changed direction slightly as if she had spotted him like anyone else might. The closer she came, the stronger the sense he had of a Sith making a conscious effort to conceal her presence in the force, and almost succeeding. Is that her? Ben asked. Lumia was close enough now for it to be obvious that she had seen Jason, and was walking straight toward him. She must also have seen Ben, but she didn't react at any level. She stopped right in front of Jason, holding a black folio case in front of her with both hands almost like a shield. She had a soft, shapeless black bag over one shoulder. He suspected he knew what was in it. Master Solo, she said. Nice touch. And even her voice was different. I'm not a master, but thank you, Shira. He turned deliberately to Ben. This is my apprentice, Ben Skywalker. In an unofficial sense, of course. I'm sure I've seen you before, said Ben. He sounded genuinely baffled, but there was no hint in his emotions that he recognized her as Brisha, the woman he had taken a dislike to at Bimeo. Nice to meet you, ma'am. You might have seen me around the university, said Lumia. I'm only thirteen, said Ben. Really? Oh, perhaps not then. She proffered her folio to Jason, suddenly a very convincing academic. I have assessed the current military capacities of Corellia and worlds most likely to support it. Would you like me to go through the reports with you? Good actress. Lumia's skill at creating illusions extended into the physical world as well. I thought we might go to the Jedi Temple, said Jason. Temptation and threat in one package for a Sith. There are quiet areas where we can talk. Ben, do you want to come too? Jason expected him to insist on coming. He was desperately anxious to learn, even if that meant sitting through meetings that even adults found boring. But Ben dropped his chin slightly, as if about to admit something. Is it okay if I visit Fleet Ops? Admiral Neothel said I could. Jason hadn't expected that. Of course. Ben took his leave of them with a grave bow of the head and walked off across the plaza, every centimeter the young man. Luke's son is growing up fast, said Lumia, lifting her veil clear of her eyes. Don't worry. He doesn't recognize you. Why have you brought me here? I wanted to discuss what we began to explore back in your home. You've thought about it a great deal. I felt that. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Jason got up and beckoned her to follow. He didn't like being a stationary target. There was little, if anything, that could present a serious threat to him now, but old habits died hard. I've thought of little else. Have you decided to let me help you achieve your destiny? Yes. She searched his face, turning her head a little as she walked. He could only see her eyes, vivid, green, somehow permanently angry. But he felt her try quite deliberately to touch his mind. I'm at your disposal, she said quietly. You've never been in the Jedi Temple, have you? No. It'll be interesting. You can suppress your dark energy, I hope. Is that what you're testing, Jason? I need to know how safe it is to have you near me, he said. There's no better way to see if you'll be detected than to test if you can pass through the Jedi Temple unnoticed. He thought she smiled. There was some movement of the fine, oddly unlined skin around her eyes, and it unsettled him. I managed to infiltrate the Rebellion. You weren't Sith, then. I've hidden for decades. She replaced the veil. I can hide indefinitely, anywhere. This was arcane mysticism on a scale that only a handful of people in the galaxy had ever needed to consider. And yet Jason found himself hailing an air taxi and getting into it with a Sith master, as mundane and everyday an act as he could imagine. He savored the incongruity of it. They didn't speak at all on the way to the temple. 
For a moment, Jason almost saw the funny side of it. Taxi pilots being what they were, he could almost imagine this one. A weak way, telling his other passengers, Yeah, I had one of them Siths in my taxi once. But the pilot would never know. What if she's using me? Who'll teach me the Sith way if I have to... Jason caught himself thinking that he might have to remove her if she proved to be bent on vengeance against the Jedi, or one Jedi in particular. He knew exactly what he meant by remove, and he was once again surprised by the ease with which he took one small step further toward doing things he had been raised to regard as evil. Sat us down here, please, pilot. Lumia walked beside him up the promenade leading to the temple, and it felt as if she had cloaked herself completely. He could sense her unease, but any hint of darkness had been reduced to no more than the simmering passions found in any ordinary untrained human being. She passed through the huge doors of the imposing entrance and reacted just as any ordinary person with no force sensitivity would. She stopped in her tracks and stared. If she hadn't been wearing a full veil across her face, Jason thought she might well have been gaping, too. It's quite an exercise in material magnificence, isn't it? he said. A statement of power, Lumia responded, wonderfully ambiguous. Let's see how much temptation you can stand. He led her through the few areas where non-Jedi were permitted and nobody stopped him. He was Jason Solo, and no one would challenge his right to invite a mundane guest. That much took no force techniques to achieve, because a confident air of purpose often opened more doors than an ID pass. He took her into the Room of a Thousand Fountains. If anything would force her to show her true intentions, even a glimmer of a drive for revenge, it was proximity to a place of meditation, and he would spot it. There was one more test beyond that, but he had to work toward it a little more carefully, and that was to put Lumia within striking distance of Luke Skywalker. There was nothing like seeing an old love who was also an old enemy to unlock someone's true emotions. They walked in the vast greenhouse of exotic plants that had been collected from across the galaxy. Lumia still exuded curiosity and a little surprise. There were only a few Jedi meditating there, but Jason found a convenient bench between two Asari trees, whose branches swayed gently despite the absence of any wind. Water rushed over a huge granite boulder and tumbled into a stream that disappeared under a cover of Bonsgrek bushes. I'd prefer you to stay on Coruscant, said Jason. If that's what you want, I'll arrange a safe house for you. This wasn't the place to carry on a conversation in any detail, and I'll want to discuss what my further instruction might consist of. Speed will be important, Lumia said. Oh, I know how fast events are moving. Why? I feel what you can feel. That we're on the brink of another war, and there are some wars from which people might never recover. I don't think there's ever been a time in our recorded history when there wasn't a war going on somewhere. All the more reason for changing the future, then. Jason took her around as much of the rest of the temple as he could access with a visitor. But no Jedi reacted to her. She didn't betray a single emotion that indicated any agenda beyond what she claimed she had, to help him fulfill his destiny as the Supreme Sith Lord. He checked his chrono. A wild idea occurred to him, and he was getting used to listening to those as suggestions from the Force. The scheduled High Council meeting would be ending soon. All his study in a hundred different ways of harnessing the Force had come to a single point of fruition now. The only gaps in his knowledge of the Force were those of the Sith. Sith techniques are just another weapon. And they weren't inherently good or evil. They just existed, like a blaster, and you could just as easily use a blaster to murder as to defend. It all depended on who held it and who stood within its range. 
That much he knew. All right, how do I change the future for the better? The next few weeks will determine what more you need to learn, said Lumia. Did you arrange for that bombing to happen? Lumia laughed, one of those little indignant snorts of disbelief. I don't need to create chaos, Jason, she said quietly. People are only too willing to do it for themselves. No, I had nothing to do with that. He checked his chrono again. Yes, he had to do it now. It was time for her final test of sincerity. Let's take a walk, he said. He led her through the corridors to the main lobby, through which the passages to the High Council chamber passed. Lumia should have been able to detect Luke's presence, but it was essential that Luke not detect hers. Jason concentrated on forming a forced illusion around her, not to make her appear as anyone else, but to simply erase her presence as a Sith, in case her own subterfuge wasn't powerful enough to deceive Luke. You're insane, he told himself. What if you're wrong? What if Luke can sense her? Who's going to help you attain full Sith knowledge if Lumia is killed or imprisoned? Jason had thought of this test of Lumia's intentions, and so it was meant to be. He had to get used to that. He had to trust his reactions, not as impulses to be doubted, but as decisions. Steady. Trust yourself. Jason cloaked Lumia in a force illusion and projected his own unconcerned calm as Luke approached. It was an exhausting maneuver, nothing beyond him when dealing with ordinary people, but something that took all his strength when deceiving a Jedi master of Luke's stature. Luke strode toward them and glanced back over his shoulder a couple of times as if someone were following him. He acknowledged Jason stiffly and paid Lumia no more than polite attention, as if his mind was more on what was down the corridor. Jason strained to hold the Force illusion steady, like a ball of heat within his chest that he had to balance to keep it from touching his ribcage. That was exactly how it felt. And Lumia. Lumia, somehow nestled in miniature within that ball of heat, felt not vengeful or trying to disguise her intentions, but genuinely worried about being discovered before her work was complete. Luke seemed baffled. Suddenly, Jason realized that it wasn't anything in the office at the end of the corridor that was distracting Luke. He could sense something amiss and wasn't sure where it was coming from. Luke was sensing Lumia, but very faintly. Jason knew it. Good morning, Uncle. Hello, Jason. Luke's gaze rested briefly on Lumia, but he concentrated on Jason. Morning, ma'am. Where's Ben? Admiral Neothel is showing him around the fleet ops center. Jason knew Luke was in a hurry to see Omus, the way he always was after a council meeting. Have you time for a calf? Luke shook his head, as Jason expected. Sorry, perhaps later. He was making an effort to disguise his uneasiness with Jason in front of a stranger. He nodded politely at Lumia, and then glanced briefly behind him again. Ma'am? They watched him go. Eventually, Lumia let out a breath. You didn't have to do that. Jason kept the forest cover in place. I think I did. My issues with Luke Skywalker are long over, Jason. Really? Yes. If I wanted to get to him, I wouldn't need you as a root. Please understand what's at stake here. This is beyond our own little personal grievances. She picked up her folio case. I should go now. He felt a surge of real anger in her. He believed her. Events were unfolding as they were because it was his destiny. He grew more accepting of it by the hour. I'll see you out, he said. They walked back through the main entrance and paused halfway down the promenade to look back at the temple. So how does it feel to have walked in your enemy's camp? I don't see Jedi as the enemy now, said Lumia. That's far too simplistic. What then? There are people with only half the picture who believe they have all the facts. It makes their decisions flawed. It's hard to want to see the rest of that picture. You already do. 
He watched Lumia walk away toward the taxi pad until he could no longer see her, only sense her. He was so engrossed in exploring the ripples she left in the force and searching them for signs that he was startled by what touched his mind then, almost as if someone had tapped him on the shoulder. He felt his mother. She was in trouble. His future as a Sith Lord was very easy to lay aside for a moment while he reached out to find her. Corellian Quarter, Galactic City, Coruscant I should have told Jason where I was going. Ben hadn't exactly lied to Jason. He really had visited the Fleet Command Center, and Admiral Neothel really had showed him around the ops rooms. It just hadn't taken as long as he had expected. And now he was still desperately curious about the Corellians who lived on Coruscant, and who were now quite possibly what Neothel called the Enemy Within. Ben was having trouble working out what was truly Coruscanti on a world of a thousand species. But they were at war with other humans. What was them? What was us? How could Coruscant be both a separate world and the embodiment of the galaxy? All of it. Maybe that was the problem. Ben found himself in one of the Corellian neighborhoods near the heart of Galactic City wandering along the catwalks among shops and homes and businesses. He was looking for an engineering workshop called Size, owned by Barrett's family. This looked like any other neighborhood. The names on the stores didn't look any different from those on the rest of Coruscant. The people looked like him. The more he saw of non-human species, the more Ben was intrigued by the ease with which beings could fight among themselves. It was as if the small differences mattered more than the really big ones, like you had to recognize something before you could hate it properly. No wonder Jason wanted to bring a bit of order to the galaxy. Jedi weren't exactly invisible, but there was something about wearing a brown robe that gave you a Certain neutrality, as Jason called it. Ben ambled along the catwalks, taking in the detail, and although people glanced at him with vague curiosity, nobody bothered him. Maybe they're seeing a kid and not a Jedi. Ben was passing in front of a small grocery store when he heard the distinctive thrum of a large vessel behind him. He looked back to see a Coruscant Security Force assault ship the kind the police used for patrols, making slow progress down the sky lane with its side hatches open. Maybe the officers were looking for someone. But then he heard a booming voice from the vessel's public address system. Do not use your water supply. The vessel was almost level with him now, and the disembodied voice filled the narrow sky lane, reverberating off the walls of buildings. I repeat... Contamination has been found in the water supply, and as a precaution, all water has been cut off. Do not use your supply, because water standing in the pipes may be contaminated. Please listen to your news station for updates. The ship passed, repeating its emergency message as it advanced, and Ben saw four blue-uniformed CSF officers standing inside the crew bay one with a voice projector clutched in his hand. Contaminated with what? said Ben. But he was talking to himself. People had come out of their homes and businesses to stand on the walkway and stare after the assault ship. One woman came out of a tap calf with a hollow news receiver and set it on one of the tables outside, and customers crowded around. Ben paused to watch. The news channel was running a live report from someone at one of the water company's pumping stations. Problems with utilities were rare on Coruscant, but it still seemed to Ben like a lot of fuss for a routine problem. Then he heard the reporter use the word sabotage. What's he saying? Ben asked, trying to peer between the customers for a better look. Someone put toxic chemicals in the water supply, said the tap calf woman. They've had to shut down ten pumping stations, and that means half of Central Galactic City hasn't got any water. She slapped a cleaning cloth down on the table, clearly angry. 
which means I have to shut the calf until they sort it out. If it's sabotage, you know who'll get the blame, said a man clutching a small boy by the hand. Us. Could be anybody. Disgruntled water employee, the tap calf woman muttered. Maybe the water company screwed up and put the wrong chemical into the treatment plant, said another customer. And maybe it is us, because the government was asking for it. The debate raged. Ben interrupted. Who's us? he asked. Identity was beginning to concern him. Why would anyone living here want to poison their own water supply? The group turned away from the hollow screen for a moment as if they'd just noticed Ben, and the tap-calf woman gave him a sympathetic look. People do stupid things when there's a war on, she said. Don't they teach you that at the academy? But there is no war, said Ben, and didn't admit he'd never been to any academy. He knew what a war was. War had to be declared. Politicians had to get involved. Not yet. Well, there is now. The man picked up his son in his arms and began walking away. Whether we want one or not. Ben leaned over the edge of the safety rail on the walkway to see what was happening on the levels above and below him. People had done exactly what the tap-calf customers had. They gathered outside their shops and homes, talking and arguing. He could hear voices carrying. Traffic had slowed to a crawl. The police public address system boomed in the distance. Jason? Ben spoke quietly into his comm link. But Jason wasn't receiving. The message service clicked in. Jason, I'm in the Corellian quarter and... He searched for the words, but there was no point alarming Jason. I'm heading home. Ben's sense of danger was becoming acute now. There was anger and violence building up exactly like the pressure before a thunderstorm. He could feel it pressing on his temples, making his sinuses ache, telling him to get away, run, hide at an instinctive level. He hoped he'd learn to read it better one day. Right now it was uncontrolled and animal. He ran back the way he had come, two hundred meters to the nearest taxi platform. An air taxi was sitting on its repulsors, hovering silently over a dark pool of shadow. The pilot, a thin-faced human with a shaved head, glanced up from his holozine and opened the hatch. Senate District, please, said Ben. Where exactly? Rotunda Zone. Nah. I'm avoiding the center. The pilot looked at Ben as if he'd just arrived from Tatooine. There's a riot going on over the water contamination. Should you be out on your own, lad? Ben was beginning to wonder the same thing himself. How close can you take me to the zone, then? The pilot sucked his teeth thoughtfully. The intersection of sky lanes 4, 7, 2, and 23. Two blocks away. Will that do? Okay. Ben sat in the back seat of the taxi, with one hand on the hilt of his lightsaber, fidgeting. He hadn't been worried when he'd infiltrated Center Point Station. That had been exciting in an unthinking, reflex kind of way, even though he stood a good chance of getting killed. It seemed impossible that anything could happen to him. But now he was among crowds that seemed ready to explode into violence. And although he was home in Galactic City, he was scared. There was something animal about it all, something wild and unpredictable. The taxi slowed and pulled in at a landing platform. Ben could see police speeders ahead at the intersection of the two sky lanes, diverting traffic the hard way. A CSF assault ship swept overhead as he stepped out onto the walkway, and his instinct was to follow its path. So what are you going to do when you get there? It was a good question. But instead of answering it rationally, Ben just headed for where his force senses told him he was needed. Jason always encouraged him to trust his feelings, and this was as good a time as any. He raced down the walkway in the opposite direction from the rest of the pedestrians, who were doing the sensible thing and moving away from the riot area. When he rounded the corner, he found himself at the back of a mob facing the Corellian embassy. The building was under siege. 
There was no other way to describe the barrage of missiles smashing against the permaglass front of the building and piling up in its marble forecourt. The embassy was in a plaza, not on a broad sky lane with a thousand-meter drop beneath, making it an easy, close target for anyone hurling missiles. The CSF assault ship hovered overhead. Ben could see officers taking aim with rifles and then lowering them again. Nobody on the ground seemed to have drawn weapons yet, but the crowd was screaming abuse. You scum! You poisoned the water! Ben dodged a lump of masonry that cleared the heads of the mob in front of him and landed at his feet, sending fragments flying. They should have pulverized your whole planet, not just stinking center point. The crowd roared and surged forward before falling back again, nearly knocking Ben flat. He was responsible for what was happening. He'd started this with the raid on center point. The falling sensation in the pit of his stomach stopped him in his tracks. He'd never seen people behave like this. But it was all his fault. He had to do something. Another volley of permacrete shattered on the marble forecourt of the embassy, and CSF officers piled into the crowd with riot batons. But the more they tried to break it up, the more people seemed to press forward. The riot had a life of its own. Ben tasted a communal reflex rage, and it scared him more than anything he had ever experienced. For a split second, he almost pitched in, too, his body very nearly overriding his brain. In front of the embassy, a dozen Corellians, Ben assumed that was who they were, braved the hail of permacrete and snatched the lumps up to hurl them back over the heads of the CSF line. One of the men had a blood-smeared gash across his forehead, but he seemed oblivious to it. A CSF captain moved forward with a squad of officers, and Ben heard the Corellian tell him that they were supposed to be protected here. They were supposed to be safe. And then there was a volley of shots from above, like projectile weapons firing, and the air filled with acrid smoke. It burned Ben's eyes and mouth. Dispersal gas. The CSF must have fired canisters from the assault ship hovering overhead. The crowd should have scattered, but instead people seemed to close in on one another, and Ben was caught up in the panic. He fell. He was being trampled. Legs filled his field of vision, and just as he curled instinctively to shield his head, a gloved blue arm reached out and grabbed him by the front of his tunic, pulling him free. Stupid kid! It was a CSF officer. The man had rescued him. Ben struggled to his knees, eyes streaming. Come on, get out of here! Ben's attention snapped suddenly from his own predicament to a point behind the officer. He focused on a face he knew, a boy with short blonde hair. Barrett Tsai. And Ben was staring at a blaster aimed not at him, but at the officer's back. He didn't think. He just pulled out his lightsaber with his free hand and saw the bright blue blade collide with a stream of white energy, deflecting it. It took a second, and when he blinked again to clear his streaming eyes, he saw Barrett disappearing into the melee. The police officer stared at his lightsaber for a moment, one hand on his own blaster. It was a rock, Ben lied. Someone threw something at you. The officer pulled him to his feet. His face was streaked with gas-induced tears, too. He hadn't put on his respirator in time. You're fast, kid. Let's get you back to the temple, shall we? I'll call my master. He'll collect me. Jason wasn't a master, but the small detail of Jedi life wasn't important right then. Ben wanted to get away and follow Barrett. Thank you, officer. Thank you, Jedi. The officer wiped his nose on the back of his hand and coughed painfully. You saved me from a pounding, too. Ben knew he had saved someone from something, but it was more than a man's life. However little he understood of politics, he was sure that a Corellian shooting a CSF officer would turn a bad situation into a disastrous one. Barrett was in deep. Ben now felt a personal connection to the widening gulf between Corellian and Coruscanti, and sensed that Barrett would play a part in something awful. He wiped his face on the sleeve of his robe, nose streaming, and opened his comlink again. Jason? 
Can you hear me? There was just the usual quiet hiss of a link that wasn't being answered, and the click of the message recorder. Jason, something terrible is happening. Chapter 6 The bigger the galaxy, the sweeter the homecoming. Corellian Proverb Jedi Temple Precincts, Coruscant Ben was trying to contact him, but Jason had his own problems at that moment. He sensed they were more critical. His mother was in trouble. He felt her reach out to him. He felt both her fear and her determination, and the latter was winning. Where is she? What's happening? Jason slipped into an alcove flanked by bushes in square ceramic pots and sat down to concentrate. Eyes closed, he could sense where she was, and she wasn't on Coruscant, but very near. It took him a few moments to realize she might be in a vessel. Listen, listen. During his studies, Jason had mastered a Theron technique that let him use the Force to hear remotely. He slowed his breathing and felt the buzz in his sinuses as if he were being woken too soon from an exhausted sleep. The buzzing filled his head, and then behind it, within it, he could pick out words and sounds. He heard his mother's voice, and then he heard his father's. Try another breaking burn. Five seconds. Metal groaned. An engine boomed inside, a rhythmic rising and falling note, and it wasn't a reassuring sound. Jason reached out with one word, the most that even he could send through the force. Together. He visualized the Millennium Falcon. In his mind, he could see the plates of her underside and the transparent steel of the cockpit mounted on the starboard flank. He saw her as she should have been, whole and sound. He could feel Leia straining to use forced telekinesis, but he couldn't sense exactly where she was trying to apply it. He could only hear the tension in her voice and taste her growing anxiety. And he could feel another presence, too, his sister, Jaina. They hardly spoke these days, but twins could never cut themselves off from each other for long. She must have sensed their parents' crisis, too. Whatever his mother was trying to do, Jason could only guess, and guessing wasn't good enough when one was using the physical might of the Force. Still, in his Theron sound trance, he heard the bip, bip, bip of a sensor alarm, the kind that announced that a hull had been breached, or worse. Drive shaking loose, and it's going to take the plates with it. That was what he needed to know. He was certain now that his mother was using the Force to stop the cracks in the drive housing from spreading and ripping the Falcon apart as the ship re-entered the atmosphere. It was a massive task. She needed help. Jason filled his lungs with a long, slow breath and centered himself to try something he had never attempted before. Mom, I hope you can handle this. He pictured Leia sitting in the co-pilot's seat. Her emotions and her presence in the Force washed over him, and he visualized himself in her place, behind her eyes, seeing what she saw. For a moment he was simply observing, but then a feeling like a sigh drained out of him, and it was as if he were exhaling an infinite breath into his mother. No, through his mother. Now he was no longer sitting in the alcove between two topiary bushes, but staring at an array of lights and readouts, and at hands that weren't his. Beyond the console, Coruscant loomed in the viewport. If Jaina had joined the effort, she was hardly detectable. He had drowned out her presence in his own mind with the sheer strength of the telekinesis he was projecting. Take this, Mom. Use me. Use the force I'm channeling through you. He heard her say, Ugh, as if something had startled her. Then he could feel pressure in his lungs, as if he were running hard and fighting for breath. He had no idea how long it lasted, but he had the sense of clutching something tight to his chest, and an awareness somewhere outside his mind, and yet at its core, showed him the falcon enveloped in the force, the hull around her drive assembly compressed, instead of expanding catastrophically. He was sure he wasn't seeing what his mother was actually looking at, 
because he had none of the images of entering the atmosphere or landing. The scenes inside the Falcon's cockpit were being supplied by his memory. He was simultaneously aware of both of that rational fact and that his force power was being funneled through his mother, helping her hold the drive assembly in place by telekinesis. Then relief swept over him like a wave, making his scalp tingle and his heart pound. The Falcon was down safely. He knew it. Now he could open his eyes. When he did, he was almost surprised to find himself still in the grounds of the temple in broad daylight. Jason opened his comlink. He felt Jaina briefly, but his mind was on his parents. Mom? Mom, are you okay? Leia sounded breathless. So much for sneaking in discreetly. Everything's all right, isn't it? Jason could hear his father muttering in the background. I have to see you both. Stay where you are. I'm coming. Jedi seldom ran flat out in public, so Jason avoided an undignified sprint with robes flapping and limited himself to a slow jog to the nearest taxi platform instead. He was the new heir to the Sith legacy, and he had seen his grandfather behave in a way that had almost shattered his world. But at that moment, he was just a son who was more worried about his parents' welfare than the affairs of the galaxy. Attachment had its place. Jason let himself succumb to it and put aside his growing dispute with both his father and Jaina. But sooner or later, he knew that a permanent rift in the family was a price he might have to pay. Slave One Pre-flight panel check for Runadan. Boba Fett had rarely carried passengers, not live or voluntary ones anyway. The presence of this strange girl in his ship, which was more of a home than anything he owned made of stone and permacrete, bothered him, and yet he simply couldn't walk away from her. Myrta Gev had a piece of his past that mattered a lot when he was running out of future. You normally board ships with total strangers? asked Fent. Myrta slung her bag over one shoulder. Are you going to kill me? Nobody's paying you to. That's what I thought. She boarded Slave One via the cargo hatch and went to follow him through to the cockpit, but he turned to block her path and gestured aft. I don't like co-pilots. Stay put or I'll lock you in one of the cells. Myrta didn't show the slightest dissent. She just paused and looked around, then sat down on a crate that was secured to the port bulkhead. She opened her bag and rummaged in it before pulling out a chunk of something that she unwrapped and began gnawing. Fett stared at her. Dinner, she said. I always carry rations, just in case. Fett fought back a reflex. His instinct was to tell her she was a smart kid. Yeah, I don't do in-flight catering, he said, and swung through the hatch into the main section of the ship. The internal bulkhead shut behind him, because, smart kid or not, he wasn't taking any chances with her. He wasn't quite as agile as he'd been a year before. Just moving around in Slave One's awkward spaces was uncomfortable now. It wasn't pure pain, but he felt that before long it would be. Don't forget your dying, Fett. He settled into his seat and fired up the ship's drives. Checking the internal cam circuit that gave him a view of each of Slave One's compartments, he caught a shot of Myrta leaning back against the bulkhead, eyes closed, arms folded across her chest, apparently dozing. Nothing seemed to faze her. He approved of that. There were always women in the galaxy, and men come to that who reckoned they were tough, but seemed to think that was about a smart mouth and a fancy weapon. The truly tough ones, Fat thought, were the ones who could take anything in their stride and finish the job. Myrta Gav showed every sign of being genuinely, quietly tough. Fat didn't like anybody much, but he didn't dislike her, although the thaw didn't extend to having her sit up front with him. He laid in a course to Runadan. His stomach rumbled. 
Maybe he should have grabbed some of Bevin's coin crabs after all. He piled away the next few hours watching the stock prices from H&E, and wondered what he might say to Town Wee when he finally caught up with her. He had no doubt that he would. Fat dozed, reclining in his seat. When he slept, it was never deeply. The padded rim of his helmet was just soft enough to stop short of cutting into his neck, but too hard for complete comfort when he let it take the weight of his head. Sometimes he would drift in a few seconds of hazy disorientation, half awake, sounds magnified, able to see through a transparent barrier. He wasn't in the confines of his helmet, but somewhere else he didn't recognize. It was a recurring impression. Town Wee had once told him it was the legacy of being gestated in a glass tank like the other clones, and that they all had distant memories like that. It was a kinship of sorts. He found his mind wandering, thinking how they must have felt to know their days were numbered, just like his were now. And that was another kinship. I'm dying. Maybe dying feels like this. I ought to know by now. The navigation sensors woke him with an insistent, pulsing tone to warn him Slave One had dropped out of hyperspace and he snapped upright and alert. His joints hurt. He ignored the pain. In the view screen, the red-streaked crescent of Runadan grew larger until it was the entire sky. It was another heavily populated planet whose habitable zones were crammed with cities. But at least it wasn't as grim as Bonadin. Fat punched up the local data on his console and began his descent. Runadan still had a few green spaces and attractive buildings, and even a few wide rivers snaking through the northern hemisphere. It was the kind of place that was home to a mix of the highly educated scientists who developed products, the people whose task it was to make their lives more pleasant, and the majority who worked in the factories and laboratories that produced the goods that the elite invented. It was exactly the kind of place Town Wee might be, if she could take the sunlight. Kaminoans didn't like clear skies. Fat disguised Slave One's armaments with a sensor screen and prepared to land. If anything went wrong, he had the firepower of a small warship to get out of trouble. Turbo lasers, ion cannon, torpedoes, and concussion missiles. He'd added conventional armor-piercing detonite ordnance on the last refit, just in case he was ever low on power and stuck in a tight corner. Leaving things to chance was for amateurs. Banking over the capital city of Varlow, Fat thought Slave One should be his final resting place. He didn't want her left behind. He had a sudden vision of setting a course out of the galaxy in his final days and letting the ship carry him as far as she could on her fuel cells, and then drifting forever where nobody would follow. It was reassuring. Pack it in. You're not dead yet. But if that's not an admission that you haven't a clue what your life's been about, then I don't know what is. He picked up the automated air traffic control and sat down at the first spaceport he could find. Slave One settled gently on her landing struts, the dampers yielding as she sank half a meter, and then came to rest. The drive cooled, sending a characteristic decelerating ticking through the hull that eventually fell silent. Fat! He glanced up at the screen that gave him a complete view of the cargo bay. Myrta had stood up and was stretching her arms like an athlete, pulling one arm across her body then the other. Are you taking me with you? No. So you're just going to leave me locked in here while you go off? I wouldn't let anything happen to this ship. You're safe as long as she is. He set the intruder defenses and stood up to check his personal weapons. Runadan didn't have a no-weapons law like its sister planet Bonadin. But it was corporate sector, and so some restraint was called for. And don't mess with the controls back there. You won't like what happens if you do. 
He waited for an argument, but she just sat down again and started dismantling her blaster. He paused to watch. She was calibrating and cleaning it. The kid certainly took her weapons seriously. Most people just expected their hardware to work properly without maintenance, which was a good way to end up dead. Fett was impressed that she wasn't among them. He stepped out of the cockpit hatch and walked to the terminal building, checking data on the display that appeared in his visor as he walked. The planet was a research and development center. Somewhere there'd be a place where people whose job was to keep an eye on what companies did would gather to discuss business. Fat reasoned that it was a good place to start. And like all commercial planets with plenty of job openings, Runadan attracted a cosmopolitan population. A man in Mandalorian armor with a jet pack attracted almost as little attention as a Duros, but a lot less than the two blue-skinned Chiss who were wandering around the concourse in blue suits that matched their skin exactly. Fett took the opportunity to slip into one of the passport control lanes, and select his most benign identicard for presentation to the female official securing the barrier. The woman scanned the readout on the screen in front of her, then eyed his battle-scarred armor suspiciously. She didn't ask him to remove his helmet. What brings you here, Master Vet? There was a lot to be said for Mondoa, even if he didn't speak much of it. Looking for security work. What kind? Now that was helpful. Pharmaceuticals. Banks and personal protection got too rough. She looked at him warily as if trying to squint past the visor. I thought you Mandalorians were supposed to be hard cases. I'm not getting any younger. None of us are. She handed him back his bogus ID card. They're always hiring here. Industrial espionage is our national sport. She jerked her thumb over her shoulder. Head into town on the monorail, and you'll find the job agencies on the main route. And if you don't get hired in five days, you're out of here, okay? We don't like vagrants. So she had some knowledge of Mandalorians, but not of him. That was just the pure Mondoa form of fat. It was surprising how close you could skate to the truth without anyone noticing. He touched his glove to his helmet in what he hoped was a deferential gesture, and strode on. Most of the time, one of his tactics was being Boba Fett and not disguising the fact. When you had that kind of reputation, it did a lot of the work for you. Bounties found it was definitely smarter to surrender to him than to try to run, because there was nowhere to hide from Fett. But he felt a little discretion might get him closer to town we a lot faster. Time wasn't on his side. Sometimes, too, it amused him to play a man down on his luck, when he was actually one of the wealthiest individuals in the galaxy. But fortune wouldn't be worth a mott's backside if he didn't find a cure. So, when are you going to draw up a contingency plan? You never were much for long-term strategy. There'll come a point where you have to decide whether to go on looking for co-sized data or to prepare for death. So what are you going to do with all those credits? Boba Fett took the monorail into town with a dozen people who didn't have personal transport. They ranged from the obviously poor to the eccentric and two Rhodian tourists studying hollow maps of Varlo. One of the passengers, a man a lot taller than Fat, was swathed in a black cloak with a hem that swept the dust and debris on the carriage floor, giving the cloth a permanent gray border. Nobody even glanced at Fat. These weren't people who dealt with bounty hunters. He might have been a household name, but the households where his name was known tended to be those who could afford plenty and were motivated to pay it to solve their problems in a very permanent way. The people here didn't fit the bill. Fat got off at the terminus and merged into an anonymous crowd of shoppers. The stores here were mid-market, the kind that clerical and technical staff would use. 
He walked into a clothing store and looked at the selection of men's fashions displayed as holograms above a dais. Is this a bestian gun? he said to the salesman. If sir wants to impress, sir needs to shop on the waterfront, said the salesman stiffly. If sir has the credits, that is. Fett assumed he met one of the artificial rivers that he'd seen from the air. He looked over a voluminous dark tunic and cloak, not unlike the one he'd seen the man wearing on the monorail. I'll take this, and a hold all. Size, measure me. Might I see your credit, Chip, sir? Fett dumped two cash credit discs, one hundreds, on the counter. Will this do nicely? The salesman took a stylus from his jacket, flipped the discs over, and checked the hollow stamp under the stylus's beam of UV light. Yes, sir. He flicked the stylus with his thumbnail, and the instrument spat a thin beam of red light. If sir would mind removing his armor, then I can measure. Over the armor. Sorry. The armor stays. I'm not the trusting type. The salesman hesitated for a moment, but swept the laser across Fett from side to side, and then top to toe, studied the precise measurements on the stylus's display, and shrugged. Large, he said. I can see you're a professional. Fett took the hold all and the clothing and headed for the nearest public refreshers. It was cramped in the cubicle, but he slipped off his jetpack and rocket launcher, dismantled them into sections, and put them in the hold all. The cloak and tunic draped over his armor just fine after that. Then he hesitated before removing his helmet. It was the ultimate disguise. Apart from his doctor and a few Kaminoans, nobody knew what he really looked like any longer. He might even have changed too much for Town Wee to spot him. He stared into the mirror above the basin, and with a few seconds' detachment, saw a man on the edge of genuine old age, hair mostly gray, face largely unlined, having been protected from sunlight for almost as long as he could remember. Even the scars from the time he escaped the Sarlax acid gut weren't that conspicuous now. He could pass for any fit man in his early seventies. Fairfax. In a suit, I might even look like a gentleman. And that was what he needed to be right now. If he was going to find out where the scientists at Arumad lived, he had to look as unlike a bounty hunter as he could. Boba Fett strode out of the refreshers and into public view without his helmet for the first time in his adult life. Chapter 7 Luke, you know very well that it's about a lot more than stopping Corellia having her own deterrent. It's tempting to reveal that little surprise in the Curus cluster to show people why we mean business. But for the time being, we're just going to have to sit on it and hope we can persuade Corellia to disarm before our justification shows up on Coruscant. Cal Lomas to Luke Skywalker and Admiral Neothel in a confidential discussion of the true scope of the Corellian threat. Galactic City Public Landing Area 337B They nearly crash-landed. So what? It wasn't the first time the Millennium Falcon had come close to disaster, and it wouldn't be the last. Han tried to look nonchalant. But it had still given him a few moments of white-knuckled terror, the kind he didn't like Leia to see, but that she could probably feel anyway. They both sat in silence on the lowered ramp of the Falcon, savoring the light breeze. Small, taken-for-granted things felt precious when you'd survived by the skin of your teeth. The Falcon stood in one of the hundreds of open-air bays that flanked the landing strip, just another aging vessel. Her hull made the occasional click as the metal cooled, and an ominous pool of coolant was growing under the drive housing. Han had put a pail under the leak to collect it, and now he could hear the fluid running over the rim of the container. The pipework around the drive had sheared at the welds. 
Well, said Leia at last, staring into the distance. As ever, she looked as if nothing serious had happened, just a little tired and close to irritation. That was character forming. Don't suppose you could try force welding as well? Try Jason. He might be able to do just about anything these days. So what happened exactly? She shrugged. No idea. It was like getting a force booster pack from nowhere. He's my kid, and I don't know who he is anymore, but he comes up trumps when he's needed. So maybe I should shut my mouth. That was handy. Jason feels like he's very close, said Leia. Let's do grateful, shall we? Oh, I can manage grateful, all right. Good. Leia closed her eyes for a moment. And Jane is on her way. My sensible girl. At least one of my kids still makes sense to me. Who else knows we're here? Maybe we should have Luke and Mara over, too. Throw a barbecue right here. Invite the neighbors. Maybe fly a really anonymous ship until things cool down? Well, this baby isn't flying anywhere for a while. Han stood and walked back up the loading ramp. Okay, get another vessel and head back to Corellia. Move to a new apartment. Breach Thracken's security and shoot him. Then worry about another war. The coolant level on the console indicator was showing zero. He went down to the drive bay where he could smell scorched alloy and the throat-tingling whiff of the fluid. Stang, he was tired of all this. Was it ever going to end? A year with Leia, a normal year when nothing happened, nothing went wrong, none of the kids was in danger. Was that too much to ask? When he came out through the main starboard hatch again, Jason was sitting on the ramp with his arm around Leia's shoulders, forehead resting against hers. Leia looked up, just a little warning glance, but Han didn't need to be told to show his son some appreciation. It was a reflex. He grabbed him as he stood up and tugged him so hard that he felt Jason's ribs through his robes. "'It's okay, Dad,' Jason said softly. Don't scare me like that again, though. I was going to say the same to you. This wasn't the time to mention taking sides. You okay? You look worn out. Not as worn out as you. Things have been a little tense around here. Thracken's put out a contract on us. You, too. It'll be fascinating to see him try. Jason's frown seemed permanent now. But you... Hey, I might be ancient to you, but I can take Thracken, thanks. My actions on Centerpoint provoked him. I feel responsible for your safety. What's the point of having a Jedi for a son if he can't look out for his dad? You leave me to worry about Thracken, said Han. Yeah. You attacked Corellia, and you're my son, and I'm not sure how I'd deal with that. It won't be the first time. Just wait. He'll send Fett. I can handle Fett. Leia gave a small snort of amusement. You can brandish walking sticks at each other. He's not getting any younger either. Why would Thracken hire him? Because he thinks Fett will psych me out. He thinks right, then. Han took it as making light of her fears, but Jason didn't seem amused. Come back to my apartment, Dad. His tone was almost pleading, just in case someone's got your apartment here under observation. Wouldn't you know about that already? said Han. Jason's force senses seemed to beat scanners these days. He watched his son's face fall for a second. What makes you say that? I don't know what kind of force stuff you picked up while you were away all those years, but it sure comes in useful. Ah, said Jason. He seemed reassured. Han wasn't sure what had rattled him. Might as well take every precaution we can. 3PO's making a very convincing job of telling people he has no idea where you've gone. Even the Nogri. He sounds positively annoyed about it. Jason stopped and looked around. Something had distracted him. Something Han couldn't see or hear as usual. Then Han caught a flash of orange out the corner of his eye and turned to see a Galactic Alliance pilot walking between laid-up vessels on the apron of the landing strip. 
For an illogical moment, his stomach churned, and then he focused on long brown hair pulled back in a tail, and the fact that the pilot had an astromech droid keeping pace beside her. Jaina, in a pilot's uniform. So when did she get that out of the wardrobe? said Han. She didn't tell us she was going back on active service. No fighting, Leia said firmly. Han was dismayed at how fast he moved from being glad to be alive to challenging his daughter's choices. He was still relieved to see her. She just reached out and squeezed his hand, oddly formal, and then did the same to Leia. She simply nodded at Jason, which didn't bode well. Han supposed that a Galactic Alliance pilot hugging people in public might have drawn some attention. He wished she would patch things up with Jason, though. I'm not going to ask any obvious questions, Jaina patted R2's dome. But I thought you could use some help with repairs. Thanks. Han ignored Leia's warning, and the comment was out of his mouth before he could think too hard. And why are you decked out in an orange flight suit? Because I'm doing my job, Dan. Did Zack get you back into this? Jaina could become her mother in an instant. She had that same look of sad patience. Dad, I'm thirty-one. I make my own decisions, and you forget what I am sometimes. I never forget you're a Jedi, but that doesn't mean you should get dragged into the Alliance's wars against Corellia. Dan, said Jaina softly, I meant that I'm a fighter pilot. That's what you forget. I volunteered for active duty because this is my job. R2-D2 trundled across to the Falcon and disappeared under her belly. Han heard a series of disapproving whistles and the occasional clank of metal as the droid examined her. Jaina stood her ground in front of her father, still sad-eyed, still looking as if she was searching his face for comprehension. "'You can't seriously believe that the Alliance is right, sweetheart,' said Han. "'Dad, maybe I do, and maybe I don't, but that's not the issue. I'm in uniform, and that means I front up and earn it regardless of my personal views. That's what service is about.' Han took it as a rebuke. It wasn't, of course, but he knew deep down that he tended to emotion in wartime rather than cool professionalism. Yes, Jaina was a fighter pilot. He owed her the respect due to a professional warrior. But it still broke his heart that his little girl, and she would always be that even when she was gray-haired herself, would be risking her life for a regime that seemed to want to recreate the bad old days of galactic totalitarianism. What had his own life been for, if not to create a better world for his kids? Don't do it, Jaina. I'd better get back to base, she said. Leia stood up, and Jaina gave her a hurried kiss on the cheek. Han didn't give Jaina the chance to duck his, but Jason hovered on the edge of the group, seeming to want to make peace with her, and getting no reaction. Wouldn't do for me to be advertising that the Solos are back. Watch your six, okay? Take care of yourself, Jaina, said Jason. And you. Well, she managed that much thought on. Jane had turned and took a couple of strides before glancing back at Jason. You don't feel right to me lately, Jason. Are you in trouble? Jason smiled as if he was getting her to thaw a little and was relieved. Just busy, that's all. Han watched Jane go and tried not to meet Leia's eyes. What was all that about? R2 rolled back out from under the falcon and his readout began scrolling a long list of mechanical problems that had to be fixed and that would take a long, long time. Han stopped him in mid-beep with an upheld hand. I know, don't go on about it. Or two whistled. I bet you can. You can fix anything. But don't rush, because it's time we got something less attention-grabbing. At least come back with me while you sort out alternative transport, said Jason. Good idea said Leia. And we can say hi to Ben, too. We've missed him. That wasn't Leia playing the dutiful aunt. That was Leia checking up. Jason said nothing, but Leia gave him a quick glance that Han spotted and didn't understand. 
R2 beeped a cheery goodbye and trundled up the falcon's ramp. Han followed Leia, wiping coolant-stained hands on his pants, and couldn't get Jaina's comment out of his mind. Are you in trouble? Yeah. What was all that about? Jason Solo's apartment. Rotunda Zone. Coruscant. Luke knew Ben would come back here sooner or later. He paced around the lobby of the apartment building, pausing occasionally to stare through the transparisteel doors. Something had happened to Ben, although all of Luke's force senses told him his son was alive and unharmed, but he wouldn't answer his link. And Jason had disappeared from the force. Luke picked up echoes of him sporadically and then lost him again. He looked at Mara, wondering if she was able to detect their nephew any better than he could. Nothing, she said, and shook her head, apparently knowing exactly what was on his mind. It wasn't that difficult. He'd agonized about little else today. Look, it's chaos out there. Ben's smart enough to avoid trouble. Let's take it easy. Take it easy? What had he come to when Mara was the one urging him to calm down? He wondered how much of his own anxiety was caused by having nothing concrete to do yet in the coming war. War. He'd thought it again. Somewhere along the line in the last few days, it had changed from a threat to a certainty. Luke tried to separate it in his mind from the forced dreams of the man in the hooded cloak that still plagued him. He turned back to the turbo lift and watched the cascade of lights on the floor indicator panel for a while, until he heard Mara say, Now let's not be hasty, honey, okay? Ah, uh, Oh, no. Luke spun around to see Ben. The boy's eyes were swollen and streaming, and he wiped his nose as if he'd been sobbing his heart out. Mara stood frozen for a second, and then went to wrap him in her arms. While he didn't push her away, he certainly didn't yield. What happened, sweetheart? Tell me what's wrong. Ben coughed hard. I got a whiff of riot gas. Oh, no. Mara put her fingertips under his chin and turned his face to one side to examine him. You look like you've been burned. Can you breathe okay? It's wearing off, Mom. He submitted to a hug. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let's get you to the med center for a checkup, said Luke quietly. I said, I'm fine, Dad. It wears off. Ben sounded annoyed. Aren't you doing something about the water situation? Mara intervened. The city authorities are looking after that. Is it the Corallians? Is it terrorism? They said so on HNE, and everyone believes that. Why don't we go up to the apartment and get you cleaned up? Mara steered Ben toward the turbo lift. Where's Jason? Ben stopped at the lift doors. I don't know. I was coming back from Fleet Comsen. Look, this is Jason's apartment. I ought to ask him if it's okay to just go in. It's your home, too, said Luke carefully. So Jason really did control Ben now. This was a boy who didn't even obey his mother when his life was at risk. It scared Luke, and then he found himself tearing his heart apart to be sure that he was genuinely afraid of Jason's influence tinged with darkness, or if he was just hurt that his nephew had more of a paternal relationship with his kid than he did. Come on. Ben usually sighed and showed dissent, but now he just nodded, resigned, as if he'd suddenly grown a lot older in a matter of days. They rode the turbo lift in an uncomfortable silence, punctuated only by Ben's sniffs and coughs. His robe was dirty, as if he'd been rolling on the ground. When they got to the apartment, his first reaction was to head for the refresher. He stopped a few paces back from the doors and turned on his heel. "'Bottled water in the conservator,' he said. The water supply to most of the center of the city was still cut off. Luke turned on the taps in the kitchen to drain off any water still standing in the pipes and tether tanks. There was no point taking any chances. I can feel that you're angry, Dad, said Ben hoarsely. He slopped a bottle of water into a bowl and soaked the washcloth to wipe his face. 
He flinched when the cloth touched his skin, but he didn't make a sound. But it's not Jason's fault, it's mine. I decided not to go with him when he had his meeting. He seemed about to expand on that, but checked himself visibly. I've learned my lesson. It's okay. Mara caught Luke's eye as Ben covered his face with the washcloth for a moment. Her expression said it all. Is this the rebellious son we know? Let me get you something to drink. You sound awful. They ended up in the living room, the three of them sitting as far apart from one another as the room would allow. Ben sipped a glass of juice and occasionally broke into a hacking, uncontrollable cough that left him wheezing with tears streaming down his face. His sobriety stunned Luke. Maybe Mara was right. Perhaps Luke was too mired in his own anxieties about where he had lost Ben along the way, that he was mistaking Jason's motives. Apart from his terrible dreams and the darkness that trailed Jason, he had nothing concrete to lay against his nephew, only evidence that Ben was settling down far better in his care than he ever had at home. But they could sit in silence for a while. They didn't have to talk. Almost out of habit, Luke let himself drift to pick up impressions from the apartment and felt nothing beyond a sense of unease, as if Jason was having problems. A man having a difficult love affair. Maybe that's all it is. But something told him that wasn't true. What he did begin to feel, though, was his sister somewhere near. And Jason. The doors opened, and Jason walked in with Han and Leia. It should have been a family reunion of sorts. And a relieved one at that, but the expression on Han's face said otherwise. Luke decided to take the lead. It's okay, Jason, he said. We made Ben let us in. He got caught up in the rioting. Dispersal gas. I'm fine, Ben sighed. It's wearing off. Well, we've all had a little drama in our day, then. Jason ushered Leia and Han into the room. He radiated only concern and sympathy, nothing dark at all. Mom and Dad nearly crash-landed, and Dad was nearly assassinated. Mara got up to plump cushions around Leia. Sounds like a regular day in this family. We'll be heading back home as soon as we can find a replacement ship. Han barely made eye contact with Luke. The Falcon's not so hot right now. Our two's carrying out repairs. Why didn't you let me know? Han shrugged. We were kind of busy, trying not to plummet in flames. If Jason hadn't projected the force through Leia, you'd have needed a shovel to pick us up at the spaceport. Luke tasted a chance to broker some peace, at least within his own family. It didn't bode well for the galaxy if he couldn't persuade even his own family to stick together. Corellia doesn't have to be home, Han. Come back. You're safer here anyway. Yeah, but there's the small matter of my being Corellian, which isn't fashionable right now. And your buddy's attacking my homeworld because it won't roll over and be the Alliance's stooge while it plays at being the Empire again. We should both know better. On how long have we known each other? Long enough for you to know that the way the Alliance is behaving should give you that proverbial bad feeling, the kind I get. On, Leia said. It was a quiet warning. Knock it off. No, let him have his say. Luke was suddenly conscious of Ben watching him, and this wasn't the way he wanted his son to see him. Starting a verbal brawl with his best friend, when all everyone needed right then was to be glad they were still alive. I happen to think you're playing Thrak and Sal Solo's game with this Corellian knee-jerk response to any suggestion of being team players. Whoa there, kid, who's team? Yours? You can take this independence thing too far. Yeah, and you were quick enough to use my sense of rugged individuality when it suited you in the past, pal. But I can't pick it up and put it down that easy. It's who I am. Let's not argue over this, said Luke. We just did. Han shook his head. He stood staring at Luke for a few moments, looking more bewildered than angry. They use you every time. Show me a government that hasn't used Jedi to legitimize its actions. You're like some galactic rubber stamp. 
Why are you backing Omus? You of all people. Does the name Palpatine ring a bell? That was different. He was Sith. And Omus is a jerk. Or at least a puppet for a whole mess of other jerks. Well, count me out. You've got my kids working for you, and that'll have to be enough. Oh, boy, said Mara. But Luke could sense her embarrassment and fear. I love to see the grown-ups in action. Jason, let's make some calf for Leia while these two sprite testosterone around the room. Come on, Ben, you too. Yeah, I've had enough of this as well, said Leia. She got up and stood between the two men, all weary annoyance. Cut it out, Han. And you, Luke, we've got enough problems without having a civil war inside this family. Luke felt an uneasy, dragging sensation in his gut that he hadn't experienced for many, many years. It was self-doubt. Maybe Han had a point. Jedi had fallen into expedience before, and it had brought them down. The Force had ways of ringing that alarm bell. And Han was right. This was who he was, stubbornly independent, the one heading the opposite way when the crowds were streaming past him in the other direction. Not because it paid him best. However polished his veneer of smart-mouthed, callous fortune hunter. But because he thought it was right. And he would die rather than concede that independence. Han was Corellian. No, he was Corellia. Luke avoided generalizations, but Corellians were all like that, including those living here. It didn't fill him with confidence. He sighed and held out his hand, genuinely wishing he hadn't said a word. Han didn't take it. I'm going to go see a man about a ship, he said and stalked out. Jason walked up behind Luke and patted his shoulder. I'm sorry, Uncle Luke. If I'd known you were here... I'd have called ahead to say they were coming. Dad's pretty strung out right now. And it's not just the politics. It's Jaina and Thracken and now the Falcon. It crossed Luke's mind that Jason should have been able to detect his and Mara's presence in the force. But it was an unkind thought. Perhaps part of shutting down his own presence was becoming insensitive to others. Luke realized Jason's force skills seemed to be getting stronger and more subtle every day, and he felt uneasy. What did Han mean about projecting the force? Jason shrugged. Once again, the thoughtful man who felt compassion for every living thing. Mom was trying to hold the Falcons all together, so I suppose I added my force strength to it through her, almost like we did against the Killicks, to deflect their weapons. Almost, said Luke. No, they hadn't quite done that. Channeling the Force was a new one to him. You've developed some impressive skills lately. Jason was the only other Jedi Luke knew who could defeat Lomi Plo's illusion of invisibility. The trick was to have no doubts that could be turned against you as a diversion. I have a lot of doubts. I think I have more doubts than certainties right now. But as Jason turned away from him, Luke caught a very faint touch of something familiar in his mind, almost like a trace of a familiar perfume. It was an echo. It felt ancient. Luke almost opened his mouth to inhale it. Then he realized what it was. He knew who it was. For a moment he thought it was emanating from Jason, and then he realized it was purely coincidence. The revelation hit him like a body blow. He understood his forced dream perfectly now. I know who the hooded man is. I know now, and it's not a man at all. Luke sensed a barely perceptible trace in the force of a woman who had once loved him. The dark Jedi called Shara Bree, who had degenerated into Lumia, a Sith who was more cyborg than human, a woman who hated him, too, but whom he thought had vanished forever. She was back. She's here. I know she's here. Lumia is here. Luke tasted the presence of a dangerous, bitter enemy, and knew he had to find her before she harmed him and his family. 
It was just like her to take advantage of the unrest in the galaxy to cover her movements. Jason stared into Luke's face. What's wrong, Uncle? Shall I warn Jason that Lumia has come back? Will he listen to me? It's nothing, said Luke. Just unhappy memories. Chapter 8 Corellian militants have claimed responsibility for contaminating water supplies to parts of Galactic City with Thaxem-3. The attack, which left 456 dead and more than 5,000 with nerve damage, sparked yesterday's riots outside the Corellian Embassy. CSF has doubled its police presence in Galactic City in a bid to prevent escalation of unrest. Galactic City authorities have declared a full terror alert and are asking the public to remain vigilant. But Admiral Chan Yathel has called for tough action to crack down on potential terrorists. HNE Morning Bulletin Offices of Chief of State Omis Senate Building, Coruscant The HNE Holocam hovered patiently as Chief Omas gave an earnest interview about the safety of Galactic City's water supply. Jason stood back and watched from the sofa in the corner of the vast office. Omas had a Naboo crystal jug on his desk and made a point, with subtle ease, of pouring a glass and sipping it occasionally while talking. There was nothing like a politician's personal display of confidence in the potability of Coruscant water. He even offered a glass to the reporter, whose expression told Jason that he knew he was being subjected to a little spin. The man drank anyway. He and Domus looked as if they were playing a child's game of dare. Extra security measures are now in place at all water company stations said Omas, cradling his glass. Jason had learned, fast, that meshing your hands on the desk gave the most reassuring image. So the trick with the glass of water would be far from invisible to HNE viewers. I'm confident there won't be a repeat of the sabotage earlier this week. Do you believe we're facing a genuine terrorist threat, or is this a random act? said the reporter. It's a genuine threat. And it appears to be escalating. Omas didn't hesitate. Even if we're not dealing with an identifiable formal terrorist organization. If you've identified that level of threat, then, do you feel you're doing enough to protect Coruscant citizens? This time, Omas did pause for a breath. Jason watched him calculate visibly, and he knew the politician was seizing an opportunity. I can assure you that our security services are taking every possible action. But you've been criticized by some politicians for not going far enough. We've gone as far as the current law permits. Some of your colleagues are calling for the internment of resident Corellians. That's a very big step. We're not at war. By the time we are, won't it be too late? Omas managed a regretful smile. Let's not be hasty. Internment. That's my father you're talking about. Jason caught himself bristling at the suggestion, and then felt guilty for considering his own family before those who were being caught in the crossfire of something that was a war in all but name. Someone has to get a grip on this situation, and it's me. His eye was caught by movement in the outer lobby, visible through a transparent steel panel. The outline was broken by the etched designs, but he recognized Senator Gassil, chair of the Security and Intelligence Council. As soon as the HNE reporter had finished the interview and left, Gassil slipped into Omas's office. It's not my job on the line, he said, pulling up a chair, but I think our friend from the media had a point. Sorry, just a little benign eavesdropping. Jason knew why he had been summoned. He just wanted to see how they would broach the subject with him. Playing political games made him worry that personal ambition was driving him, but he was dealing with people whose stock in trade was maneuvering. So if he wanted their backing, he had to maneuver too. A Jedi was nothing if not pragmatic. 
I'm not comfortable with taking a hardline approach, said Olmus. And it might not be my decision to make. Gasil gestured over his shoulder to the city beyond the room with windows. Take a look out there. We have a trillion people on this world. A few thousand, a tiny percentage, have been hurt directly by terrorism. The rest, though, think it's about to happen to them, and that's what we're dealing with here. Perception. Public confidence. Omus raised one eyebrow. Spin. Reassurance. Jason had seen enough to add Gasil to his list of allies along with Neothel. Fear breeds its own problems, said Jason. We have to limit that. There was a moment's silence. Omus's shoulders dropped, and his presence in the force was like a small piece of ice melting into nothing. His reluctance was tangible. "'Mara Skywalker isn't willing to take on a security role,' he said. "'You, however, seem equally able and a great deal more willing to do a thankless task.' "'Define the task,' said Jason. "'Fill the gap between the Army and the Coruscant Security Force.' "'Why are you talking directly to me and bypassing the Jedi Council?' Jason asked. "'I'm not even in the military.' "'Because we're not asking you as a Jedi,' said Gisil. "'We're asking you as Jason Solo, and you'll be given a commission and a rank, as Colonel. "'I'd bet the Council doesn't want to be tainted by messy stuff like this. "'They won't like it. "'Let's cut the PR speak. "'As a democracy, we've never been very adept at running secret police.' You know, the kind of shock troops that Vader had when... Gasil trailed off. Sorry, Jason, no offense. It's all right. Jason meant it. He had come to terms with walking in his grandfather's footsteps, although he would not follow the entire path. I'm not ashamed of Anakin Skywalker, and there are positive things I can learn from his example. The office was suddenly and totally silent, as if both Cassell and Domus were holding their breath until Jason said it was okay to exhale. Do we take that as a yes? Cassell asked. Stang, I walk in here as a civilian and I'll leave as a colonel. Jaina won't like that at all, Jason swallowed. I'll need a security force to deal with it. Omus looked to Gasil and then back at Jason. CSF's anti-terrorist unit is yours to command? No, I need my own team from the military and a few other sources. A team that's visibly separate from CSF. If civilian police are seen raiding homes and rounding up residents, it's going to make ordinary policing hard. Politically, it has to be separate. A Galactic Alliance Special Guard, if you like. Gasil nodded. I agree. You have to keep the secret police separate from the nice, polite officers who police the street. Sends a message that ordinary law-abiding Coruscanti have nothing to fear, while demonstrating maximum force to the enemy. Olmus was sitting on the edge of his seat, elbows braced on the desk, one fist clasping the other as he stared down in defocus. You said rounding up. Enchantment said Gasil. And that's not just spin. Corellians got at the water supply pretty easily. One relatively small bomb shut ten sky lanes for half a day. It takes very few people to cause a lot of disruption on a crowded planet like this. And let me remind you that this is also a nervous planet, not long recovered from another war. Makes folks paranoid. Jason could see the path ahead of him. The path laid down, specifically for him, the inevitability of his destiny that Lumia had shown him. Events were falling into place, and he was part of them with no option now but to accept his responsibility. And we need to show any other world that might want to support Corellia that the Galactic Alliance isn't a pushover, he said. Jason noted the inclusion. Who is this we? I'm not elected. I'm not a member of the Jedi Council. I'm not even a master. Internment is going to take a security and intelligence council vote. 
Oma seemed resigned, but still salving his own conscience by doing things democratically. He gave Jason an odd look, a faint, bemused frown, as if remembering something, and looked a little past him. Then he appeared to focus again. I'll need your lobby's backing. Assume you have it, said Gasil. Jason was more concerned over whom he would need to carry out the task. His instinct was to seek loyal, dependable foot soldiers. I'd like to recruit Captain Shavu and a team of his choosing he said. He liked Shavu. The captain was uncompromisingly honest and had the feel in the force of a man who wouldn't shy away from dirty work. I'd also like a company of special forces troops, and I need access to Alliance intelligence data. Jason felt for a moment that he was standing outside his own body. How did I slip into this so easily? You'll want NRI officers, then. No. Intelligence hadn't dealt with the threat up to now, so he had no idea whom he could trust. This has to be seen as a fresh approach to the problem. Omis radiated unease. We've taken a step toward martial law. Gasil interrupted. But this is technically a Coruscanti matter. It's not a Senate issue. You have the powers to put a temporary order in place for the planet. But Coruscant isn't just a planet. It's the Galactic Alliance, too. So I want full support for this. Or things will fall apart when we start applying those special measures, as you like to call them. People tend to lose their nerve when they see force applied. A majority on the SIC would be legitimate authority to implement special measures. And you can deliver that majority, can you? said Omis. I'll call a special meeting now. Give me twenty-four hours. Gasil patted Jason on the shoulder with evident relief and left. Omis, sitting behind his desk with the air of a man in a heavily defended trench, watched Jason as if expecting him to break bad news. May I start assembling the personnel I need now? Jason asked. Then we'll be ready to move when the authority is given. Very well, let me speak to Admiral Pelion. Omus opened the comm link set into his desk. It was the same pleak wood and lapis as the desk itself. And I'll get Shevu seconded to you. You can explain all this to the Supreme Commander in CSF? I'm very good at being plausible, said Omus. But I doubt if CSF is going to object. Omus looked as if he was going to add something, and Jason was almost certain of what it would be. Pelion would resign if this was forced on him. That was what Jason was thinking, too. When Neothel took over the defense role, and she would, nobody doubted that, her support would be a springboard for what was to come. What had to come. But for the meanwhile, Jason had to prove to Coruscant, and to a watching galaxy, that not only could order be imposed on chaos, it could also be imposed for the good of the majority. He bowed slightly to Omus and left to make his way to the Strategic Command Ops Room, where he both felt and knew that Captain Shevu was still on duty, despite the fact that his shift should have ended three hours ago. Shevu was dedicated and forthright, and he'd have the best intelligence on where the Corellian troublemakers might be. Jason could help him pinpoint them with the imprecise but highly reliable senses that the Force had given him. They would make a formidable team. He, Ben, and Shevu. Varlo, Runadan, Waterfront District Just as the salesman had said, the Waterfront neighborhood was chic and full of the well-heeled professional classes. The taxi took him along the artificial river, a canal with carefully constructed rapids and a manufactured current. There was even lush greenery along the banks, and parkland extended back to the rows of shops and trendy restaurants. Fat, black cloak over his armor, felt utterly naked and concentrated on the fact that nobody would recognize him by his face. He decided he felt more at home in the kind of district where the bars were badly lit and a blaster was a necessity. 
I'm going to be working at Arumed, said Fett. Where's the best place to buy a home? The taxi pilot glanced in his rearview mirror, and his eyes met Fett's. It was the first time in years that anyone had really looked into his eyes and not just tried to stare through the visor. Upper Parkway is where all the scientists buy a place. You a scientist? I'm an anatomist. Yes, I know precisely where to shoot any one of a thousand species for maximum stomping power. You'll definitely want Upper Parkway, then. Nightlife? Pricey bars? Skayan bistros and wine bars, mainly. The pilot wrinkled his nose disapprovingly. I'm an ailed man myself. I'll go to the Arumed Labs. Five minutes. Cozy little community. All human. You got anything against non-humans? Just curious. Kaminoans hated sunlight. They were used to clouds, rain, and endless oceans. Fat doubted that an ornamental river would be water enough for town we. I like to know my neighbors. Only ever seen humans up there. Maybe you don't know how to look. Drop me there. I want to check if I like the place. Upper Parkway was every bit as smart as the taxi pilot had said. The apartment towers were interspersed with townhouses a real luxury on a crowded planet. And droids were still building properties on the edge of the park for which the neighborhood seemed to be named. From the end of the boulevard, Fett could see the gray monolithic building of the Arumed Laboratories, with its red illuminated sign, an easy walk for anyone living in Upper Park. And, as the pilot had said, the place had several attractive bistros. He was perfectly at home rappelling from a roof to capture a prisoner, or storming a building with blaster in hand. Walking into a bar and making cautious small talk was not his style, but it had to be done. Get it over with, Fat. Inside the bistro, everything was polished, orderly, calm. He walked up to the bar and took a seat, browsing the menu. Without his helmet, he could actually eat something. The novelty of that idea seemed astonishing, and reminded him how many things he had never done, and now might never do if he didn't find that data. Can I get you something? Again, Fat found himself looking into the face of a bartender. But this one was looking back as if he only saw a man, not a bounty hunter. Nobody else at the bar seemed to take any notice of him either. He could usually bring nervous silence to a bar just by walking into it. An ale, he said. It's so simple. It's what everyone else does. One of the Corellian ones. A foaming glass appeared before him. Visiting? Here's a man who makes a note of strangers. A cautious man. Thinking of buying a place here. Good time to buy, too. The barman slid a glass bowl of some unidentifiable snack toward him. Now that Aromed's expanding, the prices will go crazy. Fat sipped the ale, almost totally distracted by the simple freedom of having a drink in public. He tried the snacks, too, which turned out to be salt, sweet, and crunchy, like fried nuts. Shares are doing well. It's those scientists they poached from Santec. They say it's going to mean a big share of the gene therapy market. Santec. Fearfec, I guessed wrong. Not Kaminoans, then? The bartender laughed. A man farther along the bar turned to look at him. Ever seen one? Steady. Yes, knew one very well indeed. The silence deepened. There was quiet, and then there was the silence of people taking serious notice, and the two did not sound the same. A customer here the other day said one had turned up at Arcanian Micro, but I think he was having a laugh, said the barman. Arcanian Micro. Well, if you deal in cloning, that's one more place to head. It was a knife-edge point in the conversation. Fat stomach churned, and that rarely happened. Wrong planet, but maybe the right track. 
I knew a pathologist at Arcanian Micro, said a man sitting a little farther along the bar. She said some interesting things about Caminoans. Ah, uh, you're testing me. Do I work in the industry? Am I bluffing to get insider information? What, that they'd never go outside in the sunlight? That they're obsessed with perfection? The man considered him carefully. That they're gray with long necks and incredibly arrogant once you get past the polite exterior. Well, that confirms you've met one, or your friend has. Thanks. Fat busied himself with his ale. Not many people knew that much about Caminoans. Over the centuries, only a handful of people had even known they existed, let alone seen them or had enough contact with them to describe their outlook on the non-Caminoan world. But industry insiders here knew, all right. Did Micro give them a nice dark hole to live in? It was an issue, said the man, and looked satisfied. So Caminoans had probably defected to Arcanian Micro on Vohai. The intelligence was flimsy. But given that there was normally no intel at all on Kaminoans, it had a great deal more credibility. Fat had already worked out his route to the outer rim by the time he drained his ale, put his credits on the counter and stood up to leave. I like this neighborhood, he said. On the way back to Slave One, he did what he had done so many times— he used his data pad to carry out an automated purchase of an asset. He bought half a dozen homes in Upper Parkway and transferred them to one of his holding companies. They'd double in value inside the year. It was as near as he ever came to indulgence, but he would never live in any of them. They were an investment. He never gambled. He speculated. What are you investing for? Why did you ever invest? When did you stop and think what you were going to do with it all? He hadn't. He was in it to succeed, to show how good he was. And the only person who would have cared how well he did, what a clever boy he'd been, was long dead. Fat flexed his fingers discreetly as he sat in the back of the taxi, feeling the joints and tendons burn. The pain was still occasional rather than ever-present, but he knew it would get worse as his condition deteriorated. A few analgesics, when pain finally impaired his efficiency, would keep him going. No, he wasn't dead yet. But if Kosai had been one of the Kaminoans, he noted that plural, who fled to Arcanian Micro, then her research on aging hadn't gone with her. The company would have exploited it to the full by now. Anti-aging was always the preoccupation of affluent civilizations. It earned big credits. Maybe the talk in the bar was just rumor. No, enough hard detail had been revealed, and industry gossip tended to have a basis in reality. But maybe Kosai had never managed to halt or reverse the aging process. Then you're really dead fat. So shape up. As soon as he was clear of the taxi, he stripped off the robe and tunic, bundled it in the hold all, and put his helmet back on with genuine relief. It wasn't just a barrier against a world where he didn't truly belong. It was a piece of a kit, a weapon in its own right. He relaxed as the familiar welter of text and icons cascaded down the margin of the HUD and told him all was well with Slave One. He checked the various security cams remotely, staring through images of empty bays and secure hatchways at the Permacrete Strip in front of him. Even before Slave One came into view in one of the bays, he settled on an image of Myrta Gev. Still locked in the prisoner bay, she lay on the deck with her legs hooked over a bulkhead rail. Fingers meshed behind her head, performing sit-ups. He hadn't come across women like her before. He hadn't come across many men like her, either. Whatever was driving her, she was serious about it. Discipline was a fine quality. He came perilously close to liking her again.
Fool, she's ballast. He opened Slave One's forward hatch via his HUD link at thirty meters from the ship, climbed into the cockpit, and flicked open the internal comm system. Change of plan, he said. We're going to Parmel Sector Outer Rim. He waited for sounds of protest. Nothing. He checked the cam again to make sure Myrta was still there. Did you hear me? Yes. She sounded a little out of breath and stood looking into the cam's lens. You'll pay me sooner or later. I'm young. I've got time to wait. She had no idea how pointed that observation truly was. Fett wondered if she knew he was ill, but there was no way she could know he was dying. Vohai, he said, and wondered why he volunteered the destination. She was making him drop his guard. Nobody managed that. He made a conscious effort to be himself again, untouched by anything beyond his own needs. Set up front where I can keep an eye on you. He released the security locks on the aft compartments and fired up Slave One's sublight drives. Myrta belted herself into the co-pilot seat just as the ship lifted, the acceleration flattening her like a punch. Fat paused. I don't bother with the G-force dampers on takeoff. Why did I say that? He'd developed a rhythm of bare-bones conversation over the years. His passengers were never volunteers. Nobody wanted him to catch up with them. This was how it went. They whined, and he slapped them down, with a blunt word or sometimes a blunt object. Myrta didn't whine. He still felt the compulsion to slap down. She stared ahead from the view screen. I didn't pay for a ticket, so I'm not complaining. There was no answer to that. Fett took Slave One out on manual to check that he could still pilot without computer assistance. So far, so good. The illness was still just pain, not yet infirmity. Runadan dwindled beneath them into a rusty red coin, and the viewport filled with star-specked void as Slave One cleared the planet. Then he took the risk of losing his main psychological aid to remaining aloof and eased off his helmet. He expected Myrta to react, but she just glanced at him and then looked away again, apparently more interested in the star field ahead. You're a clone, aren't you? said Myrta at last. She gets right to the point. Got a problem with that? No, I met a clone once. So did Aelin. She killed him. Only because she thought he was you. I don't want to chat. He didn't answer. Myrta persisted. But this clone said he'd fought a geonosis. Couldn't have. Why? Those clones were designed to age fast. Fett did a quick mental calculation, doubling the years. He'd be a decrepit hundred forty-year-old now. He was alive, all right. The clone army had been designed to mature in ten standard years, and then they carried on aging at twice or more the rate of ordinary men. Fat remembered feeling sorry for them as a kid, but his father had told him to be proud because they were perfect warriors. Sometimes he remembered that they were also his brothers. Whenever he met a stormtrooper going about Vader's business, He'd always wondered whether some remnant of his father's template, of himself, was behind that white visor, but he never asked. When did you meet him? Fat asked carefully. Last year. I got in his way on a job. Bounty hunting? Where? Don't rush her. Yes. A one hundred forty year old clone? Myrta studied his face for a moment, impassive. He looked a lot like you, except for the scars. He'd be too old to even walk. Oh, he could walk all right, and handle a weapon. Big, scary guy with a custom verpine rifle and this long, thin, three-sided knife. No clone from the Grand Army of the Republic could have survived, let alone have left the service. Their whole life was fighting. How could they have coped on their own? But clones were men 
and they had been scattered across the galaxy in the war, so it was inevitable that some had fathered children. This had to be one of them. He was almost reassured to know that the clone bloodline hadn't been erased completely, but he wasn't sure why. You sure? Yeah. He said his clan name was Skirata. Skirata. Fett jerked his head around and knew instantly that he'd displayed too much interest. But he knew that name. Back on Camino in the years before the war with the Separatists started, his father had had a friend called Skirata, a short, tough, fanatical man who trained clone commandos and, according to his father, was the dirtiest fighter he'd ever known. He seemed to like that about him. What else did he say? That he and some of his brothers left the army after Palpatine came to power. He wasn't very talkative. You're definitely related. That made Fat pay much closer attention. No clone from the Camino Labs could have survived this long, except unaltered ones like him. Or one whose accelerated aging process had been halted. Only Kosai knew enough to be able to do that. I'm interested, he said. Why? He'd rarely needed to lie, but he lied now. They'd be my brothers, too, wouldn't they? And then he wasn't sure how much of that was actually untrue. He had always been alone, just the way he liked it, and now he was suddenly curious about not being that way. Myrta leaned back in the seat and looked up at the deckhead. The heart of fire was strung around her neck, which struck him as an odd thing for a bounty hunter to do with an object she'd retrieved. She was just a young girl, and girls liked baubles, but she didn't seem the type to go in for jewelry. He looked like you, more or less, she said at last. She tugged at the necklace like worry beads. He had full mondo armor, light gray and these pale gray leather gloves with an unusual grain. She held both hands out above her lap, palms down, fingers spread, as if she was imagining those gloves on her own hands. Really immaculate gloves. Fat thought gray, and an image of Town Wee's long silver-gray neck and neat yellow-eyed head dominated his field of view as vivid as his helmet's display right there in front of him, and yet somehow not there. If Myrta wasn't spinning him a line, then someone had managed to get hold of Kosai's data, and they made use of it. But maybe she knew more than he gave her credit for. His father had taught him to watch out for traps. This was so close to what he wanted to hear that it triggered every suspicious nerve in his body which was all of them. If those clones survived, why haven't I heard about them before? If this kid's trying to set me up for something, she's got a lot to learn. Even Aelin had tried to kill him once. He glanced sideways at Myrta. Fairfax, you look just like him when you do that. She looked rattled. It's the way you tilted your head. Whoever the man with the gray gloves was, he seemed to have made an impression, or else she was an expert actress. She had a tight grip on the heart of fire as if to protect it. Fat decided to make sure she was secured in the aft section when he needed to sleep. She still seemed to think that the goods she had to sell was Aelin's location. Maybe she didn't realize that she now had two things he wanted— and that was information on both his dead wife and, impossible, but he couldn't ignore it, his living brothers. If she had known, she'd have asked him to pay for it. But Myrta had the necklace. It was somehow all he could recall of Sintas Val at that moment. He suddenly missed her, and he knew he had no right to. Senate Lobby 513 Senate Building, Coruscant, 0835 hours. Admiral Pelion resigned as Supreme Commander of the Galactic Alliance Defense Force at 0800. A little too late for the main morning holonews bulletins, 
but early enough to interrupt drive-time programming for a few moments. He had objected strenuously, in private, to the powers granted to the Galactic Alliance Guard, but said nothing publicly. He was an old man. Nobody outside Omis's cabinet, and presumably the military, thought it unusual that he should let a younger officer take his place. Jason watched the news on the chamber's hollow screen, sound muted. While he wasn't surprised that Pelion had finally gone, he still wasn't prepared for the speed at which events were moving. He wondered if Lumia had influenced matters somehow, but she denied it. She sat beside him in the deserted lobby chamber, document case on her lap, face invisible under that dark red cowl and veil. The chamber was normally full of lobbyists and media seeking audience with senators, but it was too early for the majority of the power brokers to be about their business. The Jedi Council, though, was meeting Neothel in the Supreme Commander's suite, and it was interesting that she had not gone to see them, but that they had come to her. Start as you mean to go on. Jason wondered what Uncle Luke would make of the Mon Calamari officer. She would replace Omus one day. He hoped Luke would see that coming and support her, so that the war would be short and sharp, and so Jason wouldn't have to take up the mantle Lumia had thrust upon him. There you go again. You know this is meant to be. You can't avoid it. Lumia is part of the inevitable, just as you are. Submit to it. Tell me you didn't influence Admiral Pelion, said Jason quietly. I didn't need to. He's furious about your appointment, and he's old. Lumia's voice was so low that Jason almost had to amplify it with the force in his mind. By the time he decides he wants to return, it'll be too late for him to stop you. The resignation of an elderly chief of defense was no shocking news story for HME, merely a chance to recap on Pelion's distinguished career. But the succession of Admiral Neothel was significant. She was known as a hardliner. Jason switched the wall-mounted hollow screen to a Corellian news station where her appointment was provoking reaction. Thracken Sal Solo, head of state, was holding forth on the certain threat to Corellia. With the audio muted, Jason lip-read. Sal Solo announced that Centerpoint Station would be brought back online for the defense of Corellia within three months. You have an interesting selection of relatives, said Lumia. All the more reason for me to do the decent thing and sort out the problems the various branches of my family appear to be visiting upon the galaxy. You're more like your grandfather than you think. Lumia knew Anakin Skywalker as her Lord Vader. He'd selected her as an intelligence agent. I haven't failed to notice the parallels, said Jason. And that makes you wary. I've seen the steps he took. Literally, Grandfather, I stood behind you and watched you kill children. I have to do things a little differently. And you still want Ben Skywalker as your apprentice? Yes. Lumia emanated satisfaction, as if this was an extra layer of vengeance on Luke. But he knew she was past that point. That's a choice only you can make. If there's another candidate, I can't think of one. Are you still going ahead with the Galactic Alliance Guard? Why wouldn't I? You have an ally in the Supreme Commander now, she said. You could go straight to the military solution. There's still a real job to be done in restoring security here. And Neothel needs time to stamp her leadership on the GADF. And Chief Omas. Commendable pragmatic analysis. Jason wondered if he was taking a risk by having this discussion in the Senate building. But if any of the Jedi Council were as adept as he was at listening in the Force, he suspected they would be too tied up in their discussion with Neothel to hear. What would they be saying to her? He could listen. He could snatch the sounds out of the air from behind closed doors at the far end of the floor and witness for himself 
but it was irrelevant, and he didn't need to. He knew they would be pressing caution on her. He also knew Neothel would smile politely in that tight-lipped way of hers, twist her head sideways to stare them out, and say that she thanked them for their counsel. Then she would ignore that counsel. Jason's mind leapt away from the business at hand for a brief moment, and he found himself wondering why the Jedi Council hadn't given his grandfather the guidance he needed as a Padawan. If they knew he was the Chosen One, why had no master from the Council taken on the role of training him? Poor Obi-Wan. They dithered and left the task to you. Now they're dithering over another galactic war. On the hollow screen, Corellian political commentators had worked themselves into a froth of outrage at Neothel's appointment. Jason switched channels back to H.N.E., just as the sound of footsteps began echoing down the long passage to his right. The meeting in the Supreme Commander's office had ended. Relax, said Jason. He centered him south and projected a force illusion around Lumia to bolster her own cloaking of her identity again. He felt the sensation of a ball of heat building in his chest, and he nudged her with his elbow. Go on. Brief me on the strength of the Corellian fleet, and don't react to anyone passing by. Jason and Lumia waited. The lobby and the corridor leading off it were empty. Eventually they heard boots thudding fast on the marble floor. Luke's, for certain, as if he hadn't much enjoyed the meeting and wanted to get out. Okay, Lumia, let's see how you react to Luke this time, and how he reacts to you. Luke approached them, eyes downcast, distracted and frowning. He seemed about to walk past Jason, and then pause to acknowledge him as if it was an effort. Are you waiting for Neothel? asked Luke. I'm paying my respects as head of the Galactic Alliance Guard. Jason indicated Lumia. This is a colleague from the university's Defense Studies Department. Luke nodded politely at Lumia, then turned back to Jason. Are you certain that's the right choice? If I don't do it, who will? Maybe nobody should, said Luke. If Chief Olmus needs that job done, I'll do what I can. Luke fixed Jason with a frank blue gaze for a few moments. But he didn't look at Lumia again, and more to the point... Lumia didn't look at him. "'Mind how you do it,' Luke said, a slight frown still creasing his nose, and walked away. Jason waited a full ten minutes, still holding the heat in his chest to maintain the illusion before relaxing. "'I'm impressed by your ability to deceive, Luke,' said Lumia. "'I do appear to have no doubts or misgivings about it.' Jason stood up. Lumia had been given the best chance she had for decades to kill Luke Skywalker, and she hadn't shown the slightest inclination to take it. No doubts, said Jason, but no enthusiasm either. That's as it should be, she said. Tell me what your next task is. There was no harm telling her. It would be all over H.N.E. in a few days. Internment, said Jason. We're confining Corellians until this current wave of terror is contained. Come on, let me introduce you to the officer who will be in the Chief of State's office within the year. Internment. Extreme, dangerous, and inevitable. When you could let go of your own need to be the hero, the admired one, the respected and face being reviled for doing a necessary job, then you had finally overcome the most poisonous attachment of all, the love of ego. Jason was prepared to be hated in pursuit of a greater good. Chapter 9 I heard stories about his grandfather when I was a boy, and Jason Solo struck me as walking the same path. Vader liked a loyal military elite at his back, too, and sometimes ends do justify the means. 
The protest from the media and civil rights groups had greeted our announcement that a Galactic Alliance Guard had been formed to deal with the new threat to public safety was to be expected. It did not, however, make it any easier to hear myself decried as the new Palpatine. Chief of State Omas, Memoirs Corellian Quarter, Coruscant Ben knew he was taking an insane risk by going back to the Corellian neighborhood, but he had to find Barrett. This time he made sure he was wearing regular clothes, not Jedi robes. He worried that he was a coward for hiding his status, but a sensible voice inside him said that there was no point in getting beaten up before he found out something useful. That was pragmatism, as Jason called it. Corellians didn't have a fight going with the Jedi, just the Alliance, but the distinction between the two wasn't always clear. He sauntered along the walkways, stopping to stare at things that made him curious, reminding himself that he was a thirteen-year-old boy and not a soldier this time. Nobody seemed to notice him. All he wanted to do was to look Barrett in the face and ask a simple question. What made him see Coruscanti as the enemy? The fact that two governments were behaving like idiots didn't seem like justification enough for Ben. He didn't want to attack Corellians just because the government had a problem with Corellia. Even the raid on Centerpoint Station hadn't been directed against people. He felt no hatred for Corellians at all. But Barrett, who wasn't that much older than him, had tried to shoot a CSF officer. He hadn't aimed at the mob stoning the Corellian embassy. He had tried to shoot a complete stranger who was trying to stop the riot. Ben didn't understand, and he needed to. The Corellian neighborhood was quieter today, as if people were waiting for something to happen. Some of the shops were closed. Ben stopped at a grocery store to pick up a bottle of Fizz Aid and ask for directions to the Psy workshops. He drank as he walked a kilometer or so to Barrett's family business. Ben found two men who looked about his father's age, leaning over a large repulsor drive with hydro spanners in their hands. They glanced up sharply but relaxed when they saw him. Just a kid. Where's Barrett? he asked casually. One of the men stood up. Barrett? Barrett! Someone here to see you. Barrett emerged from a storeroom, wiping his hands on a rag. He stared at Ben for a few moments as if he didn't recognize him, and then didn't look pleased to see him. He walked out into the open air, and Ben followed him a little way from the workshops. There was an appetizing smell of frying and spices coming from an open doorway. Did you find your missing diamonds? Ben asked. He meant the gems made out of Corellian's ashes in the sanctuary. Did anyone give them back? No, said Barrett. The sort of people who smash memorials don't have consciences. It wasn't a good start. Ben plunged in. I saw you outside the embassy the other day. What were you doing there? Getting a face full of gas? Yeah, so was I. Ben wondered what Barrett had done with his blaster. He knew he could draw his lightsaber instantly from his pocket if he had to find out the hard way. When I say I saw you, I mean I saw you with a weapon. Everyone carries a piece, even you. I have to know. But why shoot at a cop? You going to turn me in? So he hadn't seen Ben deflect the blast. He had shot and run. I didn't think I hit anyone. They never sent... I just want to know why you did it. You aimed to kill or you didn't care who you hit. The officer never did anything to you. He was just trying to stop a fight. Coruscant's against us. The Alliance is trying to kill us. We've got to defend ourselves. But that's not people. The CSF wasn't trying to do anything to you. How can you shoot at someone who wasn't aiming at you? You wouldn't understand. I want to. You wouldn't. If you're that scared of us all, why are you still living here? You'd like that, wouldn't you? Kick us out, send us back. Ben didn't know how to respond. You think you're at war with us? We are. Maybe not properly, but we are. 
How can you think that when you live here? If you really believe that, how can you even want to live here? Ben stood staring at Barrett in complete incomprehension. He had no idea what was going on in the Corellian's mind to make him feel that he was suddenly an alien on the planet where his family had been born. But he knew that it made him feel suspicious and wary of Barrett in a way that had nothing to do with the fact that he was prepared to draw a blaster. Come on, Barrett, one of the men yelled. You're going to be yakking there all day? Got jobs to do. Get on with it. Barrett looked at Ben as if he was memorizing his face. Gotta go. Thanks for not turning me in. He walked back toward the workshop. Ben wandered away, the half-full bottle of fizz aid still clutched in his hand, and wondered if he should have reported Barrett to CSF. It had never crossed his mind. Jobby Town, Corellian Quarter, Coruscant, 0400 Hours this neighborhood hated the planet on which it found itself, and that was not a political or military assessment of the risk, but Jason Solo's certainty of what he detected in the Force. That alone was enough for a Jedi to act upon, if a Jedi was what he still was, he reminded himself. Jason could sense the resentment, anger, and danger that was simmering in this Corellian district of Galactic City. And that was why he had decided to begin his operations as the new commander of the Galactic Alliance Guard by raiding Jobby Town. It was hard to seal off a neighborhood in a place like Coruscant. The intersections were three-dimensional and required six CSF Traffic Division repulsor lift ships for each Skylane junction that Jason needed to have blocked off. He stood on the platform of a military assault vessel, a matte gray gunship, not unlike its CSF counterpart, watching two of the CSF ships hover into position. It was still dark. The CSF vessels had no navigation light showing. Jason could only see them because the light pollution on Coruscant meant that Galactic City was never truly pitch black, and he could pick out the shape of the hull when it moved. Are you okay, Ben? Ben stepped forward. He hadn't said a word. He clutched his lightsaber hilt in one hand, and Jason sensed he was agitated rather than excited. He had changed irrevocably from a boy who found missions and adventure to a young man who had a healthy degree of fear in him. I'm fine, Jason. Comlink working? Ben fumbled with his right ear. Do I really have to wear it? You need to be able to hear what's going on between squads. You can't do that using the Force. Sometimes the non-Jedi solution to a problem was actually the easiest. I'm not even sure I can handle that much voice traffic yet. Jason turned to the five squads of soldiers of 967 Commando in the troop bay. Elite shock troopers whose specialty was siege busting and personnel retrieval. All of them hand-picked because they were Coruscant-born and bred and human with no possibility of secret sympathies with other worlds. Among them were volunteers from the CSS Anti-Terrorist Unit, selected and vouched for by Shavu. They would be loyal. Jason had come to value loyalty very highly lately. He couldn't see their faces behind their riot visors and sealed black helmets, but they exuded no more than a sense of concentration and a little apprehension of the level that was normal for troops going into battle. They didn't know exactly what lay behind the doors of the Corellian Quarter, but they knew they ran the risk of armed resistance and even explosives. On the other side of the Corellian district, Shavu stood by with more squads, ready to storm buildings to search, subdue, and arrest. At the ends of the walkways, more soldiers of 967 Commando slipped into position and trained rifles on doors, ready to stop anyone escaping. The sniper troops had moved into positions on the rooftops around the block. Jason opened the comm link, looped over his ear. Squad commanders, no discharge of weapons unless you're fired upon first. Shavu's voice cut in. 
Can I suggest we update that to unless we perceive a real and immediate threat, sir? Takes account of grenades and other weapons? I'm thinking like a pilot, like a Jedi, not like an infantry officer. A good idea, Captain. Revise that. There was a faint murmur on the net, as if troops had silenced their links for a moment, and then opened them again. They'd exchanged comments. They might have said that their commander was an idiot for not establishing better rules of engagement from the start of the mission planning. But it felt more like approval that he could listen to advice. The Force might not have been useful for communicating routine detail, but it was perfect for discerning mood. Jason felt it was time to roll. Most would be asleep. O400 was a good time to disorient humans and minimize resistance. Shavu had shown him medical data to confirm this, but pointed out that it never, ever worked on Wookiees. Stand by, said Jason. Ben's lightsaber sprang into life, the blue light illuminating the troop bay. The 967 sergeant crackled audibly as his armor systems created feedback in the assault vessel's public address system. He adjusted something on the side of his helmet. Silence descended. Around 2,000 people lived in this block of buildings, and Jason had 500 troops deployed. Not a good ratio, but it was enough to get the job done. The assault ship hovered level with the walkway, and he leapt down from the bay, followed by the 967, who spread immediately to stack either side of doorways. Above them, Jason could feel the adrenaline-fueled presence of roof teams and snipers. There was a second of profound stillness, like the pause of a pendulum before it swung back again. Go, 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 said Jason. The assault troops swung into the sky lanes on either side of the block, and their arrays of two hundred million lumen spot lamps turned the area into instant blinding daylight. The 967 sergeant behind him relayed his voice via the assault ship. This is Coruscant National Security. Stay where you are. I repeat, stay where you are. Jason felt the vibration in his teeth and sinuses. The canyon of walls on either side concentrated the sound. Officers will be entering buildings. Please cooperate. Be ready to show your identity passes. One or two doors had already opened, and some people stood on balconies in bathrobes, hands shielding their eyes against the ferocious white spot lamps. All along the walkways there was a chaos of yelled commands and hammering on doors. There was no open area to assemble detainees to sort the Corellians from other passport holders who happened to be on the block. So commandos were going into the buildings and assessing the occupants where they stood or taking them outside to stand against walls while their homes were swept for what had now simply become loosely termed as threats. People, devices, bad attitudes. They were all threats. Jason and Ben ran along the main walkway, lightsabers drawn, looking for where they might be needed. Around them, residents were already being led out of their homes, some silent and shocked, some swearing and struggling. Jason glanced back at Ben. His face was set in fixed concentration, wide-eyed, and made more shockingly white by the intense light. When he looked around, he could also see activity on the other side of the sky lane, where residents from the next block were starting to gather to watch the drama. This will be on HNE in minutes. Everyone's got a hall recorder these days. Never mind. I have nothing to hide. Galactic Guard, outside, now! Ahead of them, a squad of four 967 troops confronted a set of locked doors. They leapt back from the doorway, flattening themselves at either side of the entrance. Jason went to their aid. Ordnance, sir, said one of them. The voice was female. She held up the sensor readout. The nose, as they called it, attached to the back of her left gauntlet. It winked red and orange. The nose sniffed something, and the occupants aren't cooperating. Stand clear. Three inside. On the other side of the doorway, a commando with sergeant's insignia and the name Wirrit 
stenciled on his breastplate, held a thermal imaging scanner against the wall. His comrade stood back a few paces and snapped a gas grenade onto the muzzle of his rifle. If anything in there blows, sir, this isn't going to look pretty on HNE. You stand clear. Sergeant, I won't ask anyone to do what I won't do myself, said Jason. Show me the image. The sergeant, Weirit, turned the imager to face Jason. It had a pistol grip like a loud hailer. One end of the body a lens, and the other side a display that showed red on black. Three human shapes moving around in an area that was probably set one room back from the frontage, judging by the range shown on the display's grid. Ben, do you sense anything? Jason asked. What does it feel like to you? Ben's sense of danger was becoming very acute. This was a good time to hone it to perfection. He half closed his eyes in concentration. Dangerous, but not right now. Soon. Explosives, but not assembled? Is that what you feel? Yes, said Jason. He motioned Weirit back. Hold the gas, trooper. You want them immobilized? That's a general idea, sir, so they don't detonate anything. Fine. Jason took a breath, visualized the interior of the ground floor and the door, and focused himself on the three people inside. Sir... Jason didn't hear the rest. He sent a force jolt through all three targets simultaneously, paralyzing them. And a second later, the doors blew open, not with the punishing shock wave of a conventional blast, but the contained violence of the force. The squad of commandos threw themselves flat. It was the smart thing to do in an explosion, clearly ingrained by hard training. They froze, waiting for a shock wave that never came. Weirit got to his knees, and even if Jason couldn't see his face, he knew the man was grinning. Nice trick, sir, he said, and stood up, rifle ready, to ease through the torn gap that had been the front doors. Jason slipped in after him, followed by Ben and the rest of the squad. The three occupants of the house, a man in his thirties and two younger women, were crumpled on the floor of a back room, unconscious. Weirit crouched down and checked them for a pulse. Are they going to be okay? It's harmless and temporary, said Jason, just as shock to the spinal cord. You're going to put us out of business, sir, said the female trooper, R.E.B.J. I wish that were true, but I suspect you're going to be busier than ever. Jason watched as one of the squad held out his left gauntlet, following some trace. He was searching for the explosives. R.E.B.J.? Rapid entry by Jedi, sir. Very handy. You'll be in demand. The three detainees were brought out on makeshift stretchers. Around them on the walkway, half-dressed civilians and black-armored troopers milled about trying to load onto more assault ships that were settling down or hovering level with the pedestrian access. Just turned back an HNE speeder, sir, one of the troopers called to him. Consider this operation prime time. The night was lit well enough for news cams, too. Jason knew there was no such thing as a covert operation on this scale in a heavily populated city. Ben leaned close to him. There was a loud whump and the tinkling rain of shattering permaglass as the 967 used frame charges on an apartment block nearby to gain entry. Does that mean Dad will see what's happening? I believe so, said Jason. Oh, the only approval you need in your life is your own, Ben. Are you ashamed of anything you've done? Ben paused, lips parted, eyes slightly defocused. He was thinking about something very hard. Only of things I haven't done, such as. Not telling you about someone who tried to shoot a CSF officer. Jason could tell from Ben's voice that there was a lot more to it than that. He noted it mentally. We can talk about that later. Now go find a squad that needs assistance. Ben raced off, still clutching his lightsaber, the blue blade leaving a ghost image as he moved. Across the chasm of the sky lane, Jason could see the telltale flash of light from hollow recorders, as the neighbors opposite recorded the raid for posterity 
and, he had no doubt, for HNE. He considered sending every holocam plummeting hundreds of meters to the ground with a multiple force grab, but then decided he had to accept scrutiny. If you're not prepared to do something in public, don't do it at all. And the raid was as much a statement of intent to others as it was to root out terrorists. It had to be seen to be done. Jason made a point of not shutting down his lightsaber. Even under the savage glare of the spot lamps, it was another green beacon, another symbol of Jedi involvement in something most Coruscanti hadn't seen in two generations. This is what Jedi do, citizens. We act on your behalf. We don't just sit around and debate in our lovely new temple that you paid for. Ben had an earnest and brief conversation with a squad sergeant, and then stood back to wrench apart another set of doors using the force. The light within streamed out dramatically, a hemorrhage of yellow light in a dark space between two pools of blue-white spotlight. Force breaching caused a lot less damage than a detonite charge. Ben stood back to let the troops enter. Jason activated his secure comlink channel. Shavu, how are we doing? No fatalities so far, sir. Bangs and crashes of something heavy being handled interrupted the captain. Still more than 1,500 individuals to process, but the resistant targets have been neutralized and the rest appear to be compliant. Jason translated mentally. We kicked down a few doors and the rest have given up. Well done, Captain. The sight of lightsabers being wielded in a roundup of Corellians would not play well to the Jedi Council, Jason suspected. It was just the beginning. For a tempting moment, he wondered how his grandfather had felt in the transition to becoming loathed. But to force walk into time to find out would have meant first finding where that had taken place, and he didn't know. Jason also didn't know if he could face more revelations like the last one yet, but pain always had to be embraced sooner or later. Fleet Surplus Disposal Lot, Galactic City, Coruscant Captain Solo, are you sure we can't accompany you back to Corellia? C-3PO seemed reluctant to surrender the case of clothes to Han, as if hanging on to the handle would ensure that Han took him, too. Yeah, nobody would ever notice a golden droid. You'd be invisible. Han didn't like the smell of the small shuttle he'd bought from the government disposal lot. It was alien. He hadn't realized how much of that small detail of the Falcon was embedded in his sense of comfort. He flicked through the controls on the console and despaired at the maximum velocity shown on the readout. Stay here. Besides, you and Dartu can keep an eye on Jaina for us. Han, Leia's voice drifted from the small cargo bay. Honey, nobody has protocol droids like him any longer. He'd be a... Han, you need to see this. Han thought she'd found some mechanical fault he hadn't spotted when he handed over the credits. He made his way back aft to see her staring transfixed at the hollow screen in one of the coffin-sized cabins. Another bomb? he asked. It was a cramped space. He could hardly see the screen without squeezing past her and pressing his back against the aft bulkhead. Try bombshell. Han took a few moments to work out what he was looking at. Riot police. No. Soldiers in black armor were storming buildings, and the caption said, Jobby Town. Dawn raid on Corellian community. It was everything he expected from the Alliance. They were playing the Empire all over again, almost right down to the armor. Oh, you reckon this is going to shock me? Leia's mouth was slightly open, and her frown made her look as if she was close to tears. She held up her hand for quiet, and he saw it was shaking slightly. Jason, she said hoarsely. Han scanned the screen, expecting to see Jason injured or attacked. And then he saw his son, his little boy who had always had a soft heart, and who could feel pain for others, directing soldiers into buildings to drag out Corellians. 
In that way of terrible and unimaginable things, it didn't look real. His mind conjured up a scenario instantly. It was a vile piece of fake propaganda. It was Tracken's doing. It was a lie. But it wasn't. Leia put her hand to her mouth. Jason even had his lightsaber drawn. And he had Ben with him. Ben was taking part in the raid. Han couldn't speak. Honey, what's happening to him? Leia's voice was a whisper. How can he do this? She turned up the volume. The voiceover faded in, and all Han could take in were the words. Emergency powers have been granted for the internment of Corellian citizens resident in Galactic City. Han felt guilty that he saw not fellow Corellians being herded into assault ships, but himself being betrayed by his own son. You should be thinking of the bigger picture. You used to be able to do that, you self-centered bum. But as much as he tried to be altruistic, the horror and outrage that was replacing his shock was for himself and Leia. Not even Jaina. Now I know what she meant when she asked him if he was in trouble. All Han could think now was that they could be on the run from their own son, and that they'd be even less welcome back in Coronet if their identities were discovered. Three P.O.? Han called. Three P.O. When the Falcon's ready, fly her over to us any way you can. Get back to the apartment now and call Jaina. Tell her we'll talk to her later. We have to go. Got it? I have indeed got it, Captain Solo. Leia said nothing. She eased past Han and settled in the cockpit. When things were bad, she usually became very calm and decisive. It was a barometer of how serious a crisis they were facing. Ready to lift, she said quietly, checking the status readouts, as if she hadn't just watched her son turn into a monster on H.N.E. in front of the whole galaxy. Let's go. Chapter 10 To see a Jedi take up his lightsaber against civilians is shocking. But to see the son and nephew of the leader of the Jedi Council doing it is heartbreaking. Master Silgal, Jedi High Council Perimeter Fence, Arcanian Microtechnologies, Vohai, Parmel Sector, 1600 hours. The bigger companies grew, the more complacent their security became. Fat could remember when Arcanian Micro was a tough nut to crack. He knelt on one knee in the cover of bushes and used the scope of his EE-3 blaster to observe employees passing through the security gate. I could be useful, said the voice in his helmet comlink. Stay off this channel. Women can get access to places that men often can't. Myrta was persistent. Fat bristled. You'll spend the journey back in the cells if you don't shut up. She was still locked inside Slave One, hidden in the cover of a disused silo a kilometer away, confined to the crew section this time. She couldn't activate the ship's drives, but Thet had left a couple of comlink channels unguarded. If she was any good, she'd find them, and if she was double-crossing him, she'd use them, and then he'd know who she was working with. So far, all she had done was call him. Okay, she said, apparently unperturbed. I'll stand by. The only person Fett had ever trusted was his father. Neither of them was a natural team player. He could handle command when he had to, but he liked working alone, and the current task was at case in point. He could either talk his way into Arcanian Micro, or he could do what he did best— which was to observe, identify the weak point, infiltrate by force, and take what he needed. Talking wasn't his strong point. The staff moved in and out. A security guard on the gate and two sentinel droids scrutinized each individual going in and coming out, sweeping them with sensors. Arcanian Micro had once buried its most sensitive laboratories in the polar ice of the planet, 
but now it seemed to prefer the softer suburbs and landscaped business parks. Fat and lazy. It was cheaper to build on the surface. Vohai hadn't suffered at the hands of the Yuzhan Vong, and it had grown complacent. That was just what Fat needed. He liked companies with tough security best, though, because they provided a handy pointer to the target. You didn't protect what you didn't value most. Let's look for a few clues. Kaminoans wouldn't stroll out through the gates with a lunchbox under one arm. Kaminoans liked cold, wet gloom. Vohai was pleasantly sunny much of the year. Fat called up the aerial view of the micro-complex on his hut and worked out where he would place an office to ensure it had no natural light. The layout, as seen in the frame that Slave One scanners had grabbed before landing, showed a sprawl of building that was essentially a square core with a lot of thin arms radiating off it, and many courtyards. Humans, most species, in fact, liked bright natural light to work in. But you wouldn't want one of those nice courtyard offices, would you, town we? So somewhere in the square heart of the complex, not on the periphery or in the strings of buildings that ran from it, was a lab or an office that a Caminoan would feel at home in. Me too. Not the rain so much as the plain walls and the lack of clutter. He thought of the simple toys and his austere childhood home, and knew why possession seemed a burden he didn't really want. She's probably in there right now, building more clones. If she raises the alarm when she sees you, would you shoot her? Shoot someone old and weak. He set his visor to full-range magnification by tapping the control plate on his left forearm. He preferred that to the blink-activated HUD system, and tried to get a better line of sight into the security booth at the gate. They were bound to have some repeater system, Every security station needed to be able to communicate with the rest. That meant there might be an indication of floors below ground. From the air, only single-story buildings were visible. He needed to know if he faced a more complex layout once inside. It wasn't a good idea to get pinned down below ground level. Fett needed a better observation point. He looked around, calculating the angle of elevation he needed to get a clear view through the transparasteel window. If he sent a remote in closer, it would be spotted. He'd do this the old-fashioned way. Backing out of the bushes, he walked a hundred meters to the next lot and checked out the roof line. Fine. Plenty of flat-topped warehousing to choose from. He slipped between two buildings, took out his rappelling line, and then decided a simple burn with the jetpack would save his shoulders a lot of wear and tear. He was up on the roof in under three seconds, lying flat and peering down the scope of the blaster to get a better look inside the security booth. There was a status screen on the guard's desk, all right. He eased along to the far edge of the roof on his belly and racked up the scope's magnification. The image shimmered, unsteady at that range, but he could see a grid of white lines on a blue background, with green lights winking at points along the grid. Probably intruder sensors. There was nothing that indicated multiple layers. One level. So far, so good. The next step was to work out how the building was organized. And all that took was a little guesswork backed up by information that was usually public. Fat lowered himself from the roof on his rappel line, letting the pulley take the strain, flicked the cord clear, and settled down in the shelter of waste storage sheds to browse the local comlink directory system from his data pad. It was fascinating to see how much information one could put together just by seeing how companies listed their departmental comlink numbers. Names and numbers scrolled across the screen of his pad. Arcanian Microtechnologies, Deliveries, Personnel Services, Public Affairs and Investor Relations. He scrolled farther. What was Town Wee's specialty? Developmental Sciences and Education. 
Town Wee was an expert in human psychology. She knew enough about humans to make sure the ones the Kaminoans bred under the most unnatural conditions imaginable were conditioned enough to prevent them from becoming basket cases. She wouldn't be splicing DNA. She'd have brought her little case of data chips with her as some kind of employment dowry. And Microtech would have been glad to have that data. But her day-to-day -day work, the work she loved doing, was making sure clones didn't go crazy. Profiling, testing, flash teaching, accelerated socialization, giving clones the right attitude to be useful tools. Hi, town we. I hope you're enjoying your new job. Thad could have waited to see when she came out, almost certainly by vehicle, probably obscured from view, and followed her to wherever she called home. But it wasn't that much harder to walk in and find her. If he could get close enough to the building, he could use the penetrating terahertz radar sensor in his helmet's visor to look for a long body with pockets of low-density tissue. Quite distinct from a human radar profile, it could see through walls. Infrared couldn't. And it had been a long time since he had broken into a laboratory for data retrieval. A bounty hunter had to keep his skills sharp. Galactic Alliance Guard HQ Quadrant A-89 Galactic City 0830 hours Jason came out of the GAG briefing room to find Mara standing with her hands on her hips, as if he'd kept her waiting a little too long. She looked more under control than relaxed. Her expression was carefully neutral. But he could feel the fear in her and see the dark circles under her eyes. She stared. When did you start wearing a uniform? Jason glanced down at his black fatigues, hands held away from his sides. I should have changed before we carried out the raids. Jedi robes and police actions don't mix. You're telling me. Luke's going crazy. Emergency meeting of the High Council right now, in fact. I meant that all that loose fabric is... Never mind. Luke's reaction was predictable. Jedi couldn't be seen getting their hands dirty, and certainly not his son. You know why we wore robes originally? To fit in with the ordinary people. So I'm fitting in now, with my people. Mara indicated her own battle jacket. Sorry, Jason. It's just a shock to see you in that uniform. I'm a colonel now. I'm not arguing. I just wanted to talk to you before Luke finds you. Is Ben okay? He did very well. You want to see him? He's in the briefing room. We're just doing a wash-up with the squad leaders to work out what we'll do differently next time. And watching the news on the hour, of course. Mara managed not to raise an eyebrow. There's going to be a next time, then. You turned the job down. What did you think? That it was going to be dirty. It is. But churning through war after war because we don't ever fully deal with unrest is a lot dirtier. The briefing room doors slid open, and a corporal from 967 Commando, Le Kauf, stuck his head out. I say, you're on again, he said with a grin. Sorry, ma'am. H.N.E. News. Don't let me interrupt you, said Mara, just passing. Jason took her arm. Come in and meet my men. He wanted to reassure her about Ben. Unlike Luke, she didn't seem to want her son to be her little replica. She knew how to let go. She recoiled visibly at the sight of Ben in black fatigues. He was sitting at the table with Shavu and the sergeants, cup of calf in one hand and data pad in the other, and even his body language had suddenly become adult. He was mirroring the adult males around him without even realizing. When he stood up to greet Mara, it struck Jason that Ben would soon be as tall as he was. Ma'am, said Ben, all grave concentration. Not Mom, ma'am. I didn't sense you coming. I just dropped by to say that I watched the Hollow News and I wanted to see how you were feeling, said Mara. Are you all right, son? 
Yes, he isn't your sweetheart when he's in uniform, thirteen years old or not. Jason watched the unspoken interaction between them and detected the concern flowing both ways like a faint breeze. But whatever anxiety Mara had brought in with her had vanished and had been replaced almost completely by relief. Apart from getting up at 0200, I'm fine. You're getting so military, Mara managed to grin. You sure you're okay? Why shouldn't I be? It wasn't dangerous, like the assault on Centerpoint. Captain Shavu was watching my six. Jason found it touching that Ben had formed a bond with the 967. It boded well. Shavu was doing a fine job of stifling a smile, and his emotions, tired relief at the end of an operation and a pleasant affection for Ben, were probably obvious only to Jason's fine-tuned force senses. Here we go, said LeCalf, and turned up the audio on the briefing room's hollow screen. The image flashed up the tagline, Crackdown, at the bottom of the screen, and HNE anchors went into a recap of the morning's raid on Jobby Town. Four hours after the raids, the news emphasis had turned from the drama of hovering assault ships and commandos breaching doors to public reaction. Admiral Neothel contributed a 30-second defense of the GAG's actions. 967 Commando was, after all, now part of her special operations forces, but it didn't appear that defense was necessary. Jason, braced for a pobrium, was taken aback by the reactions of Coruscanti as for their opinion on the streets and walkways of Galactic City. It's about time, said one man in a business suit. I think Colonel Solo did what we should have done a long time ago. We're too scared of upsetting other governments. Well, Corellia, not any more, Mara murmured, faintly sarcastic. Oh, you've got fans. Didn't plan that. I know. I hope Luke sees it that way, too, said Jason, knowing that he wouldn't. And Admiral Neothel. I'll try convincing him. Jason beckoned her out of the way of the soldiers, who were staring fixedly at the news coverage with the air of men who knew that public perception was as much a part of the war as any weapon they carried. Tell me straight, Mara, are you still happy for me to be training, Ben? She brushed a loose strand of hair from her eyes in a way that suggested she was buying a few seconds of thinking time. Even Mara's wary of my reading her emotions. I think it's hard to accept that my little boy's turned into a soldier overnight. But that's something I should have seen coming when we wanted him to be trained as a Jedi. Jason still felt a flutter of hesitation around her. I know you're still troubled by all this. Okay, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. Mara's eyes were fixed on his now. Is there someone in your life who's causing you some pain? I don't understand. He really didn't. A woman. Jason, I'm not prying. I just need to know if you're having a difficult time. He thought of Tenelka and Alana. He hardly dared do that these days, in case Lumia sensed his secret and they were put in danger. More danger than they were already in. Yes. It was so true that it hurt. There's someone I would like to be with that I can't. Mara exuded pure relief. The frown lines between her eyebrows vanished, and she almost smiled. That's all I needed to know, Jason. I'm sorry you're having problems. I won't mention it again, but if I can do anything, you let me know, okay? Jason nodded. He couldn't imagine anything that Mara could do. But it was comforting to know she was willing. Thanks, Mara. He said, you're probably about my only friend these days. She shrugged and waved discreetly to Ben before disappearing through the doors. Jason could guess what was happening in the council chamber without using his force senses to listen. He'd let the side down. Jedi didn't raid people's homes with black-clad shock troopers. A Jedi's job is to solve a problem without taking lives. I think I did that today. Sitting back and not getting involved while people get killed in an endless cycle of wars 
doesn't count as not having blood on your hands. Jason was jerked out of his thoughts by a cup of calf being thrust in front of him. I don't think things are quite that bad, sir. It was Corporal LeCalf, young, sandy-haired, and solidly optimistic. Jason accepted the calf, and they both stood watching the HNE coverage of the raids again. The outraged reaction from the Corellian ambassador and senators, and the imminent threat of severing diplomatic relations. I'm never sure if all this is aimed at Coruscant to the Alliance, said LeCalf. Separating the two is a real political conjuring trick. I'd rather see more unity than separation, sir. Me too. Jason found he enjoyed the company of 967. They all had the corporal's general optimism. How long have you been in the Army? Since I graduated, sir. Four years. What made you sign up? LeCalf smiled, almost embarrassed. My grandfather served under your grandfather in the Imperial Army, sir. He always talked about how Lord Vader put himself in the front line. Meant a lot to him, that did. Jason patted LeCalf's shoulder. It was humbling to see how loyalty could last generations. Whatever sins Anakin Skywalker had committed as Vader, there were still those who recognized his qualities as an inspirational commander. Jason decided it might be safe to walk back in time and watch him again. He wasn't repeating his mistakes. He was simply building on Anakin Skywalker's missed opportunities. Let's make our grandfathers proud, then. Der Gedgen's house, Coronet Corellium. That Gedgen kid didn't seem quite so pleased to see Han this time. You going to invite us in? Han filled his doorway, Blaster held at his side, and Gedgen stared at it wide-eyed. We're feeling kind of unwelcome out here. Gedgen stood back, eyes still on the blaster, as Han and Leia slipped into his hallway. Han flicked on the safety. Where have you been? asked Gedgen. We ran into a well-wisher and had to make a run for it, said Leia. And before you ask, yes, we know what's happening on Coruscant. Sal Solo is having a field day with it. Two small children emerged behind Gedgen and he shooed them back into the room. The solo son imprisoning innocent Corellians. Inspiring headlines. Han snorted. I'm glad I don't shock easy. Does this mean he's changed the contract on me to read Extra Dead? Us, Leia muttered. Gedgen ushered them into his front room, and Han noted that the blinds were drawn. Where are you staying? Han didn't sit down, despite the mute offer of a chair. That's our little secret. Okay. Gedgen didn't appear offended. Paranoia seemed a normal part of political life. My sources say there's more than one taker for the contract. Fat doesn't play well with others. I told you it wasn't fat, said Leia. Fat or no fat. Captain Solo, the threat is real. And while we're appalled at what your son appears to be doing, Thrak and Sal Solo is pursuing his line for his own ends, not Corellia's. So as far as we're concerned, we still have common cause. Who's we? The Democratic Alliance. We understand how hard it is for you. You think? You're here, aren't you? We know you put Corellia first. I'm going to deal with Thrak and myself, thanks. We can't be seen to do that, of course. But we can probably give you useful support. You load the blaster and I fire it. Yeah, I get the idea. I just need times, locations, and access. Han was aware of Leia staring at his back, a kind of sixth sense that owed nothing to the Force and everything to more than thirty years of marriage. He turned slowly, expecting to see a weary frown of disapproval, and saw only wide-eyed resignation. Sometimes she looked just the way she had when he first met her. Just keep feeding me information about Thracken's location, said Han. Your party representatives have access to that, right? When he's taking part in government business, yes. Itineraries, meetings, that kind of detail. Good. So what's your plan? Han gave him a slow, wary smile. 
If I told you that, you wouldn't be able to deny involvement, would you? Gedgen went to a desk in the corner of the room and took a data chip from a drawer. Floor plans, he said. Government buildings. They're not illegal, just only available for inspection in libraries and civic offices. They might be useful. Consider me a librarian. Dear, said Leia, if I can sell Solo were to fall from power, would your party be in a position to form an emergency government? Gedgen was now focused totally on Leia. That was what really interested him, the seizure of power. Han chose not to be offended. With my colleagues, the Corellian Liberal Front, and those in the Centerpoint Party who'd like a change of leadership, yes. So that's how a coup happens. In some guy's living room while his kids are playing in another room. Hey, you're telling everyone my cousin's days are numbered. If you think you're the first person this year to come up with the idea of neutralizing him, you'd be very much mistaken, said Gedgen. Corellia doesn't want to be his personal toolbox any longer. We'll keep contact to a minimum, Leia interrupted, and we'll keep changing our comlink code. I hope the next time we meet is when the crisis has passed. Leia herded Han out into the street, and they walked a tortuous path to the center of Coronet, doubling back on themselves to check that they weren't being followed. There was a lot of air traffic heading into the spaceport, and a general buzz of tension in the city itself. It felt like a world bracing itself for the worst. They came into the main boulevard where the apartment rental office was located. They'd leased something small and anonymous in the center of town, Han decided. Something nobody would expect the Solos to want to live in. It's just like old times again, living on the edge. Do you think Gedgen's cronies are setting me up to do their dirty work? He asked. What, that the assassination contract is a ruse? Leia shook her head. You heard Jason. You saw the hollow news. And there's the small business of the guy we shoved out the airlock. Oh, yeah, him. I'm not encouraging you to do this. But you haven't told me not to. I'm not making your decisions for you, Han. I'm your wife, not your mother, Leia said. But you're a Jedi, too. It sounds like a case of self-defense to me. Not a coup. That's a separate issue. Diplomacy's a fascinating spectator sport, Han said. It's about managing the inevitable with minimum loss of life. Yeah, ours. Han cared about Corellia in that abstract way people did when their home, even their unhappy home, was being attacked by outsiders. He'd never thought of himself as a patriot. He simply felt Corellian to the core. But there was one thing that still drove him above all others, and that was Leia and the kids. Thraken doesn't stand a chance of taking three Jedi, said Leia, as if she did a little telepathy on the side. It's you I'm worried for. Jedi have been known to get killed. It's not very gracious of me, but I kind of wish Jason had shot him after all. You and me both. The rental agency office was crowded when Han and Leia reached it. There was a line of people, some with young children, some elderly, waiting with bags and cases of varying sizes. You just arrived from Coruscant, too, said the harassed-looking woman at the main desk. Well, Han didn't get the impression that she recognized him as public enemy number one. Yeah, we just got in. You're ahead of the rush, then. She handed him a data pad. Register your details. We've only got one bedroom apartments left. Will that be okay? Han glanced at Leia. We just want a roof over our hands, she told the woman. We're all shocked at what's happening on Coruscant, ma'am. But you're safe now. Who'd have thought it? Han Solo's son, too. Yeah, we're shocked, too, said Han, and meant it. They signed a lease as Jav and Laura Kabadi, and found themselves disguised quite by accident as just one couple in the first wave of Corellians fleeing Coruscant to avoid internment. The irony wasn't lost on them. 
Nice timing, son, Han muttered. Senate Chamber, Coruscant. Emergency debate on internment policy. Jason sat next to Neothel on the Mon Calamari delegates platform and listened to Corellia's Senator Char haranguing Chief Omus about the abuse of human rights on Coruscant and the lack of consultation with the Senate. We have no option but to withdraw our ambassador, said Char. Is that Coruscant or the Alliance we're talking about? Omus asked. Char hesitated. Isn't that one and the same, Chief of State? I think the Honorable Representative for Corellia understands that the action I took was to ensure the safety of Coruscant citizens, which is a responsibility given to me by the Coruscanti local authority, and so does not require sanction by the Senate. So which entity do you wish to withdraw representation from? There was a general murmur of support, but significant scoffing from some of the Outer Rim delegates. Omus stood his ground. At the moment, Corellia's allies were a minority, but that would change unless they were given a good reason not to line up behind him. How do you feel about that blockade, Admiral? Jason asked quietly. Senatorial platforms detached from the walls of the massive chamber and hovered into the void between them for delegates to deliver impassioned but non-committal speeches against terrorism and the need for unity. Are you asking if I could mount one now? I'm assuming you can. Do you still favor one? Yes, because that's the most robust stance I can persuade the Senate to allow. "'And blockades are very flexible responses,' Neothel said. "'If it were carried out on behalf of the Alliance, that is. "'We live in a world of blurred lines.' "'The debate was remarkably subdued, all things considered. "'Jason began to wonder if the backlash he had expected "'was actually his fear of the Jedi Council's opinion. "'If anything, he appeared to be popular.' That didn't make him comfortable. He wanted to remain aloof from anything that might sway him. And even a Jedi could enjoy being liked a little too much. Jason and Neothel joined Domus in the Chief of State's cabinet room, where Senator Gassil was already waiting. Omus didn't look happy, and sat down at the head of the lapis and laid table with slow deliberation. Well, let's be grateful today's events went as well as they did. Gasil looked up. Where are we housing the internees? Just over half of them had Corellian passports in the end, so we've put them in an old barracks block for the time being, said Neothel. The rest were allowed to return to their homes. The question is how far we plan to go with this, because we have a lot of Corellian citizens resident here. And if we have to intern them all by force, it's going to be a labor-intensive job. Immigration reports growing numbers looking to leave. I'm getting very uneasy about this, Admiral, said Omus. The images on HNE might have played well to the jingoistic element on Coruscant, but it reminded a lot of us of imperial excesses. You authorized the action. Neothel fixed Omus with that head-tilted stare. What did you expect it to remind you of? Jason cut in. Neothel had dispensed with any pretense of disinterest in Omus's job the moment she had been appointed Supreme Commander. She was going for broke. We're simply doing the same as the terrorists, except we cause no serious casualties, said Jason. A small action creating a disproportionately large impact— this is as much a propaganda war as anything. You planned to scare Corellians out? Neothel lowered her voice. No. We planned to make it clear we would deal with threats to the population of Coruscant. And that's why you go in and do your own sleight of hand, is it? Omus was addressing his remarks to Neothel, even though it had been Jason's operation. One massive overreaction makes it look as if you have the whole situation under control. 
If that's how you want to see it, Chief Omus, yes, Jason answered. It's me you're dealing with, not any awful. No deaths. A reassured public. A clear statement to any who want to kill and maim civilians that they won't be tolerated. Removing truly dangerous individuals from our streets, and also sending a message that if Corellia can be stopped from pursuing a destructive path at the expense of the common good, then any world can. Or would you rather let the enemies within erode our society? These are people who are happy to accept the benefits of being a Coruscant resident, an Alliance citizen, but don't want the effort of being loyal to it. If that's my sleight of hand, then I'll sleep soundly tonight. Omus looked about to speak, but simply glanced down at his hands, as if making a conscious effort not to respond. He was too wily a politician to take on both Jason and Neothel in front of Gassel. If he lost, Gassel would smell blood. If you'll excuse me, I have to talk to the Corellian embassy. Omus stood up and walked to the doors. I'd appreciate a schedule of your next operations in advance. Gassel watched him go. It's always a shame when HNE isn't here to record a really great speech. No, Senator, that's not the game I'm playing. You have no idea, do you? No idea at all. You might be surprised to know I meant every word, said Jason. I know what a war looks like, and I want this one to be the last one. Gassel seemed to take his comment as youthful sincerity. Now there's a wish with a lot of meanings, he said. Let me go and call Momus down. He's finding it hard to adjust to Jedi who aren't nice, tidy parts of the High Council. Funny how we can attack Corellian territory without turning a hair, but we lose our nerve when we kick down a few doors on our home turf. I never wanted to take on the Jedi Council, but nobody here can see anything except in terms of personal ambition. Are we both after the same job? Neotho asked Jason. It was always hard to tell if a moon calamari was joking. Jason sensed that there was a tinge of amusement in her mind, but not much. I don't want to be a politician, he said. You'd make a fine chief of state, but I wouldn't. Neothel's mood changed like the sun coming out, and Jason felt relaxed goodwill and respect. He'd meant what he said. She'd taken it as a deal struck between them. What job do you want, then? The Jedi Council. Oh, not that. She was already seeing him as a rival to Luke. From a political point of view, it had its own inevitability, but she couldn't have known that the Jedi didn't feature in his plans at all. I'm not even a master. He had a moment of cold clarity, in which he saw exactly what he wanted, and it stood outside him, a vision to observe and not be part of. What I want is for the trillions of ordinary people in the galaxy to be able to get on with their lives, knowing that it's being run by a stable form of government. The vast majority of folk just get smashed by the fallout from the power struggles of a handful. I want to see that stop. I want to see power meaning duty, service, not a prize. Neotho adjusted her tunic, straightening the braid fastening. Well said. For someone whose whole family is an elite, you have a refreshingly military take on the exercise of power. Jason had cut free from his attachment to a heroic reputation, but it was comforting to be reassured that he wasn't deluding himself. He savored a small moment of relief and dreamed of a secure galaxy for Tenoka and Alana. Chapter 11 Chief of State Cal Omas Today authorized new emergency measures to crack down on continuing unrest in Galactic City. Corellian passport holders now have 48 hours to report to their local CSF precinct and opt for repatriation or face internment. The move has been condemned by Senate representatives from Altir 5, Obridan, and Katrasi. 
Meanwhile, anti-terror squads raided homes in the Adur Quarter overnight and seized explosives and busties. Ten men and three women have been charged with conspiracy to cause explosions. HNE Lunchtime News Bulletin Arcanian Microtechnologies Headquarters, Voheim If there was a weak point in any perimeter, Boba Fett would find it. And he had. He watched a small bird, a hummer, bright scarlet, perch on the top of the four-meter-high perimeter fence that ran for six kilometers around Arcanian Micro's headquarters, and noted that there was no reaction from the guards in the gatehouse. There was no point having a security system so sensitive that birds could set it off, and if a bird could get over that fence, then so could Fat. Security cams didn't cover much beyond a hundred meters around each guarded gate. It all depended on the sensors that detected entry at any unsupervised point along or over the fence, and that was a weak point for a man with a custom disruptor. The sensors projected a slim, movement-sensitive ellipse along the entire cross-section of the fence, generated from ground level and extending two meters on either side of it. And, if the sweep from orbit by Slave One scanners was correct, two hundred meters above it to thwart aerial incursions, or intruders with jet packs, of course. Fat didn't take that personally. But the sensors didn't react to small objects. Fett stood back from the two-meter line and took two long wires with gription clips. He cast one like an angler, looping it out from shoulder height, just as he had when fishing for devies from the landing pad of his Tipica City home as a kid. The clip snapped onto the mesh of the fence, insubstantial as a hummer. Then Fett cast the other wire two meters along the fence, attaching a second gription clip. He now had two long lines that enabled him to attach his disruptor without breaching the sensor field. Standing inside the bite of the wires, he plugged them into the casing of the disruptor and pressed the key. He was now as good as inside. As far as the detection system could tell, there was an unbreached perimeter. The wires were effectively a loop in the fence, and the bypass section of fence itself didn't exist. Fat adjusted the controls of his jetpack and soared over the fence, landing carefully within the bypassed zone. He memorized the section, visible only by looking for the gription clips. The palm-sized disruptor itself nestled unobtrusively in the grass beyond. Fat sprinted to the cover of the wall and jetted to the flat roof. Normally he would have fired his grappling hook and climbed, but speed mattered now. It was worth the extra jetpack fuel. He lay on his belly and crept across the roof, his visor almost touching the gravelly surface as the penetrating radar scanned for people within. It was a huge area to cover. He pressed a medical sound sensor, more sensitive than the military ones, to the roof to pick up what signal he could. From the sound of the conversation immediately below him, a woman recording someone's educational details, he had landed over the personnel department, and he was still crawling across offices that had external windows. Town Wee would be somewhere far from daylight, right at the center. It took him more than two hours to edge his way across what seemed to him a featureless charcoal-gray cinder plain, listening for clues to what lay beneath and watching the radar outlines of bodies moving. He hoped that the disruptor would still be there when it came time to leave, but if it wasn't, it would be far easier to make a run for it on the way out than on the way in. This is really hurting my hips and my chest. Fat lifted his body slightly and took his weight on his knees and elbows. He heard the clink of glass dishes and the whoosh and ump of chiller cabinets opening and closing. He saw people sitting, probably at a long bench, and others clustered around a table. The outlines of the inorganic objects were almost impossible to make out, 
but he was used to assembling a mental image from the scant cues provided by the movement and shape of bodies. He'd seen a few labs in his time. He knew how town we liked hers laid out. When she'd had a leg cloned for him a few years before, her typical laboratory had still been just like it was when he was a kid, and she had first shown him around. He heard the occasional word that sounded like a conversation about a scanning microscope. Could mean anything, but I'm over the labs, that's for sure. Next vent I find, next point of entry, I'm going down there. He checked the chrono readout in his helmet, shifting his focus and feeling the beginning of a headache. Three hours, too slow. The longer he took, the more vulnerable he was to discovery. You don't quit now, Fett. And then he heard it. Just a couple of words. It wasn't even anything from which he could derive meaning. But he knew that tone, that pitch, so very well that it was like hearing his own name whispered in a crowded, noisy room. Everything else fell silent as his brain filtered out all irrelevance. It was Town Wee's fluting, gentle voice. He forgot the raw ache in his sternum and felt the adrenaline course through his body, erasing every pain. Gotcha. He frame-grabbed the coordinates in his HUD got to his knees, and scouted around for an air vent. There was a biohazard containment opening fifty meters across the roof, the kind of hatch that a hazmat team would use to enter the building if it was ever contaminated and sealed, and he knew it would yield to the lock overrides on his wristband. He hadn't met a lock, seal, or panel that didn't, and it was designed to take someone wearing a full hazmat suit. For once, his jetpack wasn't an encumbrance, as he took a security blade from his shin pocket to bypass the breech alarm and opened the hatch. He slid down the vent and found himself standing in a chamber with two doors leading off it. Both were locked. When he switched to his HUD's normal vision, the glow around him was that dull amber emergency lighting, and a safety notice on the wall read, Last inspected, six eight one thirty six. He adjusted his helmet's sound sensors and listened. The corridor outside was clear. A quick flick back to the terahertz radar scan confirmed it. He made his way down the corridor, checking as he went, following the occasional sound of Town Wee's voice, until he found himself outside an office with two shapes visible inside on his helmet scanner. One, dense human body, and a Kaminoan one, with its characteristic abdominal spaces. Fat ducked into the nearest alcove, a fire control station, and waited for the human to leave. Eventually, the doors opened and a woman left. The lock panel at the side of the doors flashed again, but Fat slid a blade from his override system into the slot, and the doors parted with a whisper. He took the precaution of locking them behind him. Leaning over the desk, a tall creature with a long, graceful neck and small, round, gray head was engrossed in work at a data screen. Town Wee didn't turn around. Please leave the file in the tray. Nice place you got here. Kaminoans never showed emotion, but the speed with which Town Wee whipped around and the way her head jerked back on seeing him told him she was surprised. Popa? Oddly, there's only one. How did you find me? It's my job, remember? Fat walked slowly across the room and propped his backside on the edge of her desk. He lifted his helmet. Let's say I followed the money. Koane sent you to— No, he wants the data back, but that's not why I'm here. Town Wee stared into his face, blinking slowly. She knew him about as well as anyone alive, and that wasn't a long list. She looked old, very old. Are you all right, Boba? Is your leg functioning properly? No. In fact, my whole body is giving me a few problems. Can I be of help? 
I'm suffering from tissue degeneration, liver problems, autoimmune diseases, tumors. My doctor says I have a year or so to live if I'm lucky. He reached in his belt for a data chip. Take a look at the tests. Town Wee took the chip with long, thin fingers and slid it into her data port. Ah, she said, I see. She got up and went to a cabinet, and Fett's natural mistrust of the galaxy kicked in. If she could run out on her own government, she could betray him. He clicked his blaster just as a warning. Town Wee turned slowly and glanced at the blaster. Do you think I would wish to draw attention to the fact that you tracked me down and gained access to my secure office? You stole data and defected. Never had you down for that kind, either. Did I ever care about Town Wee? I think I did. Fat thought that it was funny how you never truly recalled how you felt as a child, except for the defining moments. And he was defined by his love of his father, and he knew it, and he was proud of it. When the idea occurred to him that it was all he was, he shook it off. I miss Dad every single day, every single minute. I want to live up to him. Fat motioned Town Wee to sit down with the barrel of his blaster. She settled in the chair, hands clasped, and didn't react at all. No fear, no surprise, no affection. She was ice, control, indifference. You brought me up, more or less. Boba, she said. She still had that soothing musical voice. He wasn't sure how long Kaminoans lived, but she had to be coming to the end of her life. I regret that I don't have the skills to help you. You're the nearest I ever had to a mother, and that scares me sometimes. I guessed as much, said Fett. I just want your data. And some information. She's completely cold. I was just another experiment she was pleased with. My data belongs to Arcanian Micro. The data belongs to the Kaminoan government. But seeing as they aren't paying me, I'll take it to cover my expenses. I can't hand it over. So I'll take it. Fett slipped the data breaker from a pouch on his belt and flipped it over in his left hand. He selected the docking interface that fit Arcanian Micro's computer system. The device had a dozen different plugs that rotated into position on a wheel. Or copy it, anyway. I don't plan to sell it. Yet. Town Wee blinked slowly. She had the eyes of the Kaminoan ruling class. Gray, not yellow. Not low-caste blue. It will ruin Arcanian Micro. Tough. And it will ruin me. Do you feel no compassion for me, Boba? No, I don't believe I do. Not now. Town Wee appeared to be considering the revelation, head tilting slowly from side to side on the long column of her slender neck, like a tree swaying in a breeze. He wondered if that reaction was just her expertise in human psychology taking a knock. She didn't know his mind as well as she thought. She still reminded him of a Nara artist, a Kaminoan mime dancer. He'd always been baffled by Nara as a kid, because Kaminoans didn't feel a thing, and yet they loved a kind of ballet that mimed emotions they didn't appear to have. That summed up their lives. And his, he realized. Time for analysis later. Get to work. Still holding his blaster on the scientist, Fat took three paces to the computer console and slid the data breaker into the port. The device sparkled with blue and green status lights to show that it was searching and downloading, and he let it gather a lot more data than he needed. He wasn't a thief, but other Arcanian micro data might come in handy and even save his life. He was just taking custody of a copy of it. I don't make deals, he said. The status bar indicated that 5,000 exabytes of data had been swallowed whole. Complete genomes took a lot of memory. But here's a promise. Tell me all you know about Kosai, and I won't hand this data over to the highest bidder. 
That'll make sure you're still of use to Arcanian Micro. She's dead. I still want to know everything. Town Wee paused for a moment, blinking slowly at the blaster. Are you going to take me back to Camino by force? No, I don't need the credits. But would you kill me, Boba? He paused. For this I would. Yes. She still seemed puzzled, not hurt or afraid or betrayed. Very well. Kosai thought the cloning program would be destroyed. So she defected to the Separatists during the Battle of Camino to save her life's work. And her own skin. We are not materialistic, Boba. It was not about payment. It was about pride. About excellence. Fett slipped the data breaker back in his belt. Get on with it. Where did she go? I have no idea where her journey took her next. What happened to her? She was traced. By who? Another pause. Whatever it was, it was giving town we problems. Clone intelligence unit, and one of your father's commando instructors? Fat swallowed hard. He hadn't expected that. And? She indicated the braided Wookiee pelts strung from his right shoulder plate. She fell prey to the Mandalorian penchant for souvenirs. Interesting, said Fat. No, it's astonishing. It's terrifying. It's hope. It's everything. So the clones got their revenge. We assumed so. Packages arrived. Parts of a Kaminoan body whose genetic profile was Kosai's. Fett found that unnecessarily brutal. Kill a prisoner if you were paid to. Kill them if you needed to. Even retrieve parts if you had to. But mailing Kosai home a piece at a time sounded like a vengeful, elaborate message. And her data? We can only assume they took that, too. It has never been recovered. What was special about it? Kosai's triumph was controlling the aging process. She knew how to manipulate it better than any other biologist. We were interested only in accelerating it to mature clones faster. But I can see how many would find slowing the process and its therapeutic potential an attractive commodity. She claimed she was able to achieve it in the laboratory. Myrta had met an original Camino clone, she claimed. A clone who couldn't, shouldn't, be alive today. Fett found a slew of puzzle pieces dumped in his lap, all fitting together. Impossible clones, dismembered Kaminoan scientist, missing cloning data. You got any names? Town Wee stiffened. Do you remember that aggressive little human called Skirata? The one who threatened my colleagues with a knife so frequently? Yes, he remembered Cal Skirata, all right. Sometimes his father swore he was the best of the bunch. Sometimes he just swore at him and lashed out. Django Fett rarely lost his temper, but Skirata had a talent for making that happen. He was ferociously and uncompromisingly Mandalorian. As a lonely kid on Camino, Fett had narrowly escaped being forced to learn Mandoa from Skirata's wildly unpredictable special forces trainees. Six clone dark troopers who answered only to him. They were intelligence units, the Nulls, as everyone called them, the first batch of clones, and they had turned out crazy, hyper-smart, and dangerous. They had disappeared when the war ended. Yes, this was a neat pattern. Skirata lived for his clones. He'd want them to live out full lives like ordinary men. He would have wanted Kosai's data and expertise very badly. Butchering her to get the genetic technology he needed to stop the accelerated aging would have been nothing to him, just a means to an end. And if one of Skirata's clone troops was still alive and fully active today, when he should have been the equivalent of a 140-year-old, it meant that they'd found a way to stop the accelerated aging process, Kosai's way.
That's what I need. That will save my life. Fat was suddenly enveloped in a sensation of vivid awareness, like a pleasantly cool shower on a hot day. The colors around him seemed instantly vibrant, the sounds crystal clear, the smells sharp. Adrenaline coursed through him. He'd found what he was looking for, or the route to it, at least. He'd never failed to track a bounty. Never. Even if a few had escaped in the end, he had always found them. I'll find you, too. Useful, said Fent. Holding the blaster level was making his forearm ache. He'd never felt that before. You keep quiet about this, and I'll keep this data to myself. Got it? Agreed, said Town Wee. And if, when you find Kosai's data, we would give you an excellent fee for its return. He suddenly thought of Sintas, her eyes brimming with tears of joy as she held baby Aelin. No, Town Wee couldn't possibly care about him like a real mother. Town Wee's first thought was for her science. Maybe I don't want to sell it, said Fat. What do you plan to do with your legacy? What? You're dying. And even if you succeed in finding Kosai's data, and it can help you, then you still face the question of what legacy you will leave behind. Why does that worry you? I believe it was a concern to your father. He told Count Dooku that he did not want a son. He wanted an apprentice to be Jaster's legacy. That stung. Maybe Town Wee didn't mean it the way it sounded. He remained deadpan and wished he had kept his helmet on. Jaster Mareel was more than Dad's mentor. He was a father. That seemed to mean nothing to Town Wee. And what is that legacy? To be Mandalore. To make sure Mandalorians survive, whatever happens. And I'll live up to my father's pledge just as he did before me. Town we remained glacial. We will exceed any offer. Dad was always looking back at Jester Mareel, feeling he had to live up to him. Maybe I was a second chance to do that. I'll let you know. Jester's legacy. Bevin's got a point. More Mandalore, less business. Maybe she said it to wound him. No, Kaminoans didn't care about anything, even if they were almost your mother. He put on his helmet and turned to leave. Would she raise the alarm? She wouldn't want anyone to know that her data had been compromised. All she cared about was her work, as she always had, and that would buy her silence. If Arcanian Micro ran any security checks, they would find nothing missing, and no botched attempts at slicing their system. It was between him and Town Wee. I would like to know if you find Kosai's research and if it cures you, she said. Fett resisted the urge to ask if that was personal or professional concern. If I'm still around in a couple of years, you will. He left the way he had come in, crawling back up the hazmat access hatch with the aid of his grappling hook and covering the distance to the edge of the roof in a rapid crawl. The disruptor clips were still in place. Checking around him, he jetted over the fence, released the clips, and as far as the fence sensors were concerned, he had never been there. Slave One's ramp lowered via his remote helmet link, and he stepped up it wondering why he clung so fiercely to his father's ship. It was a wonderful vessel, but it meant more to him than just the best his fortune could buy. I'm in my seventies now, and I've only just started to be more than someone's son. Doesn't mean I love you any less, Dad, but I can't look back forever. Boba Fett wasn't certain what would fill that void and show him his purpose in life, but he knew now that it lay ahead of him and not behind him, frozen in memories. He stood in front of Slave One, an icon of his childhood, and wondered where the line between trademark and trap was drawn. So you didn't trash the cockpit, he said, opening the conversation for once. 
Myrta was wiping the console. It looked remarkably shiny. Fat kept a clean, well-maintained ship, but this time it looked polished. Did you get what you came for? she asked. He kicked Slave One into life and lifted her clear, looping under the monorail that snaked two kilometers above Vohai's surface. I did. What now? Fat took refuge behind his visor. He was torn now. He needed to find that impossibly old clone, and he wanted to see Aelin, and he wanted to know how Sintas had died. Myrta knew, or claimed to know, all three answers. Sintas's fate now wasn't urgent, and he could find Aelin for himself, because he could find Han Solo, and where Solo was, Aelin would follow. So he needed to track that clone of Skiratas. Even if he didn't have Kosai's data, he might be good for a tissue sample that a Kaminoan could examine and reverse-engineer. Still too many uncertainties. Still too many variables. Fett decided it was time to reveal his interest, but carefully. Where did you run into that clone? Coruscant. It seemed to be a regular trip for him. Myrta stared straight ahead as usual. So where are we heading? To find Han Solo, because that'll lead me to Avon. He staged a conversational diversion. You've got the necklace. You tell me where we're heading. Myrta took the leather cord from her neck and stared at the shimmering stone in her palm. Let's try Coruscant. Aha. Uh -huh. Fat had never taught Aelin anything about bounty hunting, but she had obviously learned that you could often hide better on a planet that was one vast city of a trillion people than you ever could in a cave up a mountainside on the outer rim. Fat laid in a course for the galactic core. Zero, zero, zero. Slave One was about to make the jump to hyperspace when the comlink console flashed impatiently in front of him. The point of origin said Corellia, even if the sender had tried to disguise the source with multiple relays. Fett didn't get a lot of calls from Corellia, and when he did, they usually weren't the kind that he wanted to take in front of Mir to Gav. Time to eat, he said. Get back aft and see what you can find in the stores for us. Myrta obeyed in silence, without a hint of dissent on her face. It was the response of someone used to following orders, not a woman who spent her time in the kitchen. Okay. Not insulted by that, are you? Myrta looked at him as if he were mad. My father was Mandalorian, so I can fight and cook. Fat realized how little he knew about the small details of his own culture. Next time he saw Bevin, he'd ask the man to explain all that. He waited for Myrta to close the internal hatch behind her, and then switched the call to a secure circuit. Fat here. Make it fast. There was a slight pause. And this is Traken Sal Solo, Corellian head of state. I've got a proposal for you. Squadron Training Section Airspace, Sentex 2 The XJ-7 below Luke jinked to port and fell away beneath him with astonishing speed. Even for him, Jaina Solo was a serious challenge in aerial combat. Or maybe I'm slowing down. Luke throttled his own XJ-7 into a dive, plummeting into the moon's canyons in pursuit of Jaina. He'd thought she'd had enough flight time recently not to need to sharpen her skills. But when Jaina said she was returning to active service, she meant it. She went on exercises with the squadron, just like the new intake, colonel or not. It was a live fire exercise, too. Some of the pilots had never been shot at for real. It tended to change their perspective of warfare. Beneath them, on the valley floor, a droid anti-aircraft battery let loose with ion cannons. The red bolts of energy soaring up at him seemed to merge into a single field, with the red halos of the XJ-7's engines, as Jaina zipped between the bolts, rolling instantly through 180 degrees to narrow the fighter's profile, 
and sending a stream of fire into the ion cannons. She leveled out at the bottom of the canyon behind the battery, and Luke dropped down behind her, shaving the canyon floor so closely that the downdraft from the XJ-7 threw up a cloud of tiny pebbles that hammered under the fuselage. Luke sent a volley of fire after her, aiming a few degrees wide of her starboard wings. The canyon wall spat plumes of pulverized rock in her path, and she skimmed over it. She broke calm silence, which wasn't like her. Don't play, Uncle. It won't help me. He realized he could have taken a serious shot, and he still might not have hit her. But he couldn't fire in earnest on his niece, even if he knew she could almost certainly evade it. It was the almost he didn't like. I'm breaking, he said, and climbed sharply to level out at a cruising altitude. See you back at the mess. Sentax 2 was a sterile moon with the usual sprawl of military facilities, arranged like a warehouse floor covered in boxes. The base would win no prizes for architecture. If war broke out for real, and Luke always found the for real proviso painfully ironic, then it would switch overnight from a training squadron to an operational air station. The switch seemed close to being thrown. Luke lifted the canopy of the XJ-7 and climbed out of the cockpit to slide down the ladder wheeled into position by ground crew. I used to do that a lot faster, too. He waited at the entrance to the mess until Jaina's fighters swept into the hangar on repulsor power and settled in the bay next to his. When she slid out and took off her helmet, her face was taut and anxious. You're up to speed, Luke said comfortingly, walking toward the doors to get her to follow him. Are we allowed to wear flight suits in the mess? Jaina managed to smile and indicated her own orange suit. Don't worry, I'm the colonel. I'll provide top cover. It was the first chance Luke had grabbed since the Corellian internment row to talk to Jaina alone. She radiated misery. Anxiety about skills fade and being fit for role, phrases that had peppered her conversation rather too liberally in recent days to convince Luke, was good tech talk for the sake of the squadron, nothing more. She was Jason's twin. Whatever was happening, it was happening to her more acutely than the rest of the family. After you, said Luke. The mess was a warren of compartments with one large section where food was served and eaten, and a lounge area almost the same size that was scattered with comfortable seating and sparse entertainment, the main focus of which was a huge hollow screen on one wall. It was wide enough to be seen comfortably from the refectory area while pilots and ground personnel waited for meals to be dispensed. Most of the pilots in the lounge area had their backs to the refectory and were watching the screen. The lunchtime HNE news had started, and that now meant complete silence descended. Everyone was waiting and watching for the little twitches from the politicians. That would mean that the squadron's warned status would switch immediately to mobilized. Jaina reached over the counter to scoop some vegetables onto her plate, just as the top headline boomed to fill the entire complex. It didn't, of course, but Luke felt that it did. He froze. And today's top story. The roundup of Corellian nationals continues, as thousands leave Galactic City in a voluntary repatriation program. The screen was filled with a shot of 967 Commando shock troopers, advancing down the walkways at either side of a Coruscant residential sky lane. One squad preceded by the now-familiar figure of Jason Solo, in a stark black coverall of the kind favored by special forces. That would have been bad enough, but the only other person in any kind of uniform with his face visible was Ben. It was very, very quiet in the mess now. My son, how did I ever let Jason do this to him? The shock troopers all wore fully enclosed helmets. It was sensible equipment for a soldier to wear, but that didn't make it look any less menacing. 
Luke could hear not the commentary pounding in his ears, but Han's voice saying that the Alliance was rapidly turning into the Empire. Colonel Jason Solo, speaking earlier, said, Luke managed to look at Jaina, whose face was stricken. There was no other word for it. And it was clear that most of those watching the screen had no idea who was standing behind them in the refectory. Old family tradition, terrorizing the population, said one captain, feet propped on a low table. Just like his grandfather all over again. When's he going to go for a nice black cloak and helmet? And lots of troopers in lovely white armor. Some of the officers in the mess laughed, but most looked as if they wished they were somewhere else. Luke had grown adept at reading the ebb and flow of trouble waiting to explode, and it surprised him again just how finely balanced it was between tempers fading and sudden explosion. This time it was Jaina who exploded. Her fists were bald. Luke, caught off guard by his own shame at Ben's appearance, failed to block Jaina's force push as the captain hit the wall with a mess, upending his chair. Jaina lunged forward. Luke managed to shove in front of her. Two other pilot officers stepped in, sending chairs tumbling to stop their comrade from doing anything else stupid. He didn't mean it, said one. He didn't seem to see Luke. Sorry, Colonel. Jaina was flushed, eyes wide. Colonels didn't take swings at other officers, using the force or not. It was bad discipline. Luke wanted to get her outside, but she needed to let it be known she was back in control. Nobody enjoyed serving under an officer who couldn't control her temper. The captain was hauled to his feet. He looked more winded than injured. "'Go on,' said one of the officers." Apologize to the colonel. You were out of line. The captain's expression said that he thought he'd got it about right, but his mouth did as it was told. My apologies, Colonel Solo. We're all getting a little tense, said Jaina. I should have found a less assertive way to ask you to retract what you said about my family. And now the captain appeared to realize he was also facing Luke Skywalker. Sorry, sir. It hurt, because everyone's saying it, thought Luke. You're just the messenger. Forget it, he said. Jaina, let's take a walk. There was no natural vegetation on Sentax. They found a spot in the shade of a hangar and sat down on a couple of crates. We can fence around this or we can blurt it out, said Luke. I prefer blurting, personally. Saves time. I don't know what's happening to Jason. Neither do I, Uncle. Try a guess, then. I don't know him anymore. That's a scary thing for any twin to say. There's something dark about him now. He shuts me out. He even manipulated me against the Chiss. I know. Yes, he's good at that. It's worrying. I can't trust him now. Luke didn't want to hear it said aloud. But he knew he had to listen. Mara sensed it, too, but was satisfied that it was the opposing passions of a messy love affair that were creating the darkness. Luke thought of the images he had seen in recent days, and knew that the darkness was separate from any problems Jason had in his love life. It was graphic enough to be captured on holocam. I want my son to stay away from him. Luke thought of Lumia and his dreams of the hooded figure, which was surely her. But those signs of impending disaster were new. Jason had opened the rift with Jaina by tricking her into attacking the Chiss several years earlier. Jedi were used to seeing what ordinary people couldn't. Being deceived, something regular folk learned to live with from an early age, was especially threatening for them. But you're not fooling me, Jason. You're turning to the dark side. Uncle Luke, this is none of my business, said Jaina, but if I were you, I'd get Ben a new teacher. Luke knew she was right, and he also knew that Mara would fight that every step of the way. And so would Ben. Bravo Company, 967 Commando, Vehicle Checkpoint, Galactic City, 
lower levels, 23.30 hours. We left the best till last, said Corporal Lecauf. Ben was confident in his lightsaber skills, but the lower levels of Galactic City made him envy the soldier's armor. It was the first time he'd been to the city's grim heart, and it wasn't like the Senate sectors at all. In fact, it wasn't even like the slightly seedy Corellian neighborhoods, where there had been a pleasant sense of normal family life going on, at least before the raids had begun. At night, the lower levels were genuinely intimidating. Ben kept one hand on the hilt of his lightsaber. One soldier from Bravo Company set a vehicle barrier across the end of the road. A chain of small spherical droids, whose armament and stinger cords could stop a vessel attempting to pass anywhere up to thirty meters away. There was another one at the far end of the street. The only level below this one was made up of utility tunnels. I really hope we don't end up going down there. Standing well behind the barriers were small knots of people, human and other species, who looked as if they might cut Ben's throat just out of curiosity. This is horrible, he said. Beats doing this in broad daylight with H.N.E. breathing down our necks, said LeCauve. Maybe he had a point. The media never cared what happened to residents of the lower levels. We can just go in and clear this place out. This isn't a Corellian neighborhood. Not all the threats are Corellian. Lakov turned at the sound of jogging boots, and Ben followed his gaze to see Captain Shevu approaching. The only way Ben could tell the 967 apart, when they were fully armored, was by the name tags on their chest plates and their variations in build and height. Shevu had a single, discreet gold star on his helmet. Lakov had two thin gold stripes, and Witter, one of the sergeants, had three. Apart from that, they were an anonymous mass of black plastoid plates over black fatigues. The CSF, some of whose ranks had volunteered for transfer to the 967, had already nicknamed them Stormies. Everyone seemed to see parallels with Ben's grandfather's day. Ben wasn't ashamed of his lineage, and he wasn't ashamed of the work he had to carry out. He just didn't understand how it all got this bad so quickly. But so far, nobody had been shot or badly injured. Every Corellian who had been detained was alive and well, or had been deported. It must have been hard, Ben thought, to be sent home if the only home you had ever known was Coruscant. But in that case, why weren't they loyal to the planet where they'd been born? Just as he'd thought he was growing up, Ben felt like a kid again, a kid who had missed something important that all the adults knew but weren't telling him. Okay, listen up, said Chevu. He gathered two squads around him, pulling in Ben and Lecauf, too. Best intelligence is that Customs and Immigration got a tip-off about three Corellian agents and a bounty hunter they made contact with, and CSF tracked them down here. The location was an apartment block with some boarded-up windows that sat between a sleazy bar and a brightly lit building whose business Ben wasn't sure about, except that the staff all seemed to be women. That's who we've come for. Names are Coton, Abadaner, Balf, and Tabur. Shevu handed Ben a data pad with pictures on it. The squads were receiving the images via the HUDs in their helmets. They know we're here, Ben said. Not much they can do about it, then, except come out when we ask nicely, said Lecauf. Shevu tapped the charge indicator on his blaster rifle. Double-check them against your feature recog software, because they're going to be seriously armed, and you might need to put them out of business permanently. Colonel Solo's covering the rear exits with two squads if things don't go to plan. It wasn't a raid so much as a siege. Ben had learned an awful lot about storming buildings in a very short time. He didn't feel that he was much use, but Lecauf reassured him that he could do things no ordinary soldier could when they needed him to. Okay, let's start this like good guys, Chevu said. 
He turned toward the front of the apartment block, and there was an audible click from his voice projection unit. He was about to use the loud hailer setting. Ben braced for a painfully loud noise. This is the security forces. Chavu's voice vibrated off the buildings, slow and carefully enunciated. People still in the street behind the barricade scattered and ran for cover. Coton, Abadaner, Balf, Habur, surrender your weapons. Come out of the building and keep your arms above your heads. You can come out now, or we will enter and detain you. Maybe I could try mind influence, thought Ben. A bolt of blaster fire spat from a window, and the squad returned fire as if by reflex. Okay, maybe that isn't going to work. We tried, said Chavu. Blasters only, no projectiles. Don't want anything penetrating walls, because we've got civilians in there. He opened the loud healer again. Residents, stay in your homes with your doors closed. Armed security forces are entering your building. I repeat. Stay in your homes, he shook his head, muttering about CSF failing to evacuate the apartment block in advance, and signaled the squads to enter. Ben could see at least two squads on the roof clambering into a maintenance access hatch. There were no stairways in some of these blocks, which meant each turbolift lobby was a potential killing field. It took guts to step out of a lift into the unknown. But that, LeCalf told Ben, was what armor was for. Wear it, Chevu ordered. Put a flashbang through that window on my mark, will you? Say, said the sergeant, and slipped a charge into the feed of his grenade launcher. Squads, when you access the fourth floor, we'll light them up from here. Count us down. Ben couldn't hear the response. He really wanted a helmet with full comm link but what he lacked in technology he almost made up for with his own force senses. Now that he focused on the shattered and gaping window where the blaster fire had emerged, he could feel the fear and hostility inside. There was a lot of general fear in the building, almost certainly the cumulative terror of other residents who were stuck inside the block. Once we've neutralized the main targets, we'll do a sweep of all the apartments just to be certain said Chevu. Can't guarantee that CSF identified everyone. Ben, are you up for playing sniffer droid for us? Yes, sir. It wasn't a game anymore, but he desperately wanted to play his part. Who do we lift, then, sir? LeCalf asked. Anyone with a criminal record? That's pretty well the whole neighborhood. No, only the ones we think we might be interested in, said Chevu, or we'll be here all night. The raid was surprisingly quiet. Ben could see the occasional flare of light through windows as blasters discharged, and heard the accompanying faint badat, badat, badat of rounds. It was as if the whole neighborhood was holding its breath, waiting for the fighting to be over. Without the comlinks to the rest of Bravo Company, he couldn't tell how far they had penetrated the building. And Jason was not only silent, but shut down in the force. Ben couldn't feel him at all. He wondered if his master, and Jason was his master, whatever the Jedi Council said, now hid his presence instinctively as a defense mechanism. Then Wirrit reacted as if someone unseen had tapped him on the shoulder. He aimed his grenade launcher, and there was a whoosh of gas as the flashbang shot into the building. Ben caught the fallout of the deafening sound and blinding light, even from twenty meters away, and his ears took a few seconds to hear the shouts and the hammering sound of blaster bolts as soldiers stormed the apartment. Silence fell. Chevu cocked his head as if listening, and the faint wail of a child somewhere inside made Ben's hair stand on end. Okay, said Chevu. Two targets down, two unaccounted for. Ben, with me. Let's work our way down from the top. Every apartment that opened its doors voluntarily to them was full of suspicious, hostile faces that were clearly no strangers to visits from the authorities. But Ben sensed no purpose or immediate danger. He kept close to Chevu, and when they emerged on the next floor, Jason was already crouched outside one apartment, 
talking earnestly to a couple of 967 men. He beckoned Ben to him. What are you sensing there, Ben? Ben closed his eyes and imagined the rooms beyond the double doors. He'd seen the interiors of enough apartments in the block now to picture the layout within. When he concentrated, he felt the prickling in his throat that indicated an immediate threat, and his mind was drawn to one room where a man and a woman, he knew that and wasn't quite certain how, had some grim purpose. I don't like the feel of that either, said Jason. He seemed particularly troubled by it. Ben thought he would have been used to violent intentions by now. I think that's our two missing targets. The old-fashioned way, sir. One of the 967 held up a row of detonator ribbon. Let's try a little REBJ, said Jason, drawing his lightsaber. The squad with him stacked on either side of the door. That's what you call it, isn't it? Rapid entry by Jedi? Okay, here it goes. Rapid. Jason held up his left hand and lowered it along the line where the two doors joined, not touching them. He was a clear meter away. The doors shot apart, slamming back into the housing on either side, and Jason's lightsaber seemed to have a life of its own as he deflected red blaster bolts that flared from inside the apartment. Ben should have known better than to stand behind him, and Shevu went to pull him aside, but he fended off a straight blaster bolt and piled in behind Jason on blind instinct. Two people inside, yes, a man and a woman, he'd been right, aimed at Jason, but the blasters flew from their hands as if snatched by an unseen hand. The woman, about as old as Ben's mother, dark hair scraped back from her face and a tattoo across one eye, "'scrambled to reach for something, probably another blaster. "'But Jason slammed her flat against the wall with the force and pinned her there. "'The man lay slumped against a chair, groaning. "'The squad poured in, and the two prisoners were cuffed and dragged out. "'Shevu eased off his helmet and stood wiping his forehead on the back of his glove. "'You're going to have to give us a list of your functions, sir,' he said with a faint smile. "'Can't quite keep up with your box of tricks.' Neither can I sometimes, said Jason. He turned to Ben. You okay? Fine, said Ben. It was over for the time being. They could go back to barracks. He could feel the shaking in his legs that always followed an adrenaline rush, and the relief made him feel almost tearful. He bit his lip discreetly. You were going to tell me something a few days ago. Jason always seemed to know how Ben was feeling. He knew exactly when to ask a question and when Ben would find it hard not to answer. Remember? About what? Something about reporting someone? Ah, Barrett. Ben suffered indecision again. Barrett hadn't actually shot anyone, but he'd tried pretty hard. Was it right to turn him in? He might have already been interned or deported, but he might not. And whatever sympathy Ben might have felt for him, he might try again. You're in this now. You know what the stakes are. You're not here to be liked. And Jason needs you. He needs you to be loyal. The family is called Psy, said Ben. They run an engineering company. 